Well, I welcome everybody. I declare the meeting open. Begin by paying respects to the Cubby Cubby, uh, the, the traditional custodians on the land in which we meet, the Cubby Cubby or the Gubby Gubby people, and pay respects to the elders past, <coughs> present, and emerging. We just ask that we have, uh, if you have phones, may they be switched off or on silent mode, please. Councillors, for information, um, one of our media officers, Nathan Evans, is taking some footage today uh, on behalf of the ABC. They've asked for some footage. Uh, are you comfortable with that? Thank you. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And uh, we have an apology from Councillor Karen Finzel. Could we have uh, someone confirm the minutes for the General Committee meeting held on 15th of February 2021, please? Don't need to stand oh, up the general. Just thank you. That's moved by uh, um, <laughs> Councillor Amelia Lawson, second by Councillor Stockwell. All in favour? It's carried. We have no presentations. We have no deputations. And the first item is from the Environment and Planning Committee, which is application for material change of use for short term accommodation at Unit 120 Nanny Guy Street, Nooseville. And it's referred um, due to the significance of the issue. Councillor, do you have any? Questions to elicit information from staff. Um, we'll have comment then debate during the form of debate. But start with you, Joe. Yeah, with regard to the criteria for assessment, uh, PO1 states visitor accommodation is located such that it avoids conflict with nearby land uses, and PO1.2 visitor accommodation is not within 100 metres of an educational establishment or childcare centre. Uh, they seem to be um, in conflict with what uh, the proposal is, is stating. Can uh, you tell me why staff uh, consider that uh, the, the recommendation should be approved given those two parameters within the planning scheme? Yeah, so I have had advice from strategic planning regarding acceptable outcome 1.2, uh, being within 100, 100 metres from the educational establishment or childcare centre. That provision was put in place for larger scale short-term accommodation, so motels, hotels, things like that, where it's a much bigger impact on the on the childcare centre. So in this regard, given it was a single dwelling, um, strategic planning um, provided some advice that the provision wasn't really relevant for the smaller scale type short-term that we're looking at. Can I ask a question on that? Next to Adiona on the other side is a large motel, so clearly that was there before the childcare centre. Is that right? So, yeah. yes. Um, can I ask a question? So, a four bedroom property that's going to be used for short term accommodation will potentially house eight people. The duplex um, <coughs> beside it, um, if council approves this application, there's the potential that the duplex next door will make the same application. Um, this is a what if. So, would you would council um, consider both properties, um, both short term yet, <coughs> with the potential of housing sixteen people? So you've got two by four properties, two by eight people in both properties. Um, would you have changed your mind or reconsidered the application and consider that no longer minor that that would actually constitute? Um, a, ma a, a more major um, or significant risk um, <coughs> um, on the impacts in relation to the child care centre? I'd probably seek further advice from Strategic on that one as to what the threshold would be regarding what would be considered minor as to where that would trigger for that uh, 100 metre rule. <coughs> uh, it's difficult, I hadn't actually contemplated both if, if it came in as both, obviously we'd be looking at it and for asking for the advice based on the 16 people. Yeah. Um, the recommendation includes a protection of privacy condition. Um, could you explain that just for the benefit of the viewers? Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. So um, my understanding is there's actually already screening on those upper level windows that do face the child care centre, but it's essentially just to ensure that, that those um, upper level windows don't have any viewing potential into the, the rear of the child care centre. Councillor Stockwell. Yes, supplementary on that one. So um, the outdoor pool area, etc., is there the screening fencing on, on 
can't tell from the elevation, it looks like the pool may be raised a bit. Is there visibility or, or is it screened between what appears to be probably the predominant outdoor area of the child care centre and the pool outdoor area of this stuff? So the pool, I believe, is in-ground. Mm -hmm. um, and the condition <coughs> 24 does actually require the outdoor alfresco area of where people would be seat seated to have some screening along the side as well. How high is the fence between uh, the childcare centre? Do you know that? I'm not sure off the top of my head. I'd have to look into that. Okay. And also with regard to the motel complexes, uh, particularly one adjoining the Anchor Motel, is it multi-storey or is it just single storey? What was that, sorry? Is it, is it, multi, is it two storey the or is it only single storey? I believe it's single. And no, it's from, two. from the picture it's of two. It's two. I've been there, it's two storey. It's two. But, two but it's more towards the northern side yeah. of the block, the car park. Oh, that's what I'm getting fence. from the picture. It's, it's been hard to, to ascertain. Yeah, and I haven't been, so I yeah. thought, it was, thought it may have been. And uh, there appears to be some um, structures uh, abutting the child care with, uh, with um, solar panels on. I'm assuming they are uh, car parking or covered car parking. For the anchor? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Car parking's up against the fence side, Joe, on yeah, that southern side. That's what I assume, yeah. but I thought I'd double check. Um, in relation to Tyrone's um, outdoor areas, including balconies, decks, pool and the like, must not be used after 9pm. We have conditioned that in the report. Mm -hmm. um, can we amend that and omit the word pool and include that the pool area should be closed at 8pm? Um, I've spoken to the Anchor Motel and they um, shut the pool at 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. and I think it's also consistent with a lot of the motels and hotels in the precinct. Um, so I'd like to see that amended and just the pool um, pool area not to be used after 8 p.m. each night. That's uh, something we can discuss in, form in an amendment. Like yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Neil, what's um, condition number? Please? Number six on page five. Thank you. Yeah, the questions for staff, councillors. Um, yep, I do. Amelia, yeah. On page 13, um, short term accommodation does not constitute a party house. Um, where is party house defined and how is this provision enforced? So, party house is actually a definition in the scheme. So, they're Section prohibited. Section 276, yeah. Yeah, and, and also within the scheme. So, party houses are prohibited throughout the entire Shire. And how is that provision enforced? It would be through our compliance team. If, if someone was to make a complaint about how a property was being used, then we would obviously investigate it and it was determined to be a party house. There is a definition in the planning scheme as well about party house, then we could proceed with enforcement action. So local laws officers have got the authority to um, shut down a party house? It would be under the uh, planning compliance officer because there's a definition under the planning scheme. So they would be able to commence enforcement. Uh, I might just jump in to make sure, maybe can I ask a question just to sure. clarify this yeah. to, to assist? Yes. Um, Patrick, it's my understanding that the definition of party house is not a, a short stay that someone might have a party and occasionally will turn up. It's how it's advertised or how it's that's, positioned in the market. That's so correct. So if a, if land a, use. Yeah, so land use issue is yeah. that they uh, have a house and they advertise it for functions like you know weddings, parties, Hands nights, yeah. Hands nights, all that sort of stuff. But that falls in the definition of party house. That's a different thing from a short stay where someone will turn up and, and have uh, as a one off, have a people over or make too much noise or whatever. It's, it's slightly different uses. So it's a party house which is banned across the Shire, but you are not able to have a party house that you advertise as such <coughs> for that type of function. Okay. Have we ever used the provisions in section 276 to shut down a party house? I don't know if we have any. We had one back in the uh, years ago um, over in Newcastle. I know we took court action against that was many, many, many years ago. <coughs> but I can't recall one more recently where people have advertised as a party house. Have we explored opportunities to use that provision given that state delegated authority? Um, have we looked at Opening the definition of party house to include number of people. We've got eight people potentially um, renting um, this property as short-term accommodation. Um, has have we gone to 
the Local Government Association and asked whether we could explore or expand the definition of party house to include a um, number of occupants um, because I know that's something we can't do under our local laws. Uh, not to my knowledge. That it's a na party house is about the nature of the use and how it's presented to the, the public, so to speak. In other words, you can jump online, you can have a look and say, I want to have a Bucks night or a yep. engagement party or whatever, I'm going to book this house or this house is available for that type of use. That falls within the definition of a party house and that's what is prohibited. Um, so it's yeah. slightly different to... But the reality is no one actually advertises. People yeah. just turn up and then hold an event there. So can we again explore opportunities to, um, to go back to state and ask them to expand the definition um, or... Yeah, well, look, we can. Um, I know Gold Coast has had a look at this as well because um, they, they had a similar type of approach. But the issue is an ad hoc or one-off use for a party house is different to something being used on that basis all the time. So, for example, if, if my house, which is not short-term, I would think, if I held a, a big party, that doesn't make it a party house under the definition. Conversely, if a house was short-term let all year and one year they had one rogue um, person who came in and, and rented that for one night and held a party that doesn't therefore fall in the definition of a party house it's a different definition so the definition relates to its permanent or, or usual use not its unlawful use for want of a better phrase as a one-off that's, that's, that's the subtle difference but is there the potential to explore that definition so one-off i get yeah. But often a house that houses 12 to 16 people yeah. um, over a period of six months would often have these one-off ad hoc um, events. So yeah, I, no... I, I'm, I, I just sit here and we're, we're about to put together local laws, yeah. but we already have some powers and it's state delegated powers. So I'd love to explore any opportunities or how other councils, other jurisdictions have been using that power. Um, I just think it's a missed opportunity. Um, may I ask a question, just following on from that, um, I think what Councillor Lawrence is, is alluding to is if there's an occasion where there's a, a disturbance, there is a party at this house. Um, are the conditions um, 6, 7, 9 and 14A intended to limit that sort of action? Or uh, restrict that sort of action and there'll be consequences if it, if it does occur. For instance, quest, um, condition six is all outdoor areas must not be used after 9pm. Seven, the premise must not be used as a party house with no events, functions and parties, e.g. bucks, parties, hands, parties, raves or weddings. Um, the operation must not detrimentally affect the residential amenity, including but not limited to noise, overlooking lights, spill or odour, enjoyed by surrounding residents or cause a nuisance. Um, and there's a contact person that, that can be contacted. That happens. Um, so these are, are these conditions intended to address the sort that's of issues correct, that Council correct. Lawrence, these important that is, issues that Council Lawrence has been That's addressing. correct. And, and with all our applications for short-term accommodation, we're, we're addressing the amenity issues which may arise through these conditions. And you have compliance officers that can issue fines if these conditions are breached? That is correct. Thank you. Do our compliance officers work after 5 p.m.? No, generally not. Okay. Patrick, if, if it was changed to 8 o'clock, um, the pool can't be used past 8, how does that then um, concur or correlate with the last two um, approvals we've given, let's say 9 o'clock? Is there the potential to then for recourse for these guys to come back and challenge that because... Well, anyone can come back and make representations to a decision which we make seeking to amend the conditions. Um, they could certainly seek to appeal it. I don't think there would be any particular recourse because um, this is a bit of a different circumstance here and we do have a childcare centre which is next door. Um, but the childcare centre closes at half past five, doesn't it? That is correct, actually, yes. So, so whether it's eight or nine or seven, it doesn't really matter. You, sorry, you are right. But there are neighbours that reside adjacent to the property. That's correct. Yeah. So in consideration of them, I think it may be um, just to be consistent, I think, with the Anchor Motel that the condition may be changed to 8pm. 
Was that a question? Sorry, sorry, that was a comment. Question. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make a question mark. That's right. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You and I are here at Lucy Camps. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion for us. Anyone well, here? Over top? Just a, just a couple of good questions. Um, so the, you're of the, the belief that the town plans support S short term stays in medium density areas like this. That is correct. We support that. Um, and but at the same time, uh, in the local plan, uh, the Newseville local plan code um, T says development ensures permanent residents of Newseville enjoy a high level of residential amenities. And so that the, the Newsa plan says that Newseville they high uh, enjoy this amenity. And you don't see there's a conflict between the short term stay on the street and the amenity of the street. Well, we acknowledge, and that all our reports will acknowledge that short-term accommodation has the potential to impact upon amenity of, of an area. Um, and in our assessment, we look at this in the, the size of the house and where the outdoor area is located to, to apply suitable conditions, um, and the conditions that we've applied in this instance are seeking to address that amenity issues. Patrick, I've got a question. It just comes back to the pool. On page 19, when we're looking at that pool and we're sort of, there's a, a, rec, um, a square, red square around half the pool, if there was the potential that there was another eight, that they made an application for next door and so the other duplex had eight people as well, is that, do they share a pool? Is that is that or is that two separate pools there? Yeah, there's two separate pools. There's a fence between. Them. Right. So the so the major, so the maximum number of people in that pool at any one time would be eight, not sixteen. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. I just yeah, I wasn't sure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, councillors, um, we have a motion before us. Does anyone care to move a motion? Move it or a version of it? Yeah. Uh, I could probably move it, so okay. yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll move it because I, I'm aware there's um, a range of different views, so I'll give it an opportunity to debate. Okay, move, move Councillor on. Stockwell. We have a seconder, please, for the purpose of debate. Oh. Councillor Stewart. Councillor Stockwell. Okay, I do so. So, as with a series of short term accommodation applications recently, the, the key consideration uh, for councillors is to what extent can a condition of approval uh, ensure the desired outcomes for the zone, for the locality and for visitor accommodation be met. And we know that the debate is around where in the medium density residential, which is meant to be predominantly resi residents, uh, should short term accommodation be approved. And you know, the, there is an overall outcome from medium dense residential zone that says short term visitor accommodation is predominantly provided through well established resorts and holiday units. So, what we're looking at here is a holiday unit. Um, when we look at the Nooseville locality code, we, you know, we can say that it, it, it once again says a range of visitor accommodation, including low cost and family friendly short term accommodation, um, is expected in the area. And the key one there in terms of visitor accommodation code is visitor accommodation located near permanent residence does not detract from the amenity enjoyed by residents and that's where in my mind i'm still 50 50 on this side um, i believe on a planning interpretation of the scheme because it's a consistent development that it does lend support for approval I believe that this street, however, isn't one where visitor accommodation has traditionally occurred. That, but that it has traditionally occurred along Wyber Road, but because this site is immediately adjacent to that in planning terms, that gives grounds for saying, well, the impact of one more holiday unit compared to the main out until next door to the childcare centre is not going to be so significant that it would warrant refusal. And that's where I've got to in my mind. Um, I do believe um, that there is opportunity to review the planning scheme in regard to providing the sort of uh, greater clarity that I think councils would like about when we want to uh, maintain, uh, uh, not necessarily 
uh, majority permanent residents, but the whole of a, a particular street or little local area in a medium density residential for permanent occupation. But at this stage, as the planning scheme sets out, I think that the staff recommendation is the appropriate one. I have a question. Could this applicant apply to run this property, this unit, or this part, this duplex, as short-term accommodation under the superseded planning scheme? They would need would have needed an approval to do that. That's what I mean. Could they have applied under this superseded planning scheme to do this? Yes, they could have. And if they were to gain approval for doing that, would you have been able to apply this, this similar conditions? Well, um, if it, yes, we could apply similar conditions. Uh, are you able to tell us why they've chosen to apply under the current planning scheme as opposed to the superseded planning scheme? I'm not aware of, of their reasoning. No. I mean, I, get, I think the um, the original development was only constructed in 2018, so whether it was just a timing thing, I don't know. There's also, sorry, a bit of a process to go through for a superseded planning scheme request. You need to make the request to be assessed on under the superseded planning scheme and, yep. and provide the documents, and then it's accepted that you can make that application, and then you need to make an application. So it's a bit more complicated. It's a bit more complicated, probably more efficient to go down this path. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Tom. So this um, this appears to be the first uh, short term stay on that street. I, I wouldn't be wrong to call this the creep of short term stays into a, a new street for the first time. Uh, Tom, I think. I'm fair to start to sort of comment on a, a subjective matter like that. I think that the maybe a better question would be, is this the first one in that street? Yeah, yeah this is the first one in that street, yeah. As far as we're aware. It is the first application that we've had in the street, yes. But it also, sorry, if I may add, it could be used as accepted development for 60 nights a year and yeah. on four occasions. So they will still have a capacity to use this site for short-term accommodation. And that's similar with, with everybody on the street? That's correct. Yeah. Joe? Yeah. Look, I'm not going to support the staff recommendation on this one. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, the looking through the criteria for assessment uh, on page 15, refers to visitor accommodation is located yeah. such that the boys conflict with their nearby land users. In no, in no, uh, nowhere within that uh, does it refer to the size yeah. Or the level of uh, visitor accommodation. Uh, it also has a, a, an acceptable outcome of visitor accommodation not located within 100 metres of an educational establishment or childcare centre. Now I appreciate that the childcare centre is located next to the Anchor Motel on, on, on its adjoining, on the other adjoining boundary. But the difference between uh, the two developments and both are short, short stay accommodation is that. The motel is, is significantly set back and does not overlook the childcare centre, and the motel was there before the childcare centre was built. The difference here is we're going to approve something that actually conflicts with an element that's specifically written into, and an acceptable outcome that's specifically written into the planning scheme to prevent this sort of thing from happening. Uh, the other element of this is that it is the first uh, short stay accommodation in this street, and that uh, residents. Uh, uh, have objected to the fact that short stay accommodation is coming to the street. Most of the short stay accommodation that uh, is in the area has been on the more significant Wyber Road and is typically uh, what you'd expect in, a, in an area that historically uh, that uh, motels and the like have been uh, situated on major, major thoroughfares. I appreciate that uh, privacy, protection of privacy has been endeavoured to be a condition under uh, uh, conditions 23 and 24 but I don't believe these are sufficient for a, 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 a premises that overlooks a boundary where a child care centre exists when those specific conditions are put into, uh, in, into place within the planning scheme. So that's, that's my view on the, uh, uh, on the reasons why I won't be supporting the, uh, the, uh, the application. Councillor Lawrence, do you have an amendment? Um, yeah, I'd like to amend condition six to omit the word pool and add a condition that the pool area should be used, um, not to be used after 8 p.m. each night. Okay. 
given that the area is... Oh, we'll just get that wording right then, maybe get you to read it out so people are following at home. So all outdoor areas, including balconies, decks, decks and the like, must not be used after 9pm each night, with the pool area and the pool area not to be used after 8pm each night. I'll oh, second that. Um, given the area is predominantly residential, I'd just like to amend the time to 8pm for pool area only, um, just in consideration of the residents who work. Um, I've been advised that the majority of resorts in the Noosa Shire close the outdoor areas and pool areas by 8pm and there's only two resorts, um, the Islander and the Sofitel, that I, from my understanding, that close at 10pm. Um, so for those reasons, for that reason I just like, um, and also the, the Anchor Hotel, which sits um, adjacent to the Adione, um, it shuts its pool area at 8pm, so to um, stay consistent with similar uses, I think 8pm is appropriate. Councillors. Mm. One question, the pool area, does that include, does it have a deck around it? Is, this, is the wording going to be confusing in terms of pool mm. area and the deck? It, does the pool area <laughs> include the deck? So the deck is attached to the house, so I would say they're separate. Okay. All right. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm, I'll speak to the amendment, I'll, I'll support the amendment um, of the argument that the anchor motel also has an 8pm closing time uh, is significant for me and uh, I think uh, in terms of um, consistency and um, I, I will support this amendment. I think it's, um, it's reasonable and fair given that the anchor motel is, is doing the same. Yeah. Look, I'll... Uh I mean, I don't support the, uh, the overall uh, um, application, but in the event that it is, uh, it is um, approved uh, at the meeting, uh, I'll support the, the, uh, the amendment to uh, restrict the full use, primarily because the uh, adjoining motel does the same. Yeah. You ask care to speak directly to this amendment? We'll, we'll vote on this and then go back to the original yeah. amendment. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll support this too. Um, I agree with Councillor. There are some concerns around this area. Uh, I do note that the other areas, so that eight o'clock, are resorts. Um, but bearing in mind that this is an area that is there is a lot of residential residents. This is the first application in the street, and we have to be mindful of the needs of the neighbours. Um, so I will support this as well. No other councillors wish to speak. Um, uh, Councillor Lawrence, you have the right to close? Um, no, okay. nothing further. Put the amendment. Those in favour? Councillor Lawrence, Stockwell, Wait. Oh, that's unanimous. Okay, so that amendment now becomes part of the original motion to which Councillor Stockwell and Councillor Derisovic have already spoken. Uh, to get the ball rolling, I'm going to speak. Uh, in favour of the motion um, because we've approved a planning scheme that has, after a lot of deliberation and community consultation, taken ma major inroads into um, managing short stay accommodation as a land use. Uh, it is not a perfect system by any means at this stage, but in order to create certainty rather than councillors picking and choosing which ones they would like to support uh, to give certainty to the community and to the, the market. Um, the medium density area has been designated as a zone where this sort of land use can take place, providing conditions uh, are abided by. The new planning scheme gives the, the, um, the opportunity to impose quite stringent conditions that minimise the impact and we are talking about a performance-based planning scheme as opposed to a prescriptive one where you can say yes or no to certain 
land activities taking place. You can, my understanding of the performance-based planning scheme is that you can allow certain activities um, that may impact negative, it may impact on uh, a, a, an area as long as those impacts are managed responsibly. And the range of conditions here are intended to, to manage um, the impacts on the, the, the neighbours that may flow from uh, the occupants of this duplex. We're not talking about a motel, it's a duplex. And that is no more than eight guests at any one time. All outdoor areas, as we've heard, balconies, decks not, must not be used after 9pm, pool area must not be used after 8pm, must not be used as a party house, no events, functions, parties, um, must not detrimentally affect the residential amenity, including but not limited to noise, light spill or odour, car parking must be on site, um, waste management, um, bins must not be out in the curb longer than 24 hours, there must be a contact person for if there's any, if in the case that there is a disturbance after hours, there's a contact person who must respond uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, that contact person must reside within 20 minutes. The contact person is responsible for the supervision and management. And if that is not handled appropriately, then the council can be called to respond and issue uh, and, and enforce compliance, uh, which may uh, enforce com compliance. There's a code of conduct. Um, it's quite stringent. And uh, I also appreciate the arguments. This is the first first um, short stay accommodation unit in this street but I believe and also concerns about the um, the neighboring childcare center but as has been said the child care center operates uh, up to 5 p.m it's unlikely that there's going to be any uh, impact on that after hours because there'll be no children there and there's also very stringent conditions um, so the principal argument for me is that we have signaled that this is the zone where this sort of activity can take place. Resorts and holiday units are consistent uses in a medium density zone. Um, we are, we have a process whereby we're going to be, we, we can fine tune our approach to short term accommodation, which is through amendments to the planning scheme. And that's coming up very, very shortly. Um, and we have a local law coming out as well. So I think that is the correct process to address any uh, shortcomings in the approach to med uh, the medium density zone that councils may feel rather than picking and choosing as we go. So I'll be supporting this application. Yeah. I'd like this. Do you speak to the motion? No, you, you speak to Tom. Oh. Okay. As you know, um, I have trouble with the staff use of the word support in terms of short term stays. And I believe this they derive this word from their interpretation of the town plan. I have a, uh, an interpretation of the town plan which is slightly different from that of staff's concerning the word support. I believe the town plan supports amenity of residential neighborhoods. What is amenity? Amenity uh, in Queensland case law is a very broad, broad, wide definition. It includes where the reasonable person's perception and expectation of the neighborhood. So the amenity includes the reasonable expectation of the neighborhood, the amenity, the um, uh, perception of yeah, the neighborhood. This includes that the neighborhood will remain a predominantly residential place. It includes the expectation that young families will move in and settle down and put down roots and become a part of the fabric of our community. This is my interpretation of the town plan. Under this interpretation, STS are allowed under certain conditions, and we all know what they are, and we've been talking about them. Under the staff interpretations of the town, with, with the town plan, supports SDS in mid-density, can, so the staff's interpretation supports this, where my interpretation of the town plan is that it supports the amenity, as I described. Are the two consistent, or are they mutually exclusive? And I, I feel they're mutually exclusive. You can't have a town plan that supports the amenity in Nusaville, as it says, 
in uh, New Seville Plan Code and support STS in that same community. The two don't work together. Given this application and ones we have decided in previous months, it is hard to imagine that an STS in a medium density zone as not being supported by the staff recommendation. In reality, that is that as we continue to approve STS in medium density, the amenity will be lost and the precedent set. The expectation of a predominantly residential neighborhood will change to a tourist pre precinct. The change is consistent and inevitable with, this, with the staff's interpretation of the town plan. Losing, losing this amenity is inconsistent with my interpretation of the town plan. And I believe that Brian will have plenty to be talking to say about this in the future. Furthermore, that, that staff interpretation is inconsistent with the council's plans to address rental, the rental crisis here in Noosa. We have heard over and over that there are quality jobs and opportunities here which are left vacant because applicants cannot find accommodation. Yet, we support the transformation of housing to SDS businesses. This is wildly in, in, uh, inconsistent, and I suspect that the electorate is wondering what we are thinking. So I will not be supporting this application today. Thank you, Councilor Wigner. Um, I will be supporting the staff recommendation. The proposed use, which is short-term accommodation, is consistent use within a medium density residential area. And all the conditions that Councillor Wilkie outlined, including the protection of privacy condition, which is very important to me, um, helps address the operation of this use. Um, I say this every time we approve a short-term application within a medium density zone. Um, we can't erode a process. If we're going to change the outcomes, we need to change the plan. We can't punish the applicant um, who's just following the rules we, we, we gave them um, when we ratified the Noosa plan in 2020. So, um, supporting the application. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Yeah, I, I too support the staff recommendation. Councillor Wookie has um, given a great you know, outline of all the necessary requirements that the applicants have to adhere to. There is a code of conduct which has stringent requirements. This is, as Councillor Lawrenson said, a, a consistent use. It's so medium density. Uh, the street, although it is noted that this hasn't formally been used, um, this is the first. There's always going to be a first, but it is, as Councillor Lawrenson said, um, you know, we can't punish this, this applicant. Um, this is medium density and they are just following the necessary protocols it is consistent with the plan. If we have to, if we're supporting the plan, and if the community support the plan, then this must be supported. Is it right or wrong? And can things be done better? This is not the debate in this point of time. The question is, do we approve this application? The amendments can be made to the planning scheme and local laws, as have already been noted, and that is where we can debate those issues. But for the purposes of this application, we can just look at the evidence before us. Uh, I believe that there is a potential if we don't. Um, approve this, we could potentially expose ourselves to litigation because we would fundamentally be going against our planning scheme, which would potentially then incur unnecessary costs for our ratepayer. So I support the staff recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. Um, now, Councillor Stock, will you wish to close? Yeah, I will. Uh, I think it's been a good debate, and I think uh, Councillor Wigner's really fine, uh, you know, focused on what the, the, the issues are. and. The planning scheme as it currently sits requires us to come to a informed opinion about the relative impact on amenity versus the the ability for uh, you know, visitor accommodation to be located in the medium density residential zone. We do know that there is two aspects of the planning, the, the, the two I suppose driving um, uh, community issues that the that the Noosa Plan twenty twenty sought to address. One was the amenity impacts uh, caused by unregulated um, short term accommodation, which has seen a very large and significant change from the traditional holiday home. We find that the online booking agencies and inexperienced, uh, uh, generally out of town or distant uh, 
landowners have poor management that leads to neighbourhood impacts. There's no doubt that's the Noosa plan and the conditions of this approval seek to change that. There's also the other issue that Council Wigman brought up that, that um, increasing supply of short term accommodation reduces supply of rental accommodation and that will drive prices up and that's a very significant issue as well. But similarly, um, there's been a lot of conversion of visitor accommodation since uh, for the pandemic to permanent accommodation and so our tourist uh, economy is also seeing the influence of a, a huge swing in in um, people's preferences where to live. I think they are the issues that need to be addressed and I think a number of speakers have said that the way to address that is through a review of the plan. And then it boils down to Councillor um, Jerusalem's argument about the criteria for assessment for visitor accommodation and PO1 or performance outcome one says visitor accommodation is located such that it avoids conflict with nearby land users. And in Councillor Jerusalem's mind, this one does conflict or has potential conflict, and that's a valid position to hold. It then talks about acceptable solution visitor accommodation is not within 100 metres of an educational establishment, and it is. But it needs to be realised that that is just one acceptable outcome that the planning scheme identifies. It doesn't mean you have to comply with it. If that was a performance outcome over on the left hand column, then it's more than likely that this recommendation would be for refusal, but it's not. It's just one of the acceptable ways to achieve what's on the left hand column. So it boils down to can this development be conditioned such that it doesn't avoid conflicts with nearby land uses? And as I said, I think in this case that because of the nature of the surrounding land uses already having um, immediately adjacent visitor accommodation, that it doesn't conflict and therefore deserves the support of council. Thank you, Councillor Stockwell. Put the motion those in favour. It's Councillor Lawrenson, Stockwell, Stewart and Wilkie uh, against. That's Councillors Wegener and Jerusovic. That motion's carried. Now we now move on to item two, which is uh, a minor change to a development approval for entertainment and dining business type one, food and beverages and a retail business type two shop and salon at 6 Thomas Street, Nooseville. This is referred from the Planning Environment Committee agenda, page 30. Uh, reason for refu referral was the for further consideration. Uh, Council, do you have any questions for staff? Well, last time... Yeah, oh, sorry, Tom, you go ahead. Well, last time, um, Brian asked the staff, would it be possible to sell coffees from the front of the house? From the, from the front of the business on Thomas Street before seven o'clock in the morning. Did you see Brian? I did. Yep. You did. I suppose the question is, when during the conversation it came up that the florist and the cafe, and I just presumed that that was part of the, the front shop, but mm -hmm. as it is the florist and the coffee nook are actually all within mm -hmm. that small tenancy immediately adjacent the residential area. And I, I did contact the consultant and, yeah. and ask whether that would be viable, and he said uh, the response was that they wanted a 6.30 operating for all tenancies on site. Can I just clap? Do they want, is it, they're requesting 6 or 6.30? 6 6.30. So in the original application yeah. it was 5.30, they've changed it to 6, and now after PNE, um, they've asked for 6.30. Okay. Is that reflected in the... Uh and any changes here within the conditions? No, so that, that only came through in an email um, a couple of days ago from the consultant. So is that something that we're, the staff are recommending to put within the, uh, the, the, the conditions as they uh, put before council today? Um, well, I think it's... Um, I have an amendment. Well, you've got yeah. an amendment? Yeah, okay. to make it 6.30. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Councillor Stewart. Uh, can I just... Yeah. A few more questions? Yeah. So on page 39, 173 is the internal layout and it says new cafe. So is that currently operating as a cafe? I'm not sure whether it's actually... I, I can answer that question because I was there at 6 a.m. yesterday morning. <laughs> so can I, is that up there currently now? So, so my... <laughs> I, was, so I was, I got three coffees. Yeah, my, my, it's, uh, my understanding is that it's a, it, when I went there, they were selling freshly made donuts from a lady who gets about 1.30 from Caloundra and delivers them. They were selling donuts and they were selling coffees. 
and they were selling um, some flowers, which I bought my mum a bunch of flowers. So, it, but not, at that st nothing else at that stage. There was no seating. Um, it was purely grab and go. Uh, this is at the, at the coffee nook at the rear. But the I one, have some photos. The tenancy in front. I haven't. This yeah. is the, the tenancy. Yeah. yeah. Kath, do you want to put those photos? I took some photos yesterday. So this is. Um, so that's the only. Um, so that this is the coffee shop just here. And if I stood and looked to my right, that is um, a brick wall, obviously. Behind is a residential, but I noted when I was taking these photos that there was no balconies um, overlooking. And then if you go down, Kat, please, um, that's on the other side. So that is actually the window faces that, and that is a day spa upstairs and a Pilates studio and a block of shops. So that is what the window looks into there. So just to clarify, the coffee nook is operating out of what 1C, as we see on the plan on page 39? Yes. Thank you. Subsequent question to staff. This change application is only for the rear facility, is that right? Or is it for the whole? It's So under the original approval that was issued, we had conditioned use areas for the shop tenancies and the restaurant tenancy because under the old scheme, shop was impact inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So under this change, we're removing those conditions entirely so they could be interchangeable. So it, essentially it's for... The whole, the whole lot. lot. Okay. okay. Um, could you clarify the condition? Uh, Mayor Stewart mentioned that um, she'd like to move a motion that allows the uh, coffee milk to operate from 6.30 a.m. Which is the condition that that would affect, please? It's no. not... Page uh, 34, is it? It's condition 16. So. Condition 16. So approved users must not operate outside the hours hours of it would be 6.30 to 10 pm. So it's a question, thank you, start. No, it's, a, it's a question of wording. Just the staff recommendation was to refuse the application to connect to even the day. So change so in other words, to refuse to change condition 16. If the council wishes to change condition 16, we have wording there that would enable that to occur. Oh, okay, thank you. It's already been. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Is that in the red? Yes. Can we maybe read that, please? Well, Claire has to read that. No, I know that I'd like to read what maybe. Perhaps the council would like to move Would you like to move that, Councillor Stewart? Sure, I'll move that. I'll second that. Seconded, Councillor Lawrenson. I suggest it be read out. Uh, the change would be the approved users must not operate outside the hours of 6.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week, except Friday and Saturday, where entertainment and dining business users may operate until 12 midnight. The requirements of this condition must be included in the community management statement for anybody corporate for the subject site. Councillor Stewart, you... Yeah, and sure. Par sorry, and then paragraph D and the staff recommendation would be removed because that was the reasons for refusal to change oh, oh. condition 16. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So there's further one was B, delete conditions 14 and 15. Yeah. yeah. Councillor Stewart. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Wilkins. Yeah. Um, look, this is a, a minor amendment. It's 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 half an hour. It's from seven a.m. to six thirty. I'm requesting, and the reason I do so is because of a number of reasons. The first is I lived directly above a coffee shop that is directly across the road from this, which is able to trade from six a.m. because it's in a tourist precinct. This shop falls under entertainment and dining precinct. I don't see that a change from 6.30 would make a huge difference to the residents. Uh, when I went there and from those photos, you can see that there really is only one building that backs on. Um, there are no outdoor balconies. It is half an hour. It is being fair and consistent with other traders literally in the same area. There is yoga, there's Pilates, there's morning traffic for coffees. Or I mean, I got there at five to six the other morning and there were people lining up at the other coffee shop. So it was a very quiet, that, that cafe is a very small footprint. It's literally a small window and a very, very small shop. 
Uh, there would be limited, if any, noise arising from it. Uh, I think we have to be, if we have to be fair, we talk about in our community at the moment, empowering and helping our small business, turning it from revive into thrive. Well, I think if we're going to talk the talk, we have to walk the walk. And I think this half hour might give a small business who are just starting out, a husband and wife duo, an opportunity to really make a goal. But we may not think a half an hour makes a difference. But as I said earlier in last week, that could mean a, a substantial amount of coffees every day. It could mean a substantial amount of selling flowers every day, which could make the difference and be able for them to pay the rent. Yesterday, I was on the beach with my sons and I was looking, to be a bit of you here, Tom, and I was looking over at all the kids and the families and as we as counsellors all do, we want to, we look at people and we think, how can we help? And I guess if we don't, then we're all in the wrong job. But I was looking at these people thinking, what do they want? How can we help all these families and, and who are part of our community? And I think the answer came to me and it was get out of their way. Let them get on with their life. Don't overregulate them. Don't red tape them. Let them have a go. And in this instance, of course, there has to be regulation in the big picture. And of course, we have to monitor things. But this half an hour to me is something that really would make a substantial difference and not have a big footprint. And it would give them the opportunity, it would, it would get out of their way and let them have a go at their business and have a chance to make it. And so that's why I'm asking for that extra half an hour for them to trade in the mornings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Okay. Question for start. Uh, given the precinct on Thomas Street and uh, the adjoining Gippy Terrace uh, has an abundance of uh, food outlets and coffee shops and the like, what are the operating hours for those businesses that uh, come there? Are they able to start at 6 a.m. or are they all restricted to 7 a.m.? So it's very varied. So the requirement for 7 a.m. is because it is adjoining that residential zoning. So anything that's within that the, terrace. At the rear. You're not worried about the resident that's living above? No. So that You're only worried about the resident that's living behind? Correct. So the, okay. the provisions in the scheme are very specific about anything adjoining residential zoning. So in this case, this site does. A lot of the ones along Gimpy Terrace don't adjoin residential zoning. They're tourist accommodation zoning. So there's a varied operating time. I've, I've had a look around and it seems to be between 6 a.m. at the earliest and then up till 10 a.m. as an opening time, depending on obviously what's... So if we took Moon Doggies at the front of South Pacific, for example, are they 7 a.m. or 6 a.m.? I, I don't know. I yeah, that, that, but that, that doesn't join a residential it's area. Tourist. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tourist. It's tourist, that's why. The nearest one I could think of is Acres. And it bucks yeah. immediately behind, and we Resident looked at those hours, and they started at seven a.m. went to nine, I think. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's my understanding yeah. that there wasn't a problem. Correct me if I'm wrong. From the lady upstairs, who is no. directly above, that's no. correct, isn't it? There I wasn't a problem. Received any yeah. yeah. From Question for Brian. Uh, yeah, mind about the last sentence. Um, it, the changing of a community management statement requires a certain number of people to vote for it um, and it is putting within a planning application a requirement under a different act. My gut tells me that I've been down this road before and that's not a reasonable and relevant condition. Can you make comment? Have we done this before? I don't think a planning application can put a requirement on a community management title scheme. Oh, we certainly have put many conditions on it. Yeah, around um, the community management statement reflecting the conditions of the approval. Certainly have. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd like to comment. Yes, um, Councillor Lawrence. I'm happy to support the amendment. Um, it's simply a minor change that's going to have quite significant benefit to this small business that relies on morning trade from walkers and visitors um, to the river. Um, I'm happy to afford some flexibility to the applicant and support him. Um, the extra half hour, I don't think, is really going to have that much impact. The proposed use and the hours are also consistent with the planning intent for Thomas Street Pre Precinct as outlined in the Tourist Accommodation Zone Code. So, yep, happy to support the 6.30 um, start time. Cool. I'm also happy to, to support uh, the mayor's uh, amendment there. It's, it's coffee, but it's also flowers. I think that, that's a really nice 
thing, you know, that what a great business to have there. And you, you do want to get your your flowers early, especially in the accommodation. You know, you got to get up early. And they want to put them, you know, throughout the different uh, hotels and things that are there along the river. So I, I see that opening at 6.30 would be equally as important for the florist as it is for coffees in the morning. Uh, question for staff. Would, staying open until 12 midnight, I mean, to, to, to me it seems as though that, that would be the problem or the issue with, with residents living close by. Not the early morning, but the late night. Is, is that true or does it really matter? Well, that was the provision under NOSA Plan 2006, yeah. so that's obviously been in place for a long time. I haven't had any complaints regarding a late operating time. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the, the florist shuts quite early, mm -hmm. so th it doesn't appear that, that that use will operate until that point in time, but my only the only complaints I've received are regarding the early operation. Mm -hmm. sure. well, a question for staff, just to clarify what uh, Council Wigner has, uh, has, has said there. This time change would apply to all four tenancies within the complex yes. and it, it's uh, regardless of what type of use they undertake now, so it could be any use within the future, is that correct? Yes, so it would be um, the entertainment and dining, so a cafe, what we would now call a food and drink outlet, can do the, the later operating hours on the weekend, but all uses could do the 6.30 start under this and regard the fact that only one of them is approved for is it one of them is approved for dining and so Twink New Cafe plus that lot one C would be dining and, and so this cafe. approval would allow them to be interchangeable. So what they've got listed as their tenancies at the moment is is not specific to the approval. So the approval will allow that's them right. To so it would also apply to new shop lot one B and existing shop lot two yes. as as per so all four tenancies regardless of what their use is and into the future of what the use becomes. Yes. So it would, the, the use would be a shop or food and drink outlet, which is what the approach is. To refer to only the current use is not, 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 that, not that clear. It refers to any use from now on. Any the, approved use any under approved this. Would, would, it, would it be fair to say, so, so in that precinct, there's a beauty salon that opens at about half past eight, Riverside mm -hmm. Beauty. Then I think there's a closed shop. So it would be fair to say that really the only thing that's going to open at 6 30 in the morning mm -hmm. would be a cafe mm -hmm. or a coffee shop i mean there would be no other use that would be potentially economically viable like you're not going to open a, a waxing place at 6 30. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's fair to say it would only probably be a coffee shop or a cafe that would make use of that 6 30. i would assume so or a florist, or a florist. Or a florist. <laughs> <laughs> um, question elsewhere in the conditions that haven't been requested change would there be standard requirements around certain noise limits at certain times of the day i'd have to go back and, and check I, d I don't believe we specifically condition noise limits that's usually just done through the environmental act yeah because normally i think seven to ten is a, mm. a standard period and that might be um, i'm going to move an amendment and uh, you yeah, have to keep it up there, please. Uh, oh, can you copy it first, and then I'll show you. I'm just going to add some words into 16. So if you could copy that, please, Kathy. And after the word, seven days a week, except Friday and Saturday, where entertainment and dining business uses with a frontage to Thomas Street may operate till 12 midnight. That uh, would preclude, you're saying that would preclude 1C? Yes. From those provisions. Second it. Yeah, I'll second it. Second it, Councillor Jurisdic. Oh yes, so the, um, it's clear that the, the, um, the little tenancy at the rear is the only one that would likely have any impact on the adjoining residents to the east. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to be flexible to give that uh, tenancy an extra 30 minutes in the morning, I think we should also uh, recognise that uh, 10 o'clock till midnight there is not a desirable thing for those residents. So where we give some in the morning, we'll take some from late night on the weekends to uh, yeah, balance out the amenity. That's the thinking. I'd like to ask a question. Um, in your opinion, is that a reasonable um, addition to that amendment? 
Um, this, my understanding is this application was originally decided by council mm. with that condition on it as it reads at the moment. So um, to base restricting the operation of that rear tenancy now based on it being able to commence at 6.30 in the morning I think would be, a, um, it's a bit of a stretch if I might say. So discriminatory or unreasonable, is that what you're implying? Count, council no. staff can only talk about whether it's a reasonable relevant condition. Oh, okay, so condition. sorry, mm -hmm. can, is it a reasonable relevant condition? Well, when we made when the original application was assessed, it was considered to be reasonable and relevant to include a condition around the time, and at that time, it was recommended to council to go till midnight, and it was accepted that that was a reasonable time to go till. So to, to change that now, um, based on how what is before us in terms of the application and how they're proposing to use the land, I, I would argue is not reasonable. Mm. <laughs> Jack? Yeah, I'm not going to support the, uh, uh, the change. Purely and simply because shop, existing shop lot two, existing shop lot three, fall back onto the, the rear car park. And I mean, if they're operating till midnight, they could be taking uh, stuff out the door, garbage and all the rest of it. I mean, there are two other existing uses there that uh, could be creating uh, noise uh, noise issues and amenity issues for the residents at the rear. So I, I think that's an unreasonable assumption that Lot 1C would be operating in any in, in some different type of facet and would have um, uh, restrictions of, uh, uh, put to it. I do understand the intent, yeah, and it, I think it still boils around to the current use, uh, and uh, I find an unreasonable uh, unreasonable change to apply that just to that uh, that lot one. So we're going to apply times to all um, uh, to all tenancies. I think the time should be consistent. I don't believe that lot one C being as nineteen point two square metres uh, in size is going to create uh, any more uh, amenity issues than the existing shop lot two and the shop lot three, which uh, again back on to. Uh, uh, that area where we have doors that actually back onto uh, that, that area where one seat doesn't. Any other councillors to speak to the amendment? No. Mr. Close, Brian? Yeah, um, no. yeah I'll vote against it. Members <laughs> 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 lost. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll, then. We'll have, the others haven't voted for it. Those, those in favour? Those against? Lost <laughs> unanimously. <laughs> Okay, we go back to the original motion. 6 0. <laughs> uh, Councillors Stewart, Lawrence, and we're going to have spoken to the motion. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Stewart, do you wish to close? No, I think it's all been said. Okay, those in favour? Councillor Lawrence and Stockwell, we're going to, it's unanimous. I think it's carried. Uh, we now move on to Thanks, item. Karen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Patrick you. Again, <laughs> Item three, which is the Noosa trial master plan, referred here for the significance of the issue, and uh, which, yes, item five, page 62 of the Planning and Environment Committee agenda. And, um, hello, Peter. Hello. <laughs> Questions for Peter? Councillor Stockwell, Peter Joe. Thank you. Um, Peter, I noticed that um, the master plan looks to consider Kinkin as a focus area for equestrian experiences. Uh, uh, I received an email the other day that I forwarded on to uh, on the staff with regard to whether Kinkin um, is the most appropriate given the, uh, the Kinkin quarry truck issues and all the rest of it. Is there uh, scope to consider where a, an equestrian experience may, or a hub for equestrian experiences may be located? Yes, um, as, the, as the project commences, we'll be doing a risk assessment right across the network and identifying the high risk areas. Um, I think that'll sort out which areas would be appropriate for different uses. So certainly up in uh, the hinterland area around Kin Kin, there are circuits like the Kin Kin countryside loop, which potentially might be a better, better location for a focus. So yeah, it would be subject to that risk assessment. My, my reading of the master plan uh, looks to avoid conflicts and try to designate some uses in particular areas. Is that uh, is that your reading of it? Yeah, so in the hinterland there's more opportunity for multi-use. So that's the existing Noosa Trail network. We have multi-use horse riding, mountain bike riding, 
walking, you know, jogging, those sort of areas. But as you as you progress towards the coast, there's actually actually less opportunity for multi-use, and that's because you're just coming to yeah. a more developed area. So as we get to the coastal area, talking more, you know, dual use in terms of mountain bike riding, walking, that sort of thing. And the third and final question, given that the, the master planning um, relates to the existing trail network, is there uh, scope and potential, although I'm what I'm reading in, in your, um, uh, your report is there potentially is, to look at um, additional trails in the, in, you know, over time, i.e. even making a, uh, a link, say, from Perigian to Tinkin so that the entire, um, the entire Shire could actually have a, a trail link pathway network that uh, incorporates uh, the entire Shire. Yes, so that's a uh, recommendation of the master plan. And those links are already there. So there's already connections between the hinterland and the coast, but they're just not defined on the map. So there's already fire trails, gravel roads, existing you know, trails that do that connection already. So challenges with crossings in some areas? Like there's always challenges yeah. with crossings. It's not something we can easily avoid. Okay. Thank you. I had, I had a question, Peter. I got an email, email from a lady who was... Um, and this is more for, I guess, her peace of mind. She has horses and she was very keen to know or, I guess, be satisfied that there are a number of people in this Noosa Trails Network stakeholder group who have um, worked with horses or who are involved in horse riding because she was talking about the importance of having wider trails if horses get spooked um, and, and just, just for safety reasons. Is that, is that the case, that you have representatives from the horse industry? Yeah, definitely. So the stakeholder list at the um, second last page, no, the last page? Yep. Page 66. Yeah, so we have uh, Kinkin Kin Bush Trails and um, also some of the other, um, such as the Sunshine Coast Area Trail and Endurance, endurance mm -hmm. Riders. So, yeah, we have different representatives on, on that okay. group. Right. Yeah. We're certainly very vocal, the equestrian mm -hmm. advocates yes. on the group. Yes, and there's, there's no... Um, you know, intent of actually reducing those sort of activities in, in the hinterland. It's more about defining uses so people know where the best place, where, where the predominant use type is, um, but it doesn't exclude certain uses. Would you either being heard in a little horse? Stop that. I'm oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> 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 right. Right. Okay. Um, Tom. Oh. And then Brian. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing that. Um, on page 66 it says um, that we contingent on a financial business case for funding the ongoing maintenance of the trail uh, on the Newsonal Park and the council land. So we're talking about uh, looking for funding for the ongoing maintenance and then um, you put it to business groups to be involved and to, and to contribute financially to the ongoing maintenance of the trails because it's really quite an ask. Yeah. Can, you, can you give us a little overview on, on how that's going? It's still early stages. That was going to be the um, on the agenda for the next stakeholder group meeting is discussing different business models. Um, of course, what, what we're doing with the uh, Pomona to Koran uh, extent is grant funded, so that's a, more of a new initiative, mm -hmm. and we'll continue to look for grant funding. But in terms of the business model moving forward, the stakeholders have put together a few different options. You know, it could be like a downloadable app on the on the new network. It could be um, how we um, charge for fees under our commercial and event operation permits. It could be um, if there's a ecotourism package that uses the network, is there a way that we could charge a small nominal fee that could contribute to the maintenance of the network? It may not have to be much on a fee fee per person basis, but together collectively that, that might help with the operational maintenance. Um, also keeping in mind that, that most of the trail is on an existing network that is or, or already has a, a maintenance schedule. So if it's on a fire trail, mm -hmm. gravel road, bitumen road, whatever, um, there already is a funding allocation either by council or national parks in terms of how that, how that trail is maintained currently. So it's more if there's any additional trails that we need to fund. I was going to say that there's a significant portion in um, on in state forests and national parks and the like that are controlled by is it land controlled by council? So the maintenance of those tracks would be the responsibility of 
that agency, I would imagine, not council. It is, and it would be good to be able to help um, national parks in some way mm -hmm. to actually fund ongoing. If you know, if we're promoting it as a network, that we and actually a, encouraging use. It'd be good to have that additional well, they, they, source. But they promote their own, their own, or have in the past promoted their own trail network, and there are, are, a number of those trails have um, hard, easy, you know, signage and all the rest. It's been from, uh, provided in the past by GPWS and uh, and, and state agencies that uh, that have managed those trails. So I assume that uh, that's the sort of thing that um, they've already got some maintenance yeah. maintenance program in place to maintain the stuff that they have. There. Yeah, correct. Um, can I ask, in the stakeholder reference group for the Noosa Trail Master Plan, um, and on page 66, community and stakeholder uh, groups, um, the Perigian, either the Perigian Family and Friends or the Perigian Beach Association, um, that's a group that's been excluded. Um, okay. Given they've got a, quite a big, big interest in connecting um, infrastructure and pathways and walking and cycling ways, um, can we include them into that group, Peter? Of course. Are they, are they covered by the area of the trial master plan? Uh, I don't think they are. They? They're, they're not, but I think they would like to be involved in the conversation. Um, so just, just testing this, I, I would have yep. thought they'd be more likely to be involved in the cycle uh, network. Um, cycle walking strategy yeah, yeah. as well. I, this I, is more I, in the hinterland. In the hinterland, yeah. but when we're talking as a whole shire connectivity and that's the aim, um, it'd still be great, perhaps, to have. I think that's in the cycle, the, the pathway, the cycle network would be where that issue would come in. This is more into the inland trails. Trail. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. That master plan. Bridgeton Beach Community Association is on the cycle trail network reference group. Yeah, but not the family. And friends no, I request that they so. were, but because they had representation. Ultimately, this would come under the cycle and walking strategy, would it not? Yeah, the, the integration the between the two. Responsibility and overarching yeah. strategy. I would think there's, yeah. Absolutely. There's integration between the two. Because yeah. as you get closer to the coast, there's less opportunity for dirt trails, but then you have to rely more on the, mm. on the, so the pavements. So, Peter, um, I think what we're struggling with, the trails is about a recreational experience, uh, whether you're a horse rider, that takes some length. Whereas the cycle and pedestrian network is about a commute network. So, for example, if you're living in Pridgian Springs and like to get to Pridgian Village by a pathway, that is the uh, pedestrian cycling strategy rather than the Noosa Trail mm. master plan. Is that horses, mountain biking, and so yes. yeah. Okay. yeah, I can answer that. Yes, <laughs> and they are two different things. Joe, come back to your question. Yeah. The, one's primarily about um, uh, transportation, yeah. and, and one's primarily about recreation. I, I, they, they do overlap. I, 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 I disagree with that statement because I mean, yeah. there is an opportunity within the cycling walking strategy to create experiential it is. pathways, i.e. one that went around Lake Danella, for example, so that you could actually yeah. you know, yeah. in, in encompass that. That's not necessarily a community. It could be encompass commutes for certain people, but it could also be an experience. But, oh, oh, I'm not using specifically same, that. Same again, Lake White, you know, around yeah. Lake White. So that cycling, but in terms of the relevant, relevant reference group yeah. for a group that wants to get yeah. a, a, a commute linkage, it's not this one. No, it's the other one. No, just but be, my, my suggestion was that the other group would have at least an input yeah, into I've this done. because they are in a, sitting in an overarching. Okay. Yeah. Peter, just on in regard to the trails um, and Kinkin, Joe jo spoke about that. It, I, I've received information saying it's about three kilometres um, that are shared with quarry trucks, three kilometres of trails that are shared with the quarry, well, yeah, the same right. path as the quarry. Yeah, I'm not sure, but yeah. yeah what what that's are that'd we, be about right, Claire. Yeah, Maybe, track yeah, point for... Yeah, Barry Shepherdson's Lane, then coming back into mm. yeah. Kinkin itself. Yeah. Like, so about yeah. three k. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe even longer. Queen Street, Pound yeah. Street, but Reserve Street. Bear, bearing that in mind, Peter, um, what can we do, because this is obviously an over, overriding, ongoing battle with the quarry, hmm. what can we do in the meantime for those specific areas of the Noosa Trail to, I guess, ensure safety? Do we have to stop them being used? I mean, what is the best process? Because the quarry trucks will continue to come for the foreseeable future. What is the best way we can find a solution for that, that three or four kilometres to keep our people who are on those trails safe? I think that would be part of the trail audit that we're doing. We could look at the um, the number of truck movements mm. for each for each section of roadway, and look then look at potentially how we can realign 
the trail so there's a better crossing point or a safer mm-hmm. crossing, crossing point. Yeah. Because yeah. Sunday, well, Sundays the quarry isn't open, we all know that, so yeah. that's obviously fine. But for the other days, especially that Saturday and Friday, Saturday, that I think would be a really a good thing to do because a lot of the feedback we're getting is that we can't ride our horses, they get spooked by the noise, that's dangerous, people can fall, uh, and just obviously having to share a road with a quarry truck. Um, so that would, that would be really good if you look at that. Yeah, definitely. Without that detailed investigation, I'm not sure how, how we'd actually do that at yeah. this stage, but it's, we could certainly look at that. Thank you. And, and part of the information that we've all been given, um, there's been suggestion that Coran be made as the high horse riding hub. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, that's something that mm. possibly would be great to explore. Um, that is subject to the, um, the upgrade of the riders' grounds um, mm. area there, so we're looking at redoing all the post and rail, the, uh, potentially the shed, Thanks. all that area there. Um, it is a, a popular, popular spot there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Stockwell. Yeah, I'd like to move a motion which is a little uh, different from what was recommended, it's more specific. Uh, it is item A as recommended by staff and then item B, I'll read that, adopt the Noosa Trail Master Plan for the purpose of enabling further detailed planning to be undertaken taken that will include consideration of opportunities and the constraint to achieve one, a shire wide trail network that links the hinterland to the coast and defines trail locations and standards for walkers, runners, mountain bikers, horse riders and canoeists, two, creation of shorter trail loops around existing towns and villages suitable for all ages and abilities, three, a significant enhancement of canoe and kayak trails and infrastructure to, to to link to land trails, in, including along Wyber Creek, Eni Creek, Wooride, Caloosan Creek, and Noosa River and Lakes. Four, linkages between Kalula National Park, uh, Katharabar, uh, it, I think the slash is before, should be before Lake, yeah, uh, Lake Katharabar, Boring Point, Kinkin, and Lake McDonald. Five, opportunities to link to trails in adjoining shires to create opportunity for week-long adventures, noting that any expansion of the trail network is subject to feasibility assessment, landowner consent, ongoing operational maintenance costs and consideration of any new projects as part of Council's annual budget, annual budget process. Second, Councillor Jerusalem. So I do so is that um, hats off to Tourism Noosa and the Noosa Biosphere uh, Reserve Foundation for filling the void by putting this project up a number of years ago by developing it uh, to a point where we had something that we go to the to the government with and receive substantial funding to start improving the Noosa Trail. The Noosa Trail um, has been developed over many years. Um, some early work in the late eighties, early nineties, and then sent substantive body of work um, after that. The first item talks to a little bit about the, the questions that are being asked. The net- network's largely been on fire, fire trails, uh, you know, unmade roads, etc., and historically was very horse and, and walker focused. Um, we now have a huge rise in mountain biking and electric mountain biking, and the, the expectations and the safety issues are ones that we have to work on. So each one of those those uh, modalities has a particular set of safety and design requirements and I think that's one of the things we should be looking at going forward. Uh, one of the suggestions that came out from the recent reference group meeting was maybe we have this main trail that's multi-use but a whole lot of um, uh, different trails that come off. This one is a mountain bike trail, that one's a horse trail. So you know the wider the trail it's for multi-use and you keep aware of um, uh, horses scaring poor old bike riders and the reverse. Um, and I think that's an important step ahead, is starting to look at building the trail so it meets the modern standards that would allow it to not only serve the needs of our residents but also to compete with the numerous uh, similar trails that are occurring around Australia that are attracting uh, visitors to the location. The next one, and a lot of these are, are ones that have, <coughs> have had good airing in the first couple of reference group meetings and a, a lot of support for it. The next one we came out that we just don't want one big long trail. We want so that if mum or dad wanted to go for a, a day bike ride or horse ride, 
that uh, the other parent or carer can stay around and do little loops with the kids. Uh, so we want, or if you just turn up to town, you don't want to spend the whole day, you just want to do a, a small part of it, but there's these loops. The last one is that the, the trail net does have a couple of different canoe trails linked to it. I think there's a great opportunity to really um, showcase the biosphere from the water and a lot of experiences these days market so you're, you're actually not on the bike all the time, you're not on the horse all the time, but you do have the opportunity to get on water or, or do things if it's over a multi-day experience. And so that's probably one of the drivers for why we need to look at that link between Kalula National Park, Lake Katharaba and, and that way, which is a, a link that wasn't envisaged in the trail master plan um, as it was published. And the last one was the thing that we can't just look in isolation. There's shires to our south and to our north that have trail networks and there is a large demand for longer experiences. And I suppose finding, well, working with the adjacent shires, for example, the, the, the one that I like is start up high at the top of the Wyndham Range and end up at Pridgian Beach going around the western side in the Sunny Coast Council area. We need to work with each other. And obviously the last sentence there that's just a, a given there'll be heaps of money available for doing all this now that is obviously the, the <laughs> that is obviously where councils have to look at the priorities and determine how much needs to be allocated to uh, a balance against all the other pressing needs for the ratepayers dollar or whether as we have already been able to get grant funds how we're going to fund the maintenance of those grants thank you council stockwell now yeah, the councillors will speak to the motion. Joe. Yeah, I'm glad to hear Council Stockwell's got these pockets in his wing low, so. <laughs> we'll be donating to the cause. Uh, look, this is one of the great experiential um, uh, opportunities within uh, within the Shire to enhance uh, the number of trails. Uh, is only something that, uh, that the Shire will uh, will benefit from greatly for the future. It also shows, it will also showcase the fact that Hastings Street's not the only thing that we've got uh, that people can, uh, can take uh, uh, take pleasure in uh, in uh, in undertaking and having walked uh, the Blackfish Road to King Kin recently on the network trail and having done the uh, the walk out to Orlando Point in the last uh, last week or so, I can attest that this leads some of the best experiences you can have in our Shire and by far and uh, far and away uh, uh, far, you know the most pleasurable experiences you can have when you're uh, out there commun communing as one with nature. Uh, any uh, upgrade of these facilities and particularly uh, creating linkages that uh, allow you to walk all the way from the, the furthest reaches of King King to Bridgen and beyond to uh, to connect to uh, yes, the uh, adjoining tracks that uh, that go great to you know areas like Harry's Hut and uh, uh, and uh, to to the Wundum, Wundum uh, Range and see the uh, the fire tower up there and uh, and and adjoin beyond that uh, will be great experiences to uh, to be had for the future. So I uh, I wholly and support the upgrade of uh, the tracks and look forward to the master plan coming up with a, a range of uh, projects for the future. Really? Um, I'm happy to support the recommendation and the amendment made by Councillor Stockwell. Um, I think with those inclusions we're um, on our way to being a world-class attraction um, and I think it's important to expand the experience and the possibility of going cross shires um, and linkages. Um, so again, to meet the objective of being a world-class attraction. And okay. I'll just finish by saying something that I said at the Kin Kin um, Food and Wine, that not all roads lead to Hastings Street. Um, <laughs> and, and, this, and this will be proof of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tom. You know, you know, this is, is brilliant and it, 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 all good intentions, but am, am I missing something or it, it, this isn't going to throw a wrench into, you know, the workings that, you, that, that you're going. This is, this is, this is consistent, Brian's uh, suggestion, with, with where you're going? It is consistent. Um, that we're, we're probably going broader again in some aspects for, I, I think, a critical part of this project is actually the promotion and marketing of the trail network. I think that's a really big thing. That's a, a constant constant message we're getting back from the stakeholders is people get lost. Mm. The signage system isn't good enough mm. and we don't know where to go. You know, So people will arrive, visitors arrive into town and they don't know where to go. So I, I think um, Brian's um, amendments are correct, but we're, we'll be looking at other aspects of the project as so well. It'd be, it'd be fair enough to say that without, you know, without a, uh, a quality product, 
we put signage and goodies every signage, but also uh, 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 a track that can be walked or ridden or what, what you know, whatever means people people choose to do. It. Uh, uh, it's not worth promoting and, uh, and publicising until it's at, at that sort of standard. Well, it, it's a works in progress because there are, are areas of track that are quite good um, yeah. and that people utilise already. Yeah. Um, but not, yeah, all, not all the tracks. Not, not all of it. It's not something same. we can easily market right now yeah. until we get until we know exactly what yeah. where we're heading with it. Yeah. Just to build on Tom's question, the the motion as it stands does not impede in any way the focus of the work that's being done with the stakeholders. No. no or all the recommendations so. on page yeah. sixty four. Yeah, it's, it's consistent with what we've discussed yeah. at the stakeholder group meetings. Yeah. 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 Speak. No, I'm happy to support yeah. Councillor Stockwell's uh, motion. I think it's really important that we do um, open this as wide up as possible and include those water features. I think that's really a great initiative. I think it's this whole news of trails is an exciting concept. It, it's great for our tourism industry. It's great for our businesses in the hinterland. It will promote the economy. It will diversify the economy and it will give people a different experience. Um, you know, and we have such a great hinterland that we should really showcase it, and this is a great way to do that. So, thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak for the motion? Uh, I'll speak in favour of it. I um, also would like to compliment the Moosa Biosphere Reserve Foundation and Tourism Moosa um, because uh, it's this exactly this sort of project that sits at the periphery of of, of what council does. This this is brought into fuller focus. Um, to the point where it's being able to be expand, expanded um, to include the whole of the Shire and a more complete um, uh, recreational experience, both terrestrial and aquatic. It also sets out a grand vision, a very ambitious and grand vision, that we'll be working on this for many decades to come. But once it's achieved, it would be world class and something quite incredible. If we can act, get the funds, the federal and state funding, to do this, these uh, these projects, there is a, an enormous amount of work involved in doing that. So it's an economic driver and just getting there, creating these tra this extensive trail network, and also, who's to say, it, it, the benefit that could flow from a trail network like this once it's completed, in both um, uh, in tangible terms and also um, economic benefits, social. Benefits. It's, it's immeasurable, really. So I, I compliment the, the ambitious and expansive nature of this this um, new scope for the, the trial network. And thanks to NBRF and Tourism Noosa for um, planting the seed and getting it going. Mm -hmm. Councillor Stockwell, do you wish to close? It's all been said. Are those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Um, Councillors, um, the next one is a, a large item for so potential amendments to Noosa plan relating to housing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flowers yeah. in that shop. Oh, yeah. It's unlikely to be the problem. It's not going to be the problem. I'm going to be too many times. I don't think the live stream on. You could be really quiet before the live stream. Okay, okay. We're back, everybody. Um, declare the meeting open again. We're up to item four, which is potential amendments to the Noosa Plan 2020 relating to housing choice and affordability. Referred from the Planning and Environment Committee agenda. Item 6, page 70, referred to the significance of the issue. We have Rowena Skinner's strategic plan. Joe, before we begin, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to, uh, in accordance with Chapter 5B of the Local Government Act 2009, uh, I inform the meeting that I have prescribed conflict of interest in the matter as an item in the report specifically refers to changes in the zoning of a site in Denali Street to Wanton. That is at least in part being developed by Chris Wright, with whom I would be considered as having a close friendship. The nature of the friendship stems from my wife having worked for Chris's wife, Kelly, and in the same office where Chris's business is located. Kelly was also treasurer of the Sunshine Beach State High School PNC during my term as PNC president. My wife and I attended Chris and Kelly's wedding, as well as several social functions, gatherings together at each other's houses over the years, and our children were close friends and attended the same playgroup in school growing up. I have no material interest in the development. As a result of my conflict, 
of interest. I will leave the meeting while the matter is considered and voted on, but I will add that um, the CEO, I have the same uh, strenuous objection that uh, other councillors have put forward, that multifaceted reports like this that have uh, you know, one element that uh, a council has a conflict with uh, um, becomes very challenging. There are 11 other uh, areas of amendment in this that a councillor could consider, and uh, I just thought I'd add that comment to, uh, to that conflict. Thanks, Councillor Joe. Yeah, yeah. So, Rowena, just a question. The, the, the motion, the proposed motion, suggests that um, you'll, if, if approved, you'll be preparing amendments for the, the NUSA Plan 2020 uh, in accordance with Division 2 of the Planning Act 2016. So, that includes all the, the uh, changes of zoning to the lots mentioned in here. But what would be the, if, if this motion is approved today, what is the process going forward? Will there be another report come back to yeah. council be, before yeah. it goes out of public consultation? Yeah. Yeah. So my intention would be that this is, this is the first step to get the ball rolling, that we go away and do some work to actually, um, to look at the sites, um, to prepare some, further detail for you on both wording and sites and um, the different scenarios that would come about by those amendments. We would then workshop them with you and formally present that in a, another report. Um, it could, for instance, look at um, other elements of the scheme that we need to amend. So um, in coming months, we would be coming back to you with a great big list of potential scheme amendments and these would just be some of those. So just but to kick start the process. That's right. So this is a matter of starting the process and then us going away, doing some work to then inform you in more detail through a workshopping process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So just one clarification, I think you might have misspoke. You said coming months, you meant coming weeks, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> the group has a large uh, body of work on their agenda already for yeah. council. So. So can I um, ask, just following up mm -hmm. on that, Rowena, um, will we also be looking at um, the impact of short-term accommodation on housing? As um, Councillor will recall, we've got a ministerial condition that says we have to monitor um, both housing, well, that we have to monitor how the planning scheme is meeting the state interests in terms of um, housing as well as tourism. tourism. And housing so we're already obliged to look at that over a two-year period. Um, there are quite a few concerns in trying to preempt the outcome of that monitoring. July. So that, that, that end of July, thirty-first of July. You know, about. twelve months takes you to July this year. Yep. Um, I can't suggest that's been a normal year in terms of either our housing or our tourism. Um, so I guess I just don't want to jump the gun and sort of make head down amendments. Then it may be that we need to make amendments and I'm certainly not ruling that out. Um, and we are, you know, Anita is obviously working on um, a lot of that monitoring process. Um, we're keeping a close eye on the cost of housing, we're keeping a close eye on um, inward migration and things like that, but it's certainly not been a normal time, so I don't want to um, rush to planning scheme amendments in what hasn't been normal circumstances. Um, applications for superseded planning um, applications for short term accommodation, mm -hmm. when does that end? So they have 12 months, months from, yeah, so they go through to the end of July this year. Okay. Um, so again, you know, it, it's hard to know until they run their 12 month course. Okay. And part of the detailed analysis that's required by the ministerial condition, um, are, are we asking residents um, for their input or feedback on how they think um, the new NUSA plan is working? Uh, we're not formally in at this stage, um, but obviously whenever, um, well, Anita will be putting um, potentially a proposed local law or amended local law on that issue to council. Um, the, as 
part of that moving forward will be another consultation round specifically on the aspects of short-term accommodation. And I would imagine that will again um, bring a lot of community feedback back in on that, air, on that issue in general. Um, is there a danger that if we leave it for two years, well, we know that there's going to be already too much damage done that we can't, um, we can't retract or, you know, any homes that are potentially recognised um, as affordable housing? I don't think so. I'm, I haven't observed, um, I, I guess the things I've observed occurring at the moment are for instance, a, a one-off dwelling that's going to short-term accommodation or a duplex that might be going to short-term accommodation. I haven't observed that, you know, it's it's a large block of land that could be developed for a whole lot of units and it's being developed for short-term accommodation instead. So I haven't at this stage noticed that that it, it's, it's land that's being alienated for um, permanent housing. I'm thinking more impact of pushing STAs into medium density zonings where once medium density zonings were identified as affordable housing. So that's where I'm sort of going with this, Rowena. So yeah. is there any merit in, um, again... There, there may be, yeah. and we can certainly look at it. Um, okay. Yeah, the, the medium density residential zone already contains many, many resorts that have been there very long term, like medium density residential zone at Nooseville. I can think of 20 resorts that already exist in that zone at Nooseville. And they're very long term established resorts. So it's not as if that zone is entirely for residential for permanent like, housing like, or right. certainly not affordable housing. Um, I'm talking more Noosa Hill, Sunshine Beach, medium density, and mm -hmm. even the back of Noosa, where um, areas that were um, yeah. tourist or are, are now yeah. becoming primarily residential zones. Yeah. Certainly, we can look at those areas and see okay. if there's problems. Thank yeah. you. Rowan, I've got some questions, just, and it's probably it's more just me understanding. On page 74 of the PE agenda, <coughs> Yeah, you need to stop work. Okay, you, you keep going. Oh, keep sorry. going. Sorry. It's too excited about my questions. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, on the table. Jesus. Um, sorry, everyone. Um, multiple dwelling, you, you've got here, um, multiple dwelling takes the form of small dwellings only. Um, is that 90 square metres and 100 square metres included? So that would be in Donella Street, page 74, when you're talking about that. Small dwellings are up to 100 square metres. Okay, up to, so yeah. irrespective of... Yeah, so, no okay, because 90 is mentioned in the hundreds. I just wanted to clarify. 90, sure. in some parts of the scheme, initially it was 90. Yep. And then through the consultation process, it was changed to 100. But there remained a few references to 90 yeah. that weren't picked up and corrected. So, so it's up to 100. Up to 100. It is, okay. P page 76 and proposed amendment 8.1. Have these amendments been changed to expand the community facility zone to provide for 32 more beds for, is that correct, for Caramar? Um, we, we did, uh, with yep. the new scheme, we rezoned um, yep. additional land at Caramar to the west, but the portion, they had a DA at the time for, yep. I think, the dementia unit, and those ones weren't all captured in the in the the community facility zone. So we're trying to amend the zone boundary to reflect the approval that's been given to them. So that, that wouldn't have anything then really to do with affordable housing, would it? It's more no. just to do with Caramar. It's housing choice. It's housing choice, okay. Yeah. But it's just included in this because this will be included in the amendments that you're doing. Yeah. So there's no, we can't put any affordable, there's nothing to do with affordable no, housing there. Specifically. Okay, um, lots 21, 23 and 25 at Garnet Street, Karoi. Yeah. Um, we're potentially looking at that to move that into medium density. Um, how much land is that and how many small dwellings do you think we could potentially get on that if we worked um, on 90 to 100 square metres? Uh, combined, it's, combined, it wouldn't be more than a couple of thousand square metres. It's already developed. Um, so it's just, a, it's just that redevelopment of those blocks could um, facilitate more units at 
you know, you could assume for every 600 square metres, they'd get at least four. Um, sorry, it looks like Brett's doing a calc right now. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, I don't know, actually. Okay. So, not, so, so 600 square metres gets four if it's, say, 2,000 oh, square least, metres. Yeah. So we're looking at maybe but 20. It, it'll be a more long-term um, proposal because they're already developed. So a couple of them are already in a building unit plan. They yeah. probably won't be redeveloped. Okay. Um, but two of them, two adjoining ones are already in ownership of public housing. Yeah. Um, so they would, at some point down the track, redevelop those sites. They could get, you know, up to 12 units, perhaps. Okay. Well, Can and, I ask? Oh, sorry. Sorry, just a couple. 11.11, um, .11, the proposed amendment to relocatable home park on page 78. I just wasn't sure of the, um, if, if you could just explain that table, I, I wasn't really sure of what we were changing. So effectively, all we're doing is affording relocatable home parks the same provision as retirement villages okay. in the community facility zone. So our community, it's, it's almost identical to what the retirement village allows that it's it makes it a consistent use subject to impact assessment and there's no reason why we wouldn't do the same for a relocatable okay home park okay so what is it a relocatable home park currently now is currently it's inconsistent inconsistent okay so it means impact accessible mm -hmm. same as to mm -hmm. move it into that resident okay um that's that's okay that's all thank you Raymond. Right. thank you frank thank you more questions on I'm going more to the wording of the report, Rowena, mm -hmm. on page 76, Ben Lexon Drive, Sunrise Beach. Yep. Um, second paragraph, it says four of these seven properties are likely to redevelop the public housing units in the short term under the medium density. Can we change that wording to be must be? redevelop for public housing or units in the short term. I'm concerned with all these changes that um, there's not enough conditions uh, that our intended goal, which is to achieve housing affordability and housing supply or diversity in housing, I'm concerned with moving Garnet Street, for instance, expansion of medium density residential zones in Garnet Street. And um, I'm concerned that Again, we're going to get a situation where, under the new NUSA plan, that if a property is located within an applicable zone medium density, that it's consistent use for short-term accommodation and not for affordable housing. So I, my question to you is, will we be conditioning all these um, changes the, to ensure that the intended objection is achieved? The properties in Ben Lexon Drive are already owned by Department of Housing. Yeah. So there's two public housing properties, three private properties, then another two ha two public housing properties. The department has expressed a keen interest to um, redevelop those sites as soon as they're sites, yeah. able, you know if they were able to do so, they would um, in the immediate future. So um, the only issue with that is we can't make them, we can't, um, you know, lodge an application yeah. or do a redevelopment. We provide the basis on which they could get more mm. density in there to, to do that. Okay, um, certainly. But no it's up risk. to them in terms of their own business case and timing about when they will do that. Supplementary, if I can, because it's a good point. When we upzoned close to um, the, the Bowls Club site and uh, the Shire Business Centre, the Moose Business Centre, uh, we put in the tables of development that. Because we're doing it for affordable housing, that the SDS wasn't an acceptable outcome. We could have a look at a similar approach in terms of areas which we are upzoning now for affordable housing to have a similar trigger within the tables of assessment, couldn't we? Uh, if you, if council saw it necessary, yeah. yeah. But it's not a, a, a committed or consistent yeah. land use um, short term. I, I would need to give it further thought and we could cover off on that on the workshop situation. I have one more question um, in reference to the Briggs and Mortar um, needs assessment report in 2017. Um, in the report, you state that it's five years old and considered due for some review. Um, 
Two questions. Um, why have we been referencing a five-year-old document and are there more recent housing and aged care needs assessment reports that have been made available to council? No, there hasn't been any new one, newer ones. So do we commission that? Is that how we it works for Wina? We commissioned it um, okay. back in, I think, 2014, 2015 from memory. Um, roughly within the first year of the amalgamated council, uh, we commissioned a housing needs assessment as as part of preparing for the for the new planning scheme. Yep. Um, Briggs and Mortar prepared it, and council endorsed it for the for the purpose of informing drafting of the scheme. So it was the document council um, had prepared for for that purpose. There's has been no more recent update to it, but it's now getting um, somewhat dated. And it, again, as you know, we've mentioned, the circumstances we're facing now are quite different to what they were five years ago. Or, uh, it was even relying on 2011 si census data. Sure, that's what so, I thought, 2011, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. Councillors, we have a motion for us. I'll move it. Move for Councillor Stewart. Second is Councillor Wegener. Yeah, thank you. Look, I just want to thank Rowena and the team for your hard work on this. There's a lot of research uh, and, and IP that's gone into this, so thank you very much for that. This is just, you know, it should be noted, I guess, for all the listeners, this is just the first step. And obviously, you know, we have, this is the first step in a very long process. Um, but I think it's a step in the right direction, and I think it's a step we had to take. Uh, so I think, you know, this is, this will be reassessed and come back to council after workshops have been done, further considerations, recommendations, staff planning. So there's a lot to be done. Um, this isn't just the be-all and end-all. There may be other sites, other areas uh, that should be noted that may be looked at. This is, but as I said, this is a, a great first step and it's a first step based on everything that we faced in the last 12 months and the affordability of the housing crisis that we had to take. So thank you, Ro. Thank you for your hard work and this is a, a, a great thing, I think, journey to begin on. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, I'd just like to add that I'm encouraged <coughs> that we are going to be looking at um, short-term accommodation because I think it's a major contributing factor in the area of housing affordability and housing choice. Um, so I'm encouraged with what you said, Rowena, that we will consider um, looking at the flaws of the new NUSA plan regarding short-term accommodation provisions. Thank you. Yeah, um, I had a fair bit to say in the planning of bombs, so I won't repeat that other than say that this is a really important process. Um, not only has the world changed significantly since we did have the housing needs assessment, it's changed significantly since we adopted the NUSA plan. Um, in terms of the strategic framework for the NUSA plan, um, this achieving its goals has is now a, a much harder thing to do as a result of the change in the demand and supply of affordable and particularly small housing that um, meets the demands for this community and its growth into the future. So to me, this is the right uh, Second Amendment set of amendments to look at because it addresses the priority planning issue for this community at this stage. Thank you. Councillor Stockwell. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I congratulate uh, Helena for you know, your work on this and um, Council's recogni recognition that these are levers we have to fix, to, to pull to try to fix this problem which the market will not address left onto it, left on its own. And so this is something that the community, it's actually quite the entire uh, community, the Noosa Shire um, community together looking at this problem. And it's um, hopefully we can you know, partially resolve it. We're obviously not going to do it overnight. But I also, with Amelia, I'd like to, to share her concern with short term stays and, say, and saying that the, 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 the promoting and support of short term uh, accommodation is very different from. The support that we are giving to these uh, these affordable housing, they're the two very either apples and oranges, two completely different things. And I'm glad that Amelia is, is concerned about making sure that they maintain apples and oranges. 
Thank you, Tom. I think it was said on Tuesday that um, this issue can't be seen in isolation from the, the proliferation of short-term accommodation. I, I do agree with that. And I think, in a sense, um, even though these amendments and the way we're heading is absolutely necessary and this local government has to play its part in addressing the um, housing um, uh, the housing availability and also affordability issue that's affecting Australia, uh, this country Australia-wide, um, I think we also have to be, to, there's a lot more work to be done in holding the line on short-term accommodation, especially in the low-density residential area, and also refining um, what we're, what we're uh, trying to achieve in the medium density area. There's more work to be done there, clearly, judging by the conversations we've had about applications in the medium density area. Um, but I, I commend the staff for the work, and, um, and uh, I believe the Mayor brought this by a, a mayoral minute. Yes. Yes, and um, it's consistent with um, the uh, motion that was passed in the. Um, when we approved the NUSA planning scheme. So, thank you, Rowena. I look forward to the reports coming back, the updates that will come with that. Um, no, all yeah. good, thank you. Okay, uh, all in favour? Carried unanimously. Councillor Brisbane. Thank you, Rowena. Thanks, Rowena. You can come back. Welcome, Anita. Hello, Anthony. That's right. Hello. 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 Welcome back, Joe. We're up to item five, which is the proposed local law amendment for the short stay letting, uh, which is this is the second version come before the council following public consultation. Uh, it is um, referred from, again, the Planning and Environment Committee agenda. Uh, this is item 7 on page 81, the Planning and Environment Committee agenda. And we have Anita and um, Anthony Hook and Brian Stockwell has a declaration. declaration. Yes, so I wish to inform the meeting that I have a prescribed conflict of interest in this matter as I am the owner of Lot 45 Moosa Lakes Resort at 3 Hilton Terrace 1. I'm also the body corporate chair. The draft local law or short, or short stay letting identify the resort as one of pro the proposed exempt sites as identified in attachment seven of the committee agenda. The draft local law therefore has a different impact on me to the majority of short stay accommodation. Some would say beneficially, others the reverse. I have a prescribed conflict of interest. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. Thank you, Councillor Stockwell. <coughs> I've got a question, Anita. Councillor Stockwell. Thank you. Just looking at um, the information you sent through, thank you, in regard to other shires. Um, in regard to Mornington, and they have to be registered under a local law and renewed, but there is no assessment or approval required. That, is that is that correct? That's yeah. correct. Yeah. With with I notice that they have a contact person have to respond within two hours, and council there can uh, enforce an infringement notice when the um, property owners don't act. So their so their process goes. I'm having a party. Someone complains. Um, they then have the person who's responsible has two hours to respond. If they don't respond, uh, council then the next day, they can be reported then to council and then their council can then issue an infringement notice like you do in a parking fine or anything else. And if they have three infringement notices in 12 months, that property can be deregistered. Is that correct? Uh, partly. Um, so uh, that's correct. If, if uh the situation's not remedied or the, yes. the contact person does yeah, nothing If, if everything goes hours. to custody, yep. is that correct? Yep. Um, so the first point of call is that the council will gather um, information. Yep. So it's not doesn't go straight to a, a fine situation. They yep. do need to investigate it yep. um, and speak to the relevant owner, contact person, neighbours. Yep. Um, if they deem that there was an infringement against the local law, yep. um, then they may be issued a compliance notice. 
um, and then, then the owner has time to comply with that compliance notice. Um, and if they don't, then they may be fined. So there is a bit of a process. So it doesn't go straight to a fine situation. There is an investigation process and they may decide to investigate over a period of time. And do they have the ability to send out their own staff if no one responds? Uh, no, um, their staff are not 24 hours on call. Yeah. Um, the staff will act on the very next business day um, and, and, and deal with that matter. What they do have separate to that is they've engaged the services of a um, security firm mm -hmm. who um, go out on a Thursday and Friday night um, between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. and they observe what's going on and they've, got, they've identified about 20 problem properties um, and they'll basically um, patrol the area uh, and if they identify or, or, or hear that there's an issue going on, they'll sit back and observe and take evidence and notes. They don't, okay. yeah, they don't um, enforce, they don't go onto the property. It's data gathering, information gathering only. And then they will submit that report back to council officers and then council officers go through their due process under the enforcement arrangements of their local law. So Friday, Saturday nights from mm -hmm. 10 to 2, yeah. what's the cost to council to engage that? So, um, that, that particular security firm does all has won the tender for all their security work, okay. so for all their properties. But um, the amount that they pay per hour <coughs> is between sixty and eighty dollars for that okay. service. So, uh, so three hundred and fifty dollars, say, um, per night. Okay, so over it's two actually, nights, so seven hundred bucks a weekend, something like that. Thirty-five thousand a year, yeah. thereabouts. Yeah. Right? Okay. Council currently unemployed. Uh, uh, undertakes security services through a, a contract with a council premises and like it does it not? Yeah. Okay. Can I, um, Councils, I know there's a few questions about, because um, I've had councils talking to me before the meeting about the, um, the enforcement element, yeah. and, and what I've suggested to a few is that it might be a good idea to run through a scenario for one of a better phrase, just to see how it would work under what's before council today. So in other words, I'll use the example of a um, you know party going on on a Friday night at midnight, so what would, what would be the process under what's before you today and how would that be different to a process under a Mornington type of style or what other options are out there? That'd be great. I know Tom had raised this question with me as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of people watching right now who this is a really important issue for and a lot of them are, are residents um, and they'll want to know how, what's going to, but what their um, ability and what they can do uh, what if there's an, uh, a party going on next door? So could we just do a little bit of role play? Yep. I, yeah. I will be the party goer. I'll go, not the party goer. <laughs> I should restate that. I will be the person that, that has rented the Airbnb. And you will be the next door neighbor. Okay. And so we'll, we'll start yeah. out. It's, it's Friday night. Um, it's 11 o'clock. We come back from dinner. We're, we're just acting as I would normally do if I was at home. You know, out of the balcony, having a few drinks, jumping in the pool. And, uh, and, it, and, it, and it's bothering you, and it, it's, it's uh, affecting your amenity. As uh, a resident, what do you do? Okay, so in the first instance, a requirement of the approval under the local law is no, that... No, sorry, are we in Noosa now or another let's, council? Let's, let's no, just... The, the, kind of the current, current scenario. Sorry. Okay. For Noosa. As a resident yes. who doesn't know all that stuff, what do you do? Okay, so each property that has an approval under the local law has a nominated contact person and that those details are on a sign that's placed out the front of the a dwelling house in, in the instance of a house um, with a phone number for contacting 24 hours so that resident would contact that contact person in the first instance and make a complaint that contact person okay now, okay, okay so now it goes back to me yep so you you've made a complaint sorry 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 and this isn't a cross-examination no, by no, the no. way this is just just a role play yeah yeah um, and so they make a complaint. Maybe I get a call from that the um, that property manager, and maybe I go, oh, gee, sorry, and and it stops, and everything stops there, and the, and I comply with it. Or maybe my phone rings. I look at it. I don't recognize the number. There's no contact, and I just make I just carry on. So let's say it's one in the morning. Uh, we knock a beer off the balcony, smash it down below. Somebody goes down there with bare feet, tries to clean it up, cuts themselves. You know, it's a loud mess. What do you do? 
And who am I? So the neighbor. You, you, you're, oh, the neighbor. Yeah. you're the neighbor. You're the neighbor. You're the neighbor who's out, you know, yep. the first complaint hasn't been dealt with. What okay, so the first complaint hasn't been dealt with. Yep. Um, and if the situation um, is getting uh, rowdy, aggressive, or, you know, there, there are issues, they call the police. So I think we missed a step there. Okay. The contact person has been contacted. He's rung. Tom, yep. who's still raging. Tom doesn't pick up the phone. Oh, okay. So then what, is the, what does the responsible person do, the, the contact person do, in that instance where there's no answer at the house? Oh, so 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 sorry, no, the no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. Um, Frank, we're just, the role play is, is you're just the resident next door and I'm the, I'm the Airbnb. We're not yeah. talking about what the council's doing or what the property managers are doing. But we do have to understand That's what the property manager's role is. I, no, I, I, no, agree I, I agree. Let me just play this out because... The people out there who are watching are residents who are in in the yeah. spot. You know, I mean, that's but we're missing step. a step, Tom. Yeah, in that interim step, yeah. if um, Anita's rung up the, the the agent, if I call them that, I'll play the agent. <laughs> <laughs> and Anita's rung you. Can she's I tried to contact there, and that hasn't worked. Yeah. What do you do next? Yeah, yeah. Is, what's your obligation to do next? Oh, so, do do next? so you're yeah. the contact person? Yes. Yeah. What's your and obligation if you can't contact? Okay, so, and it's specified in that uh, complaints procedure. You would probably, that might be the first step, well, make, initial contact, yes. uh, make that initial contact with the guest. Um, and if there's no reply, you would have to uh, attend to the premises mm -hmm. and actually deal with it. So mm -hmm. there might be a number of scenarios that you have to go to through until that matter is resolved to the standard and the, of the code of conduct for guest behaviour. Mm -hmm. So basically that 30 minutes is that you have to have responded to the initial complaint within that time frame, but it may take you hours to deal with the complaint. Mm -hmm. So I... I, I... I get no answer, so I then drive the over property. within yep. 20 minutes yep. and I tell Tom, Tom, you're making noise, we're getting complaints, can you keep it yeah, down, yeah. please? Yep. So Tom either does the right thing. If he does not, oh, well, sorry, that, this is your question there. I've asked Tom to do the right thing. He's either done it and, and quietened down, problem solved, or you've got another question. Or, or can, you know, A, A, I do that, or B, I say, yeah, shh, mum's the word, call, call, you drive away, situation's good. We start up again, drop beer, falls off, okay. crashes, yep. screaming again. And, so the um, neighbours then contacted yep. the contact person again. Yeah, they yeah. need to attend the property again. Tom, I'm back I... here again. I'm getting pretty annoyed. Okay. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Mum's the word. Can I, can I add, both in the Mornington Peninsula and under the revised draft local laws, the designated contact people are a security company, um, real estate agent or managing agent or an individual. So... Um, I would love a conversation around... Well, hold on, Amelia. Sorry. Sorry, I know that there's, there's people watching okay. and they want us to, to, to finish off the role play here. Okay. Because, because Anita has called the, 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 manager, the property manager twice. I've promised to be good. Saturday night comes around. Anita, has there been any contact back and forth with you? I mean, have they said, oh, we, we're going to take care of the situation? Or is there any obligation for, for this person to contact the resident and say, okay, we're, we're trying to work this out. Is there an obligation to do that? There's an initial obligation at the time of rental that the contact person explain to and notify the guests of their obligations under the code of conduct, yeah, but, and then they would... I would I'm, I'm the guest, you're the yeah, resident. So, yeah. Um, so, so the contact person is obliged to notify the guest um, of their obligations under the code of conduct for guest behaviour. And if they've attended the property twice, I would suggest that part of that conversation is, here's the code of conduct you were meant to adhere to. Okay. Um, and it may well get to a situation where that contact person may not be able to resolve the matter and the police need to be called in because it's beyond their control or power. You do get rogue guests and providing that, that contact person has um, managed the process in accordance with the, the local law and the, and the um, complaints procedure, then they've done everything reasonable they can. It may well be a police matter or they um, yeah, tell they the people to leave. The okay. Yeah. So it, it's Saturday night. Same thing happens again. Yep. You call, just say twice. I'm, I'm, I'm just acting, I'm, I'm, I'm yep. the guest. Yep. Um, Sunday, same thing happens again. Same group of people. Um, what uh, when you say call the police, 
here I just got a, a letter that I just received this morning it said the owner did not respond to my S SMS at 12:30 I called the police the police only had a recorded message saying there is no police in the area at this time so calling the police for you to call the police at 12:30 is meaningless because you get you just get an answer report mm -hmm. so on Monday morning it's now Monday morning you've got three nights of the same uh, group there. The, 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 the group has been saying, nope, we're all good. We're, we're complying with the, you know, the code. What do you do on Monday morning as, as the resident? As the resident, you contact council um, and advise them of the complaint, that it was a recurring complaint, that the contact person attended the property, if they did their job or not, three times, four times, but it was a recurring issue. Um, council would then um, undertake to investigate that and see whether there's an issue um, in that instance that is recurring. So, you know, we may already have a record of that particular property or that manager who's not performing um, in accordance with the local law. So there is an investigation process that council ha has to undertake. So how, how does that affect you? You're the resident, so you've called, the, you've called the council. Council says, write a report. So you spend your Monday writing a report to council and then will council come to you and, and have and do an investigation and meet with you personally, you think? They may do, yeah. So part of their information gathering is they would likely attend the property, speak to the um, contact person, speak to the complainant, um, and any evidence that they may or may, may not have um, in, in formulating a view um, as to whether, um, you know, as I said, if it was a recurring issue, that they may issue a compliance notice um, and then the property owner um, would have to meet those obligations. So if it was non-compliance with noise and behaviour, um, and if it was recurring, uh, then they may well have their approval um, suspended or cancelled. Okay, well, for the, for the neighbour yourself here um, that, that, that has made the complaints, what is a reasonable amount of time? Like, you know, you spend your day, your Monday writing there. When, when do you think, you know, council might come and begin the investigation? on average? Uh, well, I guess we still have to um, look at that, those details about implementation time. There is no specified time of council response back, um, and I guess it would depend on workload, but I mean, you would hope that there was an initial response back to that person within that first 24 hour period of being notified of a complaint. And Tom, just, just to explain that a bit further, yep. so we have uh, a range of other offences that people might do, whether it's you know dog attacks or dog barking or whatever it might be. For each of those, we have uh, adopted response time. So, for example, a serious dog attack on a child will do within you know an hour or whatever it might be. Um, a dog barking might be within 24 hours and things like that. So we we'll probably end up having to do the same thing here. Is what's the nature of the complaint? How quickly do we need to respond? Depending on whether it's serious, you know, whether it's someone not having taken the bins in might be different to having a party every night and what level of response we put into that. Okay. What, what I'm getting at is that I, I've just, I suspect that as the resident, you're not going to be overjoyed or, or, or you're not going to be satisfied that there's, that there's a remedy and this isn't going to happen the next weekend or the next weekend. And I think you'd be frustrated because there's nothing in the local laws that says council has to tell you what's happening or even you might be wondering what the property manager was doing and you might want to see what this register says and of course the property manager may well say oh the, you know they, these were good people you know kind of an irate neighbor I was called up several times but you know the, the Airbnb people were, were good people they, they, they you know they're, they're, they're okay so the, the register doesn't really reflect what your experience and the register is actually an opaque piece that you'll never see in the investigation. This is the where the, the system where I'm going to, but I, I don't think it, wor it works for the resident. The resident this is, this is, is an out of the cold. This is an opinion. Yeah, yeah okay. So can I then suggest, can I ask a similar question to Anita, but this time, same type of scenario, but imagine we were using the Morton, is it Mornington Peninsula? Morton Peninsula. Peninsula. What would be different? in terms of what we've just run through with that Tom scenario compared to what the um, Morton scenario might, Morton, the Morton Morton. Peninsula scenario might be. What would be the fundamental differences? Um, the key difference is the required response time is two hours at Mornington, ours is 30 minutes. Yep. Um, so we have a quicker, higher level of response time. 
Um, the council would get back to the complainant, or the, which is the same, on the next business day. Um, the key difference in terms of the complaints process and gathering information is that um, Morton have the security service um, doing rounds. So how do they find out about it? Well, there is no hotline to them or anything like that. So basically, Morton Council gives Mornington. what's Mornington. Sorry, Mornington, <laughs> Mornington give a direction to the um, security services what properties to monitor. So if they've had problems with a particular property and they're recurring, they would say go out and investigate this over the, the coming weekends or days and nights and gather information so that we can take action. And the, the, similar to the Mornington Peninsula uh, scenario, the contact person, the responsible person whose number's on the front of the property, they could be a security firm here as well. So uh, in actual fact, um, in terms of the contact person, I removed security firm. It may be a security firm, but we'll determine that whether it's suitable at the time of application. So we've said letting agency, property agency, or the like, mm. um, because uh, in consultation with the stakeholder group, they didn't feel that that was a suitable response. Um, contact person being responsible because but they're not be managing the property per se. Right. So a contact person um, obviously is authorised by the owner to enter the premises, deal with um, guests, security firm being a third party. I'm not sure how that would work. So we've, we've, we've left that out at the application time. If someone put forward the contact person was a particular security firm, we could assess that at the time. Okay. But it doesn't, rule, doesn't rule it out. doesn't rule it out. Mm. But an individual owner could choose a security firm if they wanted to, would give them access to the key they and may. The they may, person. yeah. Not, not discounting yeah. a security firm. No, utilised I just, individual just removed it from the example. And they, did the stakeholder group think 30 minutes was a reasonable time over? Because I noticed that... In a lot of these, it's two hours. Some are up to twelve hours. Yeah. Thirty minutes on a Saturday or a Friday night. Is that? Did they deem that? What did the? I'd be interested to hear what the stakeholders, the people who are actually living, breathing this, thought about that, and just said the success of that or the ability to, to even get back to someone in thirty minutes. I guess the response varied from the on-site managers. Um, their response times are dictated by an agreement between them and the body corporate. Yeah. Um, and in some of those instances, um, they're up to two hours. Um, but in terms of a general response, I didn't get any negative feedback about the 30 minutes yeah. per se. Because yeah. that's just a phone call anyway. That's an initial well, that's right. response, an well. and it might be a phone call. It might be attending the property if you live three doors mm -hmm. down, um, but that's having the initial response. Okay, I'm on to it, and then the action occurs. Yeah. Um, I've was, got there any, was there any response to a little bit um, of proximity of 20 minutes away. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little, um, I, I'm struggling a little bit with a, with a time frame on that because you know, it's, it, it, you know, it's relative to traffic flows and all the rest of it. Not that we have those sort of things on a Saturday night. Really. They don't it have is, to get there but, in were, 20 were, minutes. Were, were, were the, were the, was the 20 minute time period something that um, to attend uh, something was brought up by the stakeholder group at all? No, so it has been broadened. In the first draft, it was that yeah. that contact person lived. 20 minutes away because we've broadened who a contact person may be so it may be a property agency business mm -hmm. it's now that the business or the um the person is located within 20 minutes so it's about having that local presence mm -hmm. and i guess the ability to yes get to the property within 20 minutes but the 20 minute time frame no wasn't hasn't been raised as was there any, was there any concerns with the safety like, so if you've got a, a group of you know as tom alluded to you got all these people partying say you got a group of guys making a loud ruckus and your contact person turns up they're all drunk yeah and says hey guys quieten down was there any concern about the safety mm. of the contact person mm. turning up to that situation um in regards to having that conversation about that it may be outside the scope of the contact person, they've done everything they can, they, can. they turn up to a, a bad situation, and but they've, they've acted in accordance with their obligations under the local law, but it's a police matter. So, so that doesn't help that, like, are we putting people in, in really uh, you know, uncomfortable situations by having, I mean, imagine if I'm a contact yeah. person and I'm a woman, mm. and I turn up to 10 mm. guys who are drunk, yeah. I say, hey, turn it down on the contact person. Yeah. 
So yeah. what a lot of places yeah. are other Sorry, jurisdictions. Sorry, can I get an answer to that question? Um, there is a safety factor there, yes, and and maybe that's something that particularly where the contact person is a letting agency or something like that, that they have, um, you know, maybe for those those periods overnight men or security. I'm, I'm, can I, can so I, to follow on with I, Mayor's question, that this is the sort of issue that, that mm. on-site managers face in, in resorts. Yes. All the time. Mm. Yeah. All the time. Mm. Yeah. So we know um, in some Anita. places, Anita, sorry, um, Anita, in some places, uh, if there is a risk, and there is often a risk um, of safety, public, uh, of personal safety, um, a lot of short-term accommodation places have designated security services. Mm. Um, and beyond that, what a lot of um, short-term accommodation providers also do is they ask for an excessive bond like we've stayed down at Shoalhaven um, and we've Airbnb'd all across New South Wales. They asked for $2,000 in bond. If a security guard is called, one call out the first time, $500. Gets say, taken, it gets, a, um, sorry, so it has, if I can finish Joe, please. So second call out is $1,000. Um, have we actually investigated um, how other jurisdictions like Shoalhaven um, enforce compliance sort of issues? Have we looked at security guards? So who's charging? Who's charging the money? Um, the provider, the sh whoever whoever is hosting the house. If there is a call out, um, they will take five hundred dollars out of so the guess, guest bond. Yeah, I guess that would be um, up to each in individual um, management agency what their protocols are. Is there anything in the local law that specifies that no no so should we be thinking about that and throwing rather than ratepayers paying for a security service should the onus be back at the people that are either using their premise um, a, a, as a commercial service is that something we should be thinking about I guess there's no requirement that um, the contact person be a business like a letting agency or even being a licensed real estate agent okay that's a state matter so anyone can manage a property um, I'm not sure I'd have to take advice on how you would require someone to take a bond of a certain amount and that be allocated to security services I, I can't answer I don't I don't have an answer. Good question. Well, yeah, I, I would like to follow up on that. Is would it be possible for council to first you get that phone call that and I, I said in my email between here and here, get uh, Frank gets the complaint from from you, then you might say, oh, okay, did he, nothing happened. That you weren't contacted back. You're not. You're not happy. Noise you, is still going on. Noise, noise is still going on you call up a council officer or a security, security. guard and you say, okay, the, the time starts now. You, you start your top, it's your stopwatch. 30 minutes later, not the, no contact or at least nothing has been done. You get your fine on the spot. And that way, you you actually are making a difference. See, TK, is that possible then actually a second fine later on? Um, well, I guess that would be a decision of council as to whether um, a secondary contact person is Required. council or a third party being a security service that council has engaged. Um, now, in terms of what powers you, you give those people, is it just observing? Is it enforcing? Um, that would be... Um, and then in terms of um, on-spot fines, now, that, that's outside the normal scope of the local law um, and how uh, our uh, approvals and enforcement of approvals currently operate. There is an investigation process before. It's not necessarily an on-the-spot fine situation unless it's deemed to be um, of public risk or health to health um, where council may issue a on-the-spot cancellation of an approval. So these people have an approval and there is a process, conditions of approval, um, and so we have to investigate whether there are breaches against that approval so in I'm, issuing anything in the first step's normally a compliance notice. So back to the Local Laws um, Authority, under the Local Government Act, 
doesn't that, isn't there a provision in there that allows council to appoint an officer to be authorised for the purposes of administering any act, regulation or local laws? So can we extend the powers of our local laws officers if they're operating after five and um, are... Do you mean to a third party being a security company? No, I'm actually saying to local laws officers to collect data. My, my actual understanding oh, right. with Mornington so Peninsula yeah. um, was in the early stages. Um, they actually had local laws officers not going after 10 yeah. o'clock, but they were going after 5 p.m. because noise nuisances occur after 5, not between 9 and 5. So their local laws officers, my understanding, Anita, was they were going out there, but only for data collection, just to verify what was actually happening was happening. Um, and not to yeah. step out of the car, not to put themselves yeah. at risk. That's what so I that expressed to say previously, that I wouldn't yeah. want council staff going yeah. out for the yeah. same route you said, knocking on doors at yeah. 10 o'clock yeah. at night but with a bunch a of drugs. But step. Yeah. Yeah. it's a first step. Evidence yeah. gathering might so, be So just gathering. to clarify, yeah. they weren't council officers, they were the third party security company. Oh, they were. Yes. So this is the security yes. company. Yes, that was the role of them. Okay. Um, and during those hours of 10pm and 2am, Friday and Saturday night, yep. um, so they're engaged by council for eight hours over the weekend yep. just to observe. And council may give them a list of um, problem properties. And as, as I said to you earlier, they've got about 20 that they regularly, or ones that have been identified through a complaints process. So for them to gather evidence so that they can then take that evidence back to council and commence a process under the local law um, for infringements. Anita, I understand this is a Queensland first, it's local law. And could you um, spend a, just explain the process we're here today, you've got a motion before us is to put this local law out for public consultation. What is the process going forward from here, depending on types of feedback that we may receive? There may, and if we get sort of feedback expressing the same concerns that Tom or Amelia have expressed, what would be the, yep. the process from there? Uh, so, yes, so the local law, like subject to council's uh, endorsement. For public notification will go out for i've got in the report four weeks but we will extend that to five weeks um, post easter so that mm. residents are home um, and during that period we'll take submissions written submissions um, we're also proposing uh, to engage uh, with a, maybe a complainant type group or resident group to hear um, their views um, uh, but also they're able to make written submissions for that five week period. Same with every other stakeholder. We've engaged a lot with um, our uh, STA, yeah, STA stakeholders. We will engage with them further. Again, they can make submissions. We'll then consider all the submissions and uh, provide a report to council on those submissions and any recommendations for changes. Um, and it may well be if the, if the changes are substantial, and it's a complete redirection, okay. likely we'll go back out to public notification again. Okay. So this is already, the, because these, these changes in this revised are substantial, that's why we're going out for the second time, but there's no reason why you wouldn't go out for a third. Anthony, can I add to, to Anita, and I, and I guess that, uh, and, and Tom, I, I totally understand, you know, for the last few years, this has um, been a, um, a challenging area for us to get in the planning scheme and now in the local law. So just to, a reminder of, I guess, what's in front of you, and then um, reiterating what Anita is saying around the way forward. So, I think we're at the opportunity for refinement. There's been a number of years now of work, and so what we've tried to present, I guess, is an integrated, complete, holistic approach to managing the impacts of short stay. And if we go back to first principles, it's the it's a negative impact on residential amenity. So that's the principle that we're really trying to. Uh, address with planning scheme and this local law. So this revised, this is a revised draft, um, is a significant step forward in my view. And the key elements, just to reiterate, I guess, for everyone, it's approval, not registration. So I'm not aware of any other area that is actually doing an approvals process rather than registration of properties. So that's number one, which to me is a, a higher level of governance and, and uh, regulation. Um, it is well researched. We've got a code of conduct. We've had a lot of legal tests and privacy tests. So those are the other things you have to consider if we change. Mm. Um, and now the next part, I think, is really around that complaints process and how we roll out mm. implementation, funding and resources. That's kind of the key. So in summary, in the five weeks consultation, 
um, in my view, just I think here in the room and, and building on Anita, it's, if we focus on testing this proposed position with complaints that we have, uh, Michael here, we have complaints, we have a record of complaints, how would it differ if we had this local law and our process? So I think it's really testing that's those scenarios. Um, engage with the stakeholder groups. We've engaged with an industry group. We probably now need to maybe engage a little more with the complaint side. Yes. Um, and and mm -hmm. and also the wider property management, because my understanding of um, listening to um, the circumstances around complaints, a lot of it is non-respondent mm -hmm. respondents mm -hmm. of contact person. Mm. So let's understand that, let's engage with that a bit more. Um, I think it would be really good for councillors to hear firsthand, maybe the Mornington Peninsula, um, you know, whether it's on um, Skype um, or uh, virtually, let's let's listen and, and then you can maybe question, maybe that's an, op uh, an option. And then as I say, lastly I've got here is really the critical thing is now scoping out those resources, security or not, um, and, and, and the implementation and funding and also around implementation, how much online and how much actual uh, technology do we use to monitor this 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 uh, challenge? So those that was kind of the the wrap for me on what I've heard and where the way forward. Anthony, can I ask? Um, and I don't know if this is the elephant in the room, but existing use rights, properties with existing use rights. My understanding that they're not included in the local laws approach, um, and that the three strikes and you're out doesn't apply that you can't actually um, remove someone's existing use rights. Can you talk about that? Um, so the local law can apply to yeah. properties with existing use yeah, rights. Okay. It can apply to um, properties that have a history and new properties as well. So, okay. um, so what happens in the instance of, say, if there was a cancellation, the, if the existing use rights still remain, it's just suspended for a period of time until whatever the issue is has been remedied. But existing use rights are still there. It's a forever right. It, providing it's a continuous use. And if it's been suspended by a local law, it's still, it, it still remains intact. So, 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 we can, so if I can no. probably just explain that. One of the things that short stay is a cause of confusion in our community is about the difference between the planning scheme and the local law. Yes. The planning scheme deals with where they can occur and it's based on zoning and where they, where they yeah. can be permitted and that's where you've got existing use rights and how that applies. The local law deals with how they operate, deals with the amenity, the hours of operation, access to Frank who's going to answer all the phone calls. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, they deal with two slightly different things. And there's often an argument I've heard is, oh, well, by bringing in local law, you're retrospectively taking away people's rights. Yeah. But that's not the case. Um, probably the best example of that I can give is, you know, pool fencing, where people have had pools. Now, new laws come in, well, you've got a pool, you've still got the right to have a pool, but now you need to do something extra in terms of the safety for that pool to keep your neighbours safe. You've got to put up a pool fence. That's not a, taking away your existing rights to have a pool, it's adding it. So the local law is a bit similar to that type of scenario. It's about how do we protect um, what is occurring in that place to protect the residential amenity of the neighbourhood. So that's the, the, the fundamental difference. Joe, you had a question? I guess, yeah. Uh, my, my question relates to um, reading uh, removal of reference to cancel suspended approvals and convictions within the last two years and broad and um, uh, we talk about suspensions and cancellations. Um, at what, so, this uh, local law like this is introduced. At what point do we issue fines? What are the levels of the fines? And what point mm -hmm. after fines have been issued do we look at suspension? And what are, I think that I, I haven't read any of that within the local law. Is that something local law should cover? Uh, so the subordinate local law um, is uh, dealing with the short stay letting and home hosted accommodation requirements. Mm -hmm. The higher level authorising local law one stipulates how it operates in terms of an enforcement arrangement. So um, that's why you, you, you're not. I don't recall actually reading that. Well, yeah, it, it, it's not part of the subordinate local law. It, it sits higher um, over all of council's so prescribed the of, activities. So what the penalty points are? All of the penalty points. At what point, what point the penalty points accrue? what point suspension occurs and how long that suspension is and what parameters under which that suspension can be lifted, all of those things sitting above the... In local law one, yes, it specifies the maximum number penalty points that can be applied um, and um, 
it doesn't talk to how long a suspension is or anything like that. That would be on a case-by-case -case basis um, when council commences a process of enforcement. But that's something that has to be clearly articulated, would it not, what the, what the process is to go through? The process is outlined in Local Law 1, so in the first instance. And that hasn't been included? It's already sits in our authorising local so law. We've got some, but we've got nothing in local law one that refers to short stay accommodation. We've got with, with regard to it, it, it is by amendment with this local law. Okay. So that new prescribed activity is added to local law number one, authorising council to take action. And the the, the, the actions that are already uh, encompassed in local law one. That's correct. To and that's the, the, that's the process that we yeah. undertake for all of our prescribed activities that okay. council. Um, yeah. Just to further what Joe said, um, I've got the Mornington Peninsula short stay rental oh, local law in front of me, and they add a section apart for enforcement, and it's really simple. Um, and I, I keep thinking residents. Um, the local law is great and very legal and very. Um, it was hard to read. Um, this is very, very simple. And part four of the Mornington Peninsula local law says offences. Um, person who does not do anything required, to, um, a person who fails to comply with a notice to comply, then page after, it'll refer to what the penalty is for that 10 units. And if a unit's $133, I think it is, you know immediately if this guy isn't registered, if he doesn't comply with the code of conduct, there's a penalty. And I think this is peace of mind for residents. Residents need, because I think we, oh, sorry. So so is this going to be included, do you think? Um, well, as I said, we already have that written. It just sits in our authorising local law. Their local laws are set up slightly different to ours. Yeah. So it's it's standalone in terms of it has all of its enforcement measures in there. Ours sit at the higher level Could in an overarching. Just, um, again, I'm just thinking for yeah, residents. It may be an easy to read music I think, I think yeah. this comes back to that attachment four, and the question is what's a, a, mm. an, a, a, I accept your point, no one reads the local no. law, not even me. No. I mean, no, <laughs> unless you've got but, trouble but, sleeping but at night. But it's written like but, this, you do. It's yeah. Yeah. so I think, simplistic. I, I think um, it would be useful to have a, a guide, if you like, yeah. that pulls out that um, information yeah. about what's in the mm. local law. Oh, that's right. Yes. I've got to be doing that. So all of that's so simple. Um, part of our consultation yep. process will include um, planning the yeah. English fact sheets um, and um, the complaints procedures um, and enforcement measures. Uh, and on that, when we have to have a sign up and it has to have a designated contact person, uh, well played by Frank in this instance. <laughs> uh, can we potentially then have a website that yeah underneath that that linked straight to that fact sheet, so someone could straight away they've got a contact number they could then go here's the website I can get on I can check the fact sheet straight away. I don't, I, I'm just thinking you know on the sign just for some just further information for people um, that they may not be aware of it they may not follow council but when it's right next to them they might go oh here it is. Uh, yes. Yeah. And the other just, question... Just play just on that. The other, the new technology that people are getting used just to... Just download an app. QR, QR yeah, code, you right actually put it on there and it takes you straight to that plain yeah. English version of but, what the rules are. But I, I, I'm thinking about my mum who's 80. She wouldn't have... Sure. You yeah. know, there's a lot of people, elderly, yeah. who would be, I guess, affected by this, who, who, if they had something right there, it might be a bit simpler for them than... My mum would never know what an app is. You know, so. yeah. The other question, Anthony, is can we, if we're looking at the cost of security guard, we've worked out at about 35000 a year then look at what the cost to our organisation in regard to employing more local law staff would be. So we've got, I guess we've got, we're looking at both, because they're not, neither of them, they're doing the same job, you know, so they're both just, they're data collecting and monitoring. But can... In actual fact, they would be doing a higher level of, of job because um, initially uh, the monitoring and investigating uh, wasn't part of the role that we'd identified for the local laws officer. Um, that was undertaking compliance during business hours mm. um, and doing checks and follow-ups. follow, follow ups. Um, The security, if we were thinking about doing that after hours, would be above and beyond that. Yeah, Joe, question. Okay. Um, one of the elements that doesn't come into this, and uh, I think it's where Tom was going with issuing of fines, who the, who the fine gets issued to. If you were going to issue fines, who would a fine get issued to? Um, could you issue uh, our our only scope in this, as I understand, would be to issue or, or deal with the uh, property owner slash manager, and, and not the actual 
person that is offending? That's, is, that, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So we can only um, issue compliance notices and fines and follow-ups to the approval holder. Um, and that approval holder may be the owner or someone authorised by the owner. Um, so I guess it places all the responsibility on that owner to make sure their management and their contact person is of a, a good standard and quality and meets the obligations of the local law because they could well um, uh, be have infringements against well, the local one law. Of, one of the, one of the um, things a platform like Airbnb does is it, uh, it rates um, property uh, owners, managers, and also those that, that rent the property. Uh, that, that is, <coughs> so platforms like that uh, would give, uh, I'm assuming, if, um, if they did go through those sort of platforms, that would give uh, owners a, 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 a platform to look at problem uh, problem uh, tenants or problem, problem uh, um, renters? Uh, that's correct. I guess in their assessment as to whether they're going to um, rent the place out to these people, they'd say, oh, they're going to be a problem. So. Um, I, I might not go there. Is that would that infringe on privacy, um, privacy information act? Should you have that information available in an exclusion register? I'm, I'm thinking, is that so? I is guess that if, legal. Well, is what I'm uh, asking. Well, I just what think that's about Airbnb Airbnb is, with regard to how yeah. they run their platform. Yeah. 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 Councillors, I'm going to move the motion on page uh, 82 of the the report to the recommendation. I'd like to move that as a motion. Um, I'll second it. You're seconded, Councillor Stewart. We can ask more questions as we go, if you like. Councillor, I, I, I commend staff on the enormous Sweet. amount of work that's, that's gone into this, the second draft of the local mm. law. Um, after the first one went out, we got an enormous amount of feedback and this, you've summarised the submissions extremely well. You've listened um, and you've refined the local law, proposed local law into something that is a workable proposal we can put out for further public consultation. I'm really looking forward to um, hearing what the 56 complainants that are at, with, with Council has heard from mm -hmm. since the introduction of the Noosa planning scheme um, would have to say about how this would um, change their circumstances had this local law been in place. Also working, looking at, at hearing the feedback from the resident groups mm -hmm. about whether they're satisfied with the response as well. Mm. Um, I also appreciate that while you've learned a lot from Mornington Peninsula and as, as well as other local governments from around Australia, and this, that's a huge body of work in itself, what you've put before us here is something that will work under the current Queensland legislative framework. We're different to other states. And what you've put here is something that we can work with here in Queensland. Um, there's more work to, done, to be done. Um, I'm really keen to get this out and to hear back from the community and also the state industry groups, see how it can be refined further. Um, but um, commend, I commend you, you and your team, and especially you and Eva. And um, I, I, I hope the community will, will take the time to okay. read this. There'll be, a, and I'm also in favour of um, a simple user guide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that can be part and parcel of the, mm -hmm. the information that goes out, and also what we adopt eventually. Can I move an amendment, um, Frank? Oh, it's your right. Yep, uh, I'd like to move an amendment. Um, that Council note the report by the Principal Strategic Planner to the Planning and Environment Committee meeting dated 9th of March 2021 regarding the proposed short stay local law and defer consideration of this matter. Um, oh, sorry. This is deferring the motion. No, I don't want to defer the motion. I just want to include that council um, investigate um, employing a security firm replicating the Mornington Peninsula model. So I'd like that included. Okay, so I can give some advice there. So what we do is just take the current wording in the yeah, sorry. in the um, as Frank has moved. Yeah, and, and add a new down the bottom, Kath, a new paragraph H. Yeah. And that would read, request the CEO, CEO. to investigate incorporating, incorporating a, council a, employed, council em, sorry, just. a council employed security firm replicating the Mornington Peninsula model. Can you just say, again, Kath will get up on the screen. Oh, sorry, um, Kathy? Yeah. Um, in, 
investigating incorporating a council employed. Just sing- wait, just wait, investigate incorporating. Incorporating. A council employed security firm replicating the Mornington Peninsula model. And I think D needs to be changed as well, Kathy. Oh, okay. Do you want to do them in the same minute? Hang on, just oh, okay. go up to D, Kathy, if you don't mind. Um, no, at this stage you wouldn't need do to do that. You wouldn't need yeah. to do that because all we're doing is investigating. Just investigating, how to do it. Yeah. not actually doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Would that include? Sorry, would that amendment include taking the community's consultation on that point, or no, just, just you? No, there'd be a parallel. The way it's read at the moment is just a parallel process that we would look at um, what that would would look like as well as we go through. And that'll the come out to um, consultation. Well, I think that's different to what. No, why? Oh, that's no. the thing. I, I would like that also to be part of the community oh, okay. consultation. Well, that's, that's a different. Okay. Um, so. It's H. And H, maybe, and the, another one. So, investigate incorporating a council employed security firm, replicating the Mornington Peninsula model, and including the um, report as part of the community consultation process. Or the revised draft of the local so, laws. So, um, I, I'd like the community to also provide some feedback on on that. Whether yeah. So, why the way that paragraph A reads at the moment is we're going out to community consultation on the draft that the staff have recommended. Yep. Um, by adding H in, what I thought you were saying is, well, while that's happening, we'd also look at how that model works in Mornington Peninsula. Yep. Um, but if you're proposing that we actually amend the local law and the local law policy to include the Mornington Peninsula model, that's what we consult on. But I wouldn't want to do that on the fly because I don't know no, what that would in No, keep it separate, you're right. Yeah. So I think that okay. if we just... I'm happy with room, just an investigation that, at this yeah. stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just a question to see, though, if, and feasibility. Um, if, there's, if when we get um, this report about that model, and there's this feeling amongst the councillors that um, mm. that's we'd like to include that in the final model. Yeah. If if that is a minor change, we'd have to look at what scope that would be. We wouldn't need to re-advertise. If it's a major so change, we might need to go back. Yeah. We can yeah. consider that when Correct. we get the report. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Is, is this is this something we incorporate within E? Because E refers to looking at the uh, resource yeah. requirements for implementing. You could do it, you could do the same yeah. in E or, yeah. or separate. That's, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. No. Okay, can we have a second for that amendment, please? Well, I'll second. You I can't, no, you met oh, the second the original, oh, okay. you're second the original one, sorry, Terry. I'll look for the sake of um, discussion. Seconded on, by Joe. Oh, seconded. Okay. Amelia, you speak? Um, I just want to just add that this is probably the most important piece of local law that um, we're putting together. Um, and the enforcement provisions are probably the teeth of the local laws. So part of the investigation or the report, I'm just hoping that we have some clarification as to who the responsible authority is um, that's going to administer and enforce the local laws. And to raise some of the points that Joe mentioned, um, who's going to ensure, ensure the compliance, um, what other punishments for breaches. Um, I, I just don't think that's clearly articulated at the moment or explained. So it would be just great to refer to a model that um, it's probably a year ahead of us. Um, mm. My understanding there's 3,000 short-term accommodation places in the Mornington Peninsula, and I think they have something like 1.6 million visitors per annum. So for mm. something that is comparative to the Noosa Shire, I think it's a great model. So rather than reinventing the wheel, um, I don't think we have time to reinvent the wheel. I think we need to adopt any practices um, or any processes that work. Um, this is, as I said, a critical piece of um, law that we're passing, so I think we need to have considered um, opinions. Thank you. Uh, Tom? I'd like to uh, back Amelia on this, um, but if this is actually fulfilling and addressing um, what has already been asked for in the last round of submissions. In the last round of submissions, they wanted to know, uh, remedy the lack of local management. 
the lack of complaint resolution and process, and most importantly, the lack of regulation and enforcement. So in the last rounds, those are the three things the community asked for. <clears throat> and what we what been presented to us is vacant on that. So I'm very happy, Amelia, that, that, that you're pulling that into the discussion earlier than later, instead of waiting for, you know, it, we, this needs to be discussed, that it needs yeah. to be implemented and should be a part of going out to community consultation because they've already asked for it. Okay. Look, um, I'll, I'll support the, the amendment because it's, uh, there's no harm in, in investigating the Morning Peninsula model in, in regards to um, the use of security firm, but we'll make it clear, we heard quite clearly mm -hmm. that the use of security firm in Morning Peninsula is not to enforce. It's only to gather information. Mm -hmm. They don't go knocking on doors. They don't enter the properties. Mm -hmm. They gather information to help the council enforce. And it's very clear through this local law that the Noosa Council will be enforcing the local law. They're the, the responsible authority who will be um, issuing fines or um, removing, uh, issuing or removing approvals. Um, so to say, I just would put a counter view that this council, this local law is vacant on enforcement. It's all about enforcement and it's very clear through this local law that um, there will be fines and there will be um, removal of approvals. It's not only conditions uh, through the local law that this council is taking steps on enforcement, it's all through the planning scheme, which now also designates where short-term accommodation can occur, whereas previously it was open slather, and also through the, the Noosa planning scheme, we're able to enforce similar conditions, which are also enforceable by fines through compliance officers. So um, I, to say we're vacant on enforcement, I, I think is, I, I'd like to put a, a, a different point of view on that one. Um, but I, I support the amendment. Um, it would be very good to hear from Morning Peninsula Model, as, as Anthony said, Good. to have a Zoom meeting with the Morning Peninsula Council where we all can ask questions about what's working well, what would they do better if they had their time again. It will help us as part of the process going forward to get the best model for our residents. Can I ask a question, Anita? Yes. Um, sorry, Frank. Uh, state. Um, just before COVID, there was a state framework or a state approach to code of conduct. Where are we up to with that? Um, uh, so it has stalled. Yeah. Um, there's, well, there was a, the election, COVID, change of people in different positions. Um, it hasn't moved forward. I met with the LGAQ the other day. They're still advocating for the process to recommence. Um, uh, but at this stage, it, it's, it's stalled. So have we, as a council, do we have a place in lobbying um, local government? Uh, there was um, a group that the former mayor was a part of, which we then renominated um, Mayor Stewart to, to attend, but they haven't re-engaged that process at all. We've asked LGAQ to push that on. Yeah, so LGAQ on behalf of us and lo other local governments are but pushing that. There's no traction at all. With um, no I, I think that the, I think I've, I got something the other day that looks like end of April. Okay. Then maybe the first. Joe's been so the for the CA because yeah, my my his question was along those uh, along the same sort of lines. Thank you for bringing it up, Neil. Um, just because the state turns around and introduces a um, voluntary code of conduct, well, a voluntary code of conduct or a standard that, uh, for for all uh, SCAs to uh, adhere to, doesn't mean that our local law would be um, necessarily uh, uh, superseded or. Uh, or uh, overridden by the state law, we still have the provision of being able to uh, have our own local law that is uh, on top of uh, state laws and requirements, isn't mm -hmm. it? No, we not? Uh, it depends on how they do it, but we can't have a law which is inconsistent with the state law. No, that would be, yeah. But it, it could be a supplement to the state law. Well, you can, I can't answer that until I know what the yeah, state law looks like, but you can't have one that's inconsistent no, with the state law. Does anyone else wish to speak to yeah, the amendment? Yeah. Yeah. I'll support the amendment too. I think the more information we can get and the, and the, and the more um, data around this issue at, with you know taking into account our time constraints and, and um, time, time being of the essence is important. I'd also like to reinforce what Councillor Wookie said. Yeah, I, I would hate the community to think we're going to have security firms who are going to come in, knock on the door and everything's going to be shut down. I mean, in the case of the Mornington, as we've clearly heard, they just are data gathering 
and they play a data gathering role. So I think when we look at that, I would hate to give false hope to, to our community thinking that the employment of a security firm is going to mean more than that. It may, you know, so when we look at things, I think we just need to be realistic. Um, but I think it's it's definitely worthwhile um, looking further into it and, and talking to Mornington Peninsula who have seen the movie and are certainly 12 months in advance of us. This is a very important issue. As Amelia said, it's one of the most important local laws we'll make. Thank you very much, Anita, for all your hard work on this. There is a tremendous amount of back work on this that hasn't gone unnoticed, so we, we appreciate all your hard work. Um, so, But I'm happy to, to, to look into the security firm further. Yep. Thank you. Well, for the same reasons, I, uh, you know, I, I don't know enough about this uh, morning peninsula model at this point in time. I'm very happy for the CEO to turn around and, uh, and gather more information. And if there is a, um, a valid reason for implementing uh, that model, that we that we look at it, absolutely. Thank you. Let's, let's yeah. have a look and see what uh, they do, how they do it, what the cost implications are, and get yeah. a fuller understanding of, uh, uh, of that. And, Perhaps what alternatives there are if, uh, if that model isn't uh, isn't undertaken. But at least if we understand mm -hmm. what that model does and, uh, and and how it's implemented, um, we we may be able to uh, to learn from that experience. Certainly, if another council is uh, already undertaking, it'd be silly not to look at what they're doing and see if it uh, if it benefits. The question for me would be: um, uh, Has compliance improved in the Mornington Peninsula as a result of this? And I think that's a question that we need mm -hmm. to. Uh, need, need to need to have answers. There's no point paying for a security yeah. service doing and data gathering if it has no effect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the answer is yes, it has. Mm. Anthony, just just to reply to I think Joe, you've highlighted the the fact that it's probably not a scattergun approach we need here, and we need to really understand that what the problem is, where it is. Yeah, and I think to, the monitoring. What we're trying to do. Yeah, I think the monitoring peninsula one will will back that up. So if we've got four four thousand properties. Mm -hmm. Um, it's probably not even 10%, it's probably closer to 5% that you say, well, there's, there's the problem that we need to manage. Um, I think that's what we're saying about the security firm in, in Monaghan are not going around the Shire. They're, they're, they're actually sitting in a place on two days watching 20 properties. So I guess that as we move forward, I think it's been really smart around that because mm -hmm. that's where we can focus our limited resources on actually the biggest problem, which is only going to be that 5%. Um, it's like anything, um, so I think we need to get smarter at that, and that our process will will help that. Yeah. Millie, do you wish to close on the amendment? Oh, I do. I just want to just say there is a lot of talk about the security company just being a data collecting firm. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all the residents that have been impacted by short term accommodation. Um, at the moment, that's better than nothing. So um, that's all I just want to add. And I agree with you also, Anthony, that we're not addressing all short-term accommodation providers. The majority are responsible. Um, it's targeting, we're, we're, we're talking about a minority, as we often are in, when things are problematic. Put the amendment. Those in favour? That's unanimous. We go back to the original motion. Uh, I'm the only one who's spoken so far on the original motion, which now includes the amendment. Tom. Um, Okay, from what I can tell, you know, I want to do that role play because it's clear to me more now that for the resident that's out there that has had their right to quiet enjoyment so impacted over the years by Airbnb that these proposed local laws really have very little change to them. They call up, they make a complaint. They call up, they make a complaint. Monday, they write their complaint, they send it off into the council vacuum, and they wait. And I, I just don't think that this is responsive to the desires of these people that are impacted. Could you address your oh. comments from me, please, rather than... Not to the start. No, oh, yeah, 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 right, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, not... Those people that have impacted, they want answers. They want just a feeling of that they've been heard. I don't think this actually, they're not, I don't think they're being heard in these. Um, it's being holistic. I would say a minimum requirement is that the enforcement officers in the rules keep the people that complain in the loop because they're being impacted. And the difference is if you have a neighbor who has, who's having parties, 
Well, there's natural justice. You can call the police, and the police will come up. You can do a complete police. Well, they're there. They're, you know, with an Airbnb, it's a very different situation. You call up the police. If they do come, they make a report and so forth. They're gone. The next week, you're faced. You have no satisfaction. You don't have a sense of justice. And I'm very concerned that the residents with these, this, these the way that they're drafted, will enjoy no satisfaction. We'll actually have very, very little hope that there will be any change in the in the um, the actions of the Airbnb that have tormented them for so long, and the problem may just be getting worse. <sighs> so I would really, I, I will not support this because I think that it needs to give something to the residents that have been affected, give them some sort of surety for the future, because. They have, they've taken it for a long time, and they're gonna look at this and they, the local author is going out saying, as, as when it went into was the, um, the resident complaining, there's very little for them. And I don't think that they will be satisfied this. And because they've already asked in the last round, and that this will kick, it, kick this down months down the track as well. So that's it. Thank you, John. John. Um. I've got to disagree with some of what you said there, Tom. I'm sorry, but um, at the moment there is no recourse for anybody that is aggrieved in that situation other than to call the police at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, the police are busy and and quite often don't have the capacity to attend. Here, it puts the onus back on the party that is renting out the property to take responsibility for the people that they put in their property to ensure that they are meeting uh, uh, you know, a, a, a code of conduct and a standard, uh, and if they're not, that somebody's onto them and, and, and attending them. Hopefully, that uh, property owner or property manager looks at problem uh, renters and all the rest of it and, and acknowledges the fact that, well, we're, you know, these keep, people keep coming back time and time again and creating work for us by making noise and all the rest of it, they won't, they won't read out to them again. So I do, do believe that this has got uh, the element of, uh, of, of attending to a situation when a situation arises that currently doesn't exist because the police are over, uh, over resourced. So um, does it mean that someone's going to go bashing on the door at two o'clock in the morning and tell them to keep it down? No, it might be a phone call from this, but at least it's acknowledged, at least there's, a, there's a, uh, a recourse for complaints to go through, or a passage for complaints to go through, will be dealt with and attended to. Will they um, uh, resolve all the issues? No, but at least, uh, uh, probably not. not. Not to the extent that you, you, you think that we need to, uh, you, you believe that we need to do this, or maybe some of the residents need, that need to do, deal with this, but it will give a process for a complaint to be heard, and a cl complaint to be attended to, and a responsibility on the owner of the property to deal with that complaint when a complaint is received, which currently doesn't exist. And that, this, this is what I think this is, is trying to do. Uh, I'm pleased to see that, uh, that uh, the changes uh, the changes have occurred in relation to the lessons that we've learned going out to community the first time, and that we're going out to community the second time, to say, to say uh, do you believe these are, have uh, addressed all the, uh, the issues that you've raised in a satisfactory manner? Uh, so I, I support where we're at and I look forward to again hearing back from our community in relation to uh, to how we've addressed their concerns and whether or not they think this goes far enough uh, to, to address those, uh, those issues. Um, it must be remembered that resident amenity isn't only impacted by short stay accommodation. Um, you can live next to the neighbour from hell and live this nightmare day in day out with no recourse uh, you can get the neighbour that starts his um, whippersnipper or lawnmower at six o'clock in the morning every Saturday morning, mm -hmm. and and have no recourse. So there, you know, resident amenity is impacted on, on on levels, all sorts of levels at all sorts of times. This at least gives us an opportunity to deal with um, the problem of shorts. You know, the, the problems that some short stay accommodations and not all uh, can create in. Uh, in residential amenity in, in residential areas. So I, uh, I 
uh, congratulate the staff on their uh, on their attempts to deal with this and uh, and the, the where we've got to with this. I think this is what the community has been longing to to, to see implemented. And I look forward to hearing back from as I said, look, hearing back from the community and seeing um, that they think that this will uh, uh, deal sufficiently with the uh, the issues before us. And when it's implemented, to seeing that uh, it, it does in fact uh, reduce the number of uh, of incidents of, of complaint, as we uh, are hearing the morning of Peninsula, who have uh, been dealing with the situation for some time longer than us, have found uh, does reduce the uh, uh, the uh, the incidents that they're having. So. Thank you, Jo. Um, any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Yeah, I'll, yeah uh, again, this is a very important piece of work, uh, so thank you again. Uh, we've all received emails, talk to people in the streets, talk to residents. We, we understand the impact of, of STAs on many of our residents. I think, Tom, your, your word torment was a good one because a lot of them do feel like that and that's how you feel after reading many of the emails and you felt helpless for so long. Uh, and we keep saying the local laws are coming, the local laws are coming. So this is the chance now to really walk the walk and to put the local laws out there. Um, I think by putting it out to the community consultation again is critical. It was interesting to note, and it's not unsurprising, that the biggest uh, fall or the biggest, I guess, um, hole in the whole thing is that non-response time from the contact person. So that's an area that I'd be interested to hear what the stakeholders have to say, what our community, some of the ideas that may come out of that of how to address that person um, responding quickly or on time and also, um, you know, really the enforcement and looking at those various aspects. Uh, so I'm happy to support this. I think the sooner we get this up and running, we give some certainty to our community and we provide them with a bit of hope because this is an issue that is affecting many of our residents and none of us take that lightly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor um, I, I just want to add that, you know, I go back to the point, um, just a security guard for data collection. Tom, this is a first step. It's not right, it's just a draft. We're going back to community and what encourages and excites me is we're not just going back to real estate agents and industry experts, we're actually going to impacted residents um, and they need to have a seat at the table and they need to be part of this local laws. Um, I think that the enforcement provisions are not clearly articulated or understood yet, but that's again um, a work in progress. So I'm excited that we're actually taking the first step. We don't have the time to wait. Um, the matter is urgent. Um, so thank you for all the hard work and it's a good first good first step. Yes, because time is of the essence, I'll waive my right to speak on this and I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? Perhaps Councillor Lawrenson, Stewart, Jerusalem and Wilkie against. Councillor Wegener, that's carried. Um, Councillor Stockwell can now come back in the room. Thank you, Anita, thank you. Thank very you. much. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Thanks, thank you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Item six now is the draft climate change response plan from the Planning and Environment Committee agenda. Item eight, page 127, that third here for the significance of the issue. Thank you. Hello, Rebecca Britton and Annie Nolan. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Or oh, afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, they just keep rolling. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I love it, man. Maybe it is. What, in, a surface paradox? <laughs> 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 Councillors, questions for Annie and Rebecca? New moment, you guys. But for the benefit of those listening, look, we, we've had the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Plan um, you know, at public consultation that's closed. Yes. Could you tell us uh, just a bit about the key points of difference between the draft climate change response plan? It's broader in its scope, of course, and how the chat speaks with, speaks to that uh, is is related to that. But talk okay. about the, the climate change response plan. What it seeks to do. Uh, Yes, the Climate Change Response Plan is more broader in its scope. It deals with a range of climate-related issues, um, climate risks as fire. well. Yep. Um, fire, uh, temperature change, rainfall change, extreme weather, flooding uh, um, and, and other issues, as well as emissions reduction. Um, you could see it as sort of the broad overarching response to climate change and then the CHAP 
the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Plan is a specific aspect of that relating to inundation from sea level rise and coastal erosion. So that's the distinction there. Yep. I've got a question. Annie, Annie, we talked about, and you know, it's a well-known fact, that 63% of our carbon emissions come from landfill. Um, that, to me, is our biggest concern um, from a, an environmental point of view. Can you, uh, and Helpful. you said this in a meeting, but it wasn't, not everyone was present the other day, nor were we on um, camera. What are we because this report is actually in organisational emissions. It's a much smaller part of the community emissions because this report is actually looking at both council emissions yeah. and community emissions. So um, there are a number of things that we're actually doing uh, in terms of trying to reduce those emissions from the landfill. Mm -hmm. um, one, the first one that's actually happening right now is that another 10 extra um, vertical wells are actually being uh, put into the landfill to extract more of the, of the gas. Um, there's also investigations looking at the uh, improving the capping. So what the capping does is basically strangely enough, cap the, the, uh, the gas underneath the landfill, mm -hmm. so then it makes the gas extraction more efficient. And um, we're also working with our contractors to see what the other opportunities are, whether, whether we, the landfill gas is going to be enough to potentially extract electric, um, enough gas to generate electricity as well. And uh, then we've also got an overarching waste strategy that is, is currently in, being developed at the moment, which is going to look at uh, broader issues than just landfill gas. Thanks. That's going to have another impact. Okay. Um, yeah. Look, uh, great report. And I think um, the, the the eight themes are um, uh, drive drive the point home to, to the point. The what I'm seeing, uh, particularly in theme eight, uh, zero waste to circular economy is minimise organic uh, matter going to landfill from community waste and implement recommendations from the new waste plan to minimise organic matter going to landfill. What I didn't see, and uh, I'm wondering if there's a an opportunity to add or a need to add in theme six under sustainable agriculture and food systems is where that waste can go to, where that organic waste can go to and how it can benefit agriculture and food systems. Is is that something we can um, complement or um, highlight within that uh, sustainable agriculture and food systems area? That, that That's the opportunity to see that I'm going to go back in there. And in fact, the, uh, the potential to enhance what are you know typically Australian soils are quite poor in quality um, to, to enhance the soils for, for better food production. Yep. We certain we didn't want to preempt the outcomes of what the study is actually doing to inform the waste strategy. So that is actually looking at a number of options for that organic matter once it's actually taken. Okay, so that'll come out of the waste strategy yep. in essence yep. rather than needing to be Correct, articulated yes. here. Yep. So, um, so the fact that it's, it, we, we state that we're going to reduce it to, to landfill is enough to turn around and then the waste strategy will... That's will right, and options. yeah. And then and once that's we, one of the options. Yeah, so one of the options is we actually take it away from landfill and then what's where, next? Where, where are we going to yeah. go? So is it a waste to energy? Is it composting? Okay. Is it that's um, right. anaerobic just, I just thought it could have been more clearly articulated there, but we don't believe there's a need to, but the waste strategy will do that for us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Annie, stormwater and treated sewage drainage pipes are a major source of beach erosion. Um, how does the Climate Change Response Plan commit to undertaking works to minimise erosion from Chats. these sources? Content. And there, there isn't any content specific to that. Okay. Um, I, I think um, we can always do better in our operations in the way that we manage um, those sorts of issues. Um, it's certainly not something that's come up a, as a priority specific to climate change. And on page 130 under assets, um, the initiatives outlined in this plan will help increase the resilience of council and community assets. Part of community assets, do we include public land that's under council control? Yes. yes. We do. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Tom, sorry, one just quick little note before we get to that, the meat of that bit. Um, on the very last page, on page 48 of the uh, the Climate Change Response Plan, just one little uh, question. It says, periodic court council reporting against the targets and matrix in this plan will occur every second year to allow council and the community to re review the actions and progress made. Um, could we move that up to every annually? Because if two years for the Climate Change Response Plan might 
might be a bit long, do you think? Or like, I, I would suggest it being every year we look at that. Or do we do it every year informally anyway? I think we would do it every year informally. Uh, I, I think in the initial years um, we, we might find there's sort of small things that we can um, identify as having been achieved, but as, as we go forward into the program there might be less to report on as some of our longer term initiatives take time to, to build. Uh, I think there's no issues with us being able to report every year. I, I think I recall that the environment strategy has a, has a reporting period of every two years, so it was matching it to that. Uh, perhaps um, one year is more of an internal and then the second year is, is more a, um, a community-based reporting. And, um, and I think the working group, the community reference forum, should play an active role in, in that, given that they will have some of that on-ground knowledge to be able to feed into the reporting process. Um, it's, it's such a big deal, um, uh, this, because you're looking at really changing uh, people, what they do on a daily basis. You're uh, changing, hopefully, our own identity, especially as, as a feeling of going from being helpless to being in control. Um, this, is, this is good commentary for the debate. Tom, are you wanting to ask a question there? A specific question? Yes. You want to pick? The specific question is, um, can you address that further, uh, the, the, the deal working with community groups and, and the solidifying to, to put more meat on the bones? Of, of, of that aspect of the plan, of the rollout of the plan. Um, do you want to talk about some of the so yeah. question about education, Tom? Yes. How, how are you going to educate the community about this plan? Um, already we've got a fantastic relationship with Zen Zero Emissions Noosa Inc. Um, and they are the preeminent group that's dealing with reducing emissions um, right throughout the community. So I would see that as a fantastic model that we continue to work very closely with them um, and also the other groups that are, have got a very distinct climate change action as well, such as, as Landcare, for example, NICA, all of these various groups. Um, they may not specifically be doing, you know, have it in their title or whatever, but because they are doing so much on the biodiversity, on river protection, all of those sorts of things, they are very much enmeshed with the, the climate change action. So um, the work that we would be doing right throughout as we climate uh, response plan would be to engage with as many communities as we currently are and, and going forward even more on that. Someone care to move the motion? Move the motion. Councillor oh, Lawrence, I'm speech at you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Councillor Stockwell, I'll second. second it. Yeah. Councillor Lawrence, thank you. Okay, so I think it's really important to start to say that the, the eight themes could be the outline for the local economic strategy. There is a lot that we're doing and should be doing to achieve resilient and sustainable economies that also contribute to climate change. It's taken us many years to get to this point. So it's really interesting. There'll still be people in this community who say, why is council, uh, I believe there's a climate emergency, why are we doing anything about climate change? So some resource. Now, this is, I think, the first publication called The Greenhouse Effect, Implications for Queensland. And you'll get to understand why this is an issue being around when I tell you the, the forward was by Premier Micah Hearn, a National Party member from the Sunshine Coast. Um, and he believes that our energy export industries are too valuable to the state's economy to risk their future by ignoring the clear signs that the international community has taken the greenhouse question seriously and moving towards conditions of energy conservation and gas emission limitation. To delay examination of strategies for Queens under such cases under the technical arguments are fully resolved could unnecessarily increase the state's economic vulnerability to decisions taken elsewhere. So delay waiting for technical arguments unnecessarily increase the state's economic viability. Can I tell you, in the last 10 years, Queensland paid more than double any other state or territory in recovering and responding and experiencing extreme weather and disaster losses. So we have had that delay, globally, nationally, state, and to extent this council has delayed action until 
the eleventh hour. And so that's why this is so important. <coughs> because if we look at it from an economic perspective, current settings, between 2010 and 2019, we spent $18 billion, more than half the national average on extreme weather. But if we look at the cost of it going forward, by 2038, just the extreme weather events driven by climate change uh, and as well as impact of sea level rise could cost the Australian economy $100 billion every year. So from a purely economic argument, we don't just have to, and it's essential that we do, adapt to the changing conditions. We have to contribute as much as possible to mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. To put that in context, last year it's estimated that COVID cost $160 billion. So $100 billion a year from 2038. So it's really interesting to see the, the parallels um, that, you know, in most areas, adoption of policies by government and statute can and should wait for development of policy options. Oh, no, this is this one. The major requirements are for adoption planning guidelines in the area to set floor levels to look at sea level rise. So clearly, back in 1989, there was clear indication of some of the responses we've got in there. And I thought was really interested in terms of the Queensland government approach in 1989 when it said, this report expresses the view that there is now sufficient scientific consensus as to the onset of the greenhouse gas, greenhouse effect for it to be considered as an important policy issue for governments. Consensus in 1989. Some of the things that were suggested by the progress of implementing the National Greenhouse Response Strategy and issues considered in 1996 in, by the Intergovernmental Committee on Ecological Sustainable Development in December 95. One thing that NUS has done very well, a whole lot on vegetation clearance. Some of the biggest contributions to greenhouse gas emissions in the, in the 80s and 90s was actually the broad scale clearing. So things like vegetation clearance control, revegetation, land management, forest management, we've done a lot of that and we've done it well. And hopefully as a response plan, we may be able to actually account for the drawdown, the carbon that it's capturing, the emissions that it's capturing by all that good work we've done since 1989. It also talks about um, all governments to achieve greenhouse reduction through a range of individual government initiatives, fi fin uh, financing energy audits and efficiency programs, um, environmental purchasing policies for equipment and consumables. So these are things that we are now putting into policy. Um, and I suppose the other one for Noosa Council, which is in the, is one of our key themes, is that government planning agents will continue to integrate land use and transport planning with an emphasis on urban development that minimises the need for fossil fuel-based transport. So we've known for over 20 years what needed to be done. And what this report does is saying, OK, for this community, we've got a series of eight very practical themes that could be put up as an economic strategy that will address these. I think it's really essential that we don't shy away from the fact that there was a reason we set zero emissions by 2026. Because the scientific consensus now is that if we don't want to experience uh, the more significant and severe impacts of a changing climate, we need as a community to get to that across the country and across the world by 2030. Not just one council's operations. So this response plan is about how we, I knew where you're going, uh, how council's we- Council's happy, <laughs> council's happy <laughs> to stop past five minutes. This response plan is really important. It's about we do the first thing. It's about we as council in Noosa show strong leadership and establish the governance to lead the way. And we probably have to catch up with some councils, but in other places we'll be leading in our response to climate change and bring and work with our community in delivering it. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And any other councillors wish to speak? Tom. Well, I'll just follow up on Brian's lead there with being a leader. Um, one of the, the businesses that has come to Noosa is Earth Tech, and they did you know phenomenal stuff with the uh, the Make Peace Island, and they brought um, they had they put out seventy there were seventy two applications 
for people with um, ideas for products that will benefit the world. Um, Earth Tech funded the top, top 12 to come to uh, Noosa. They did this during the election. They, um, they, they presented on Make Peace Island. Investors came in. I've told, told you the story that the, the took took the, in, in Bangladesh won. Noosa has the opportunity to be the epicenter for um, financing, thinking, putting great ideas together with financing, just as EarthTech is trying to do in Newset. And then when you ask Brian Keyes, you know, why do you have to be in Newset? And they say, well, you, could, you couldn't be anyplace else. This is the biosphere. This is where the thinking is happening. This is where the money is at. This is a place that leads by example. And he said, no, you couldn't do this anyplace else. So I think that we have an asset here that is phenomenal. And I've, I've said often that this is the biggest asset Noosa has is our history, our collective knowledge, and our, our ability to, to think forward to, uh, to, for vision. And I think that um, this plan is, is absolutely great because it, it contemplates that. And as I was asking about the community groups, it is so important to bring in the community groups because the community groups are the collective vision between us. They're, they're, they, um, they're, they're, they are who we are. They, 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 run, they, uh, they kind of give the impetus behind elections. They, 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 you know, they choose who, who, the, uh, who the people around this table will be largely because they are the, the voice of the people. They are the action for the people to work in with the community groups with the climate, with the plan here is enormously important. And in the, the big picture, the, what I'd like to do ultimately is higher the level of um, integrity or of uh, individuality of, of, the, of the kids in the community and for them to believe that I come from the greatest place on earth. I come from this place that is leading the world and that is the, the greatest gift I think we can pass on to the next generation, which is good economically for Nisa, but it's also very, very good as a community to go forward. And I feel as though the, um, the climate change response plan actually has all of that with inside of it, inside of it, including the uh, the business side of let let's leverage off of this unique situation in this set and go forward. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> it's gonna be a while, is um, <laughs> this one switch to speak. Off you go. You sound like you're in, in perfect mode to continue on. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, all right. Yeah, Joe. Oh, Frank. Yeah, look, you know. I've been in, in here for uh, seven years now, and I've been banging on about um, talking the talk and walking the walk. I mean, we've often talked the talk uh, in uh, in Noosa, but here we are finally starting to uh, realise the walk that is required to deliver on uh, the ethos that is what we talk about here all the time, being green, sustainable. And uh, as far as leading goes, Tom, we're a long way behind. I'm sorry, you know, uh, some of the waste stuff that we're talking about now has been going on for 20 years down south. So, you know, we, there's a long, long way to go. We, uh, but I'm pleased to see things like zero waste and circular economy. I've been banging on about circular economy for till I, till the, um, you know, till I go horse. But uh, finally, you keep on going around circles on that one. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do feel like I'm going around circles. I keep, keep banging on about it. But it's finally good to see it here in, in council policy and, uh, you know, and, and really starting to get implemented. There's no point creating plastic for the sake of creating plastic if we don't, you know, recycle it and we recycle it. We don't use it. We don't actually take a fact. You know? Again, you know, food waste and all the rest of that, that sort of stuff. I mean, I'd rather stop at the source, but if we're going to create it. Let's use it. It's a valuable resource. I mean, these these things are, are no brainers. I mean, people have been composting for years and putting it in their gardens. Why the hell do we throw it in the landfill and turn around and create methane gas? You know, these these are these are no brainers. Energy efficiency and renewable energy. I mean, when I walked into this place, we had uh, an electricity bill of over two million dollars. It's now less than that. It's far less than that. We've reduced it by thirty percent, Annie. Thirty percent. You know, thirty percent down on uh, on on our on our energy consumption. So, so that's, that's, that's bringing things like that. It just shows that, you know, some of these things are not difficult to implement, and yet they have, val you know, far-reaching far -reaching implications on uh, not only the, the cost of rate payers, but the efficiency of the organisation you run. Fleeing low emission industry, sustainable transport. I mean, they're, they're no brainers. You know, we, we've got to drive a new economy. I mean, these are the things that will drive the economy of the future. And to uh, to actually, you know, have them have them here and, uh, and implemented, or we... Uh, 
significant achievement for, uh, for not only this council but this community. The document details a five-year plan that sets out the context, desired outcomes and actions for addressing climate change in Eastern Shire in partnership with the community. I think they're really important words, in partnership with the community. This document alludes to the chat, and I think, you know, I, I, it's just gone out for a public consultation, but I think there's a lot that we can learn from the way that this document talks to ensure that those, uh, those elements of how we, uh, how we apply coastal hazards ad adaptation and, and all of these, these functions in conjunction with our community, how we work, we work in partnership. We don't, we don't, uh, we listen to, uh, to what they're doing and, and what they, they believe that they can achieve, but we take them on that journey. And we try to achieve uh, these these great outcomes for the future. I mean, this is the future of our uh, of not only our shire, but our, you know the the, what, the legacy that we we'll leave for our children and our grandchildren for de generations to come. Use scientific evidence based approach to managing the environment, climate change, and adapt. Not just you know, make up as we go along, but actually use use evidence to to, to, to drive us and, and, and form our uh, our um, decision making for the future. Adaptive management approaches, uh, you know. Actively communicate and partner with the broader community. They're all essential elements to make this, this occur. We can't do it on our own. We need to uh, need to have our community on board. We know we're going to be leading to uh, more frequent nuisance flooding of low-lying uh, foreshore areas, and this is particularly susceptible to that. I mean, unless we, we make these changes, we won't be we'll be part of the problem, not part of the solution. So I, uh, I applaud uh, where council is with, uh, with this, this plan. I, I like the idea that we're talking in five-year five chunks, a five-year you know, manageable, manageable steps. Uh, I don't think any of these are, uh, uh, are out of the realms of possibility and achievement. And uh, I look forward to seeing more uh, changes in the way we do things in the operation of this organisation that takes all this into account and see the difference for the future generations to come. Thank you, Joe. Um, any other councillors speak? speak? Yeah. And Annie and Rebecca, thank you. It's an enormous amount of work that's gone into that. You're really thank driving you. this process. You live and breathe this. So thank you for all the detail you yeah, put into it. Welcome. Looking forward to seeing what the community comes back with and whether we're going fast uh, or for far enough yeah. in yeah. moving towards this. Like the rest of the world, moving to cleaner tech, uh, cleaner, more cost effective technologies and practices around the world. Are we going far enough? I'll be interested to hear back from the community. Mm -hmm. but thank you for articulating what we need to do and setting hard um, KPIs that we need to meet up to. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I'm, of course, I support the, the motion. Um, Brian, you wish to close? Yeah, I will. I think uh, the where you ended up is really important is not only is the plan written so it's practical, it's easy to read. The, I really like the conceptual diagrams um, that look at the, you know, the climate impacts and risks across a range of sectors. It really distills it. You know, we talked about education. they will be educational resources, nothing else. It's just really quickly, these are what we need to plan for. And you know, in that regard, it's, a, to me, a very accessible um, document. But as you say, that where this probably differs from most of the other stuff, that we do in terms of climate change or have done, say, the Noosa Climate Action Plan which was done by the NBF, uh, NBL, Noosa Biosphere Limited, back in 2009-2010. It had a, a similar responses in a lot of regards, but it didn't set the key performance indicators. It didn't set the metrics, and that's where it will make the difference. It will make it that it's monitored, evaluated, and if it needs to be reviewed and improved, we'll do that. So to me, that is... You know, a, a very good approach, and I, once again, I uh, hope we uh, get a fulsome debate and lots of good input from the community uh, to, no doubt, uh, what will be an improved final version. Thank you, Councillor Stockwell. All in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Annie. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> oh, round of applause from <laughs> Councillor Tom <Wagner. laughs> uh, Next item, direct to General Committee, is the Noosa Aquatic Centre Lease Tender Assessment, page five of the General Committee agenda. Welcome, Ash and Kerry. Thank you. Questions, Councillors? Yeah, I do. Is this the same? Ash, is, we just, I couldn't work it out. Is this the, the, the people who are the pre existing lease? Uh, so it's not the same contract holder, 
but David Evans, who's trading his poolside Mac, was the former manager um, of the cafe under the previous contract holders. Mm -hmm. They decided not to extend their option that was available to them last year during the COVID shutdown. Um, so David Evans um, showed an interest in sticking around and keeping things ticking along. So we entered into a management rights agreement just whilst we tried to get back up and running and then went to market. And he has um, obviously decided to respond to the tender. So okay. um, yeah, there will be a level of continuity from yeah. what we've got now moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll move the motion. Mayor, Mayor Stewart's moved the motion. Seconder, please. Ca Councillor Lawrence. Yeah. Councillor Lawrence. Uh, yeah. No, thanks, Ash, for your hard work on this. Um, I won't hold up. We're, we've got a lot to go still to cover. I'm really happy to hear that it's going to have some con continuity because yeah. they're a great um, service provider at the moment. So you're happy to support. Thank you for your hard work on this. Great, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on the motion? Uh, Joe? Yeah, I've got a question for um, Ash. Um, I note that in the uh, assessment, um, whilst there's only one tender here, uh, a, le a relatively low environmental score uh, for environmental sustainability. Um, was a plastic free approach a criteria for tender? And if not, why not? What provisions to operate or transition to a plastic free or operation are in the lease condition? Uh, so the score is maybe relatively low compared to the other scores, but 60 is still considered to be a good response um, in the scoring um, methodology. It was plastic free. It wasn't stipulated that they must, but um, off the top of my head, uh, the operator has made a commitment to do that. They've got biopack products there for takeaway. They obviously encourage um, people to use uh, cutlery, crockery, cups, etc., on site as opposed to defaulting to takeaway. Um, so we were quite pleased with their approach there um, in terms of why the score wasn't higher than good. Um, I don't think there was anything there that struck us as being particularly abnormal compared to what you expect with a uh, <coughs> excuse me, contemporary cafe operator these days. But I think a lot of cafes around town now are showing that they can operate in a fairly environmentally sustainable way. Given, given the previous report and where we're heading to with zero waste and all the rest of it, is this possibly a stipulation that we can put in the future lease arrangements for any of the food outlets that, uh, that uh, our community's team look after to uh, um, re help reduce the, uh, the, the amount of plastic and, uh, and waste overall? Uh, look, I think if you become too prescriptive, um, then you might find that the number of responses you get or the price um, at which you get responses is impacted, but it's probably something we'd need to discuss with the procurement team regarding um, how much do we want to stipulate up front that's required by operators? Right. I think there's going to have to be a question on notice. Um, but I know definitely it was discussed and in my recollection it gets the feeling that we actually adopted as a policy at the time uh, that the second the second time we considered the supporting the policy on plastic for a noose that we actually made a commitment for council owned facilities. That's what I thought. Um, I think it's a policy position of this council. So if we can take that on notice to review whether there is actually a policy uh, that for council owned facilities we adopt a plastic free. We may not have got in there, but that's my recollection. Right. I can't recall that, but we can check it before Thursday night. Mm. Um, I have a question yes. in. So I've got a question in relation to the rent. Um, it's 45,000 per annum, increasing to 50,000 per annum ex-GST in two years. Um, how is that rate set, Ash? Uh, so the respondents needed to put forward what they were willing to offer to us as an organisation. So uh, that, I guess, was a large part of the tender process, is to put it to market mm -hmm. and to let people come back and respond to us with um, the figure that they think they can sustain. And do we have a responsibility back to the potential tenant to tell them whether or not um, that's achievable or over, given that we've got you know, our hands on previous um, numbers? Yeah, so there's a level of information provided in the tender pack that they view before responding with Fantastic. regarding um, annual attendance at the centre and some historical figures. Um, and then it was up to them to work out whether they felt they could operate sustainably with the figure that they put forward. Because it's in our interest um, that they succeed. Yes, obviously. Absolutely. Can we ask what the previous tender holder 
Uh, yeah, so going back a couple of years ago, uh, it was about $60,000 a year for the previous contracts. That has dropped down a little bit. I guess that's the market telling us at the moment with a degree of uncertainty and um, uh, obviously we only had the one compliant response as well. Um, so we don't think it's unreasonable. And I think to Amelia's point, we would rather have a really good operator in Absolutely. there that can operate sustainably mm. rather than having somebody that's pushed it to the very limit mm. and then trying to cut corners along the way mm. to yep. save money to keep the floats. Yep. Service to the community. At the Absolutely. Yes. Can I ask what the issues with the non-conforming tender were? Uh, there was a range of non-conformances. Significantly non-conformant. Sorry, Kerry, can I carry you there? Sorry, it's, it was it was not marginally, it was significantly okay. non-conformant. Okay. Yeah. Any other councillors to speak to the motion? Close, Kerry. No, just um, this is an important part of the NAC. You know, it, it's it's what a lot of our residents use, so it's in our interest that this is a, a very good operation. So I'm really pleased to he's here, as I said earlier. That we're going, I think it's been run so well and they've got a great range that it will continue on that way. And uh, thank you very much again, Ash. Those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, Ash. Thank you, Ash. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Kerry. Next item is item eight, report director general of the North Shore Beach Campground Management Service Tender, page nine of the general committee agenda. Welcome, Robin. Welcome, Glint. Good Hi. afternoon. Yeah, yeah, question from Joe. Um, given that there are only two tenders, uh, what were the experiences of each of the tenderers presented uh, with regard to previous experiences in managing such a complex? Uh, both companies have multiple holiday parks that they manage within Queensland. They do. So we relied on information within their submissions detailing the roles, responsibilities, operational activities that they undertake at those parks, and also called uh, referees that they provided to validate the level of experience and track record. Sure. Well, it was a pretty tight race, wasn't it? Yes. Um, and I, I don't want to uh, micromanage, but just to ask the question, um, one of them was health and safety, and the one that didn't, um, I can't read it, everybody. I'm sorry. I didn't have my glasses. Uh, yeah. Health and safety down. The, the, it's um, one eight. The Proprietary Limited was fifty five, and Belgravia was sixty one. Mm -hmm. So there was a that that, that seems like a, a big issue with with this. The health and safety uh, criteria relates to an ISO level of um, capability. I think it's. I can't remember the reference to it, but it's an ISO, which is basically an Australian level accreditation. So really the percentage criteria for health and safety relies on whether they have it or they don't. It's very specific that they're asked to select if they have it or don't. Belgravia is um, provided information that they're on a pathway to achieve that, which is why they scored a little higher in that respect. Other aspects around health and safety relate to um, duty of care, liability, safety on the ground, and they were quite comparable in that respect. Okay. I'm seeing something in the uh, in the tenders that I don't think I've ever seen before, and that's both tenders, the price came out of exactly the same value. Mm -hmm. Correct. How is that possible? <laughs> Through the chair, it's coincident. Oh, it wasn't a fixed price? No, we asked for a percentage of earned revenue. And both came up with the same form, yep. or some yep. sort of an industry-based form. No, I, I think it's pure coincidence. Okay, I just presume we put out the promise. No, well, that's, that's, that's what I. That's why I should go with the answer I was expecting. But then, yeah. so I like check. Similarly, the others like the the key differentiation. So the yeah. We've highlighted that the unsuccessful had that pathway to um, ISO accreditation, so they scored five points higher in, or they scored six points higher in safety and quality. But probably the same thing, was that a quality system that they were getting scored for? Uh, which evaluation criteria was that? Was that health and safety? No, yeah, but also they scored higher on um, quality, so I'm presuming that's a quality right. systems. Yes. Yeah. So then you get down to the key difference for the one you've recommended is uh, a significantly higher contribution to the local economy. Is that 
about using local contractors? Or what's what's that sort of criteria? About? Uh, it's twofold, really. It's the labour and the human capital resources, and then it's also their supply contracts. Um, so one eight. Um, currently operates within the region and also committed to hiring additionals within the region for the contract um, and also provided information about the percentage of their procurement and supply that they obtain from within the Noosa region. So you're saying that um, one of them actually has um, parts within the, the local area? Uh, one eight currently manages Boring Point Campground. Oh, okay, so that's the Boring Point operator. Okay, so that's... Okay, so that's uh, that was what I was going to ask is uh, what, what sort of uh, contribution local economy, what sort of local content did they have in there? So one's operating, operating a yes, local Yes, and also committed to additional hires um, and identified that I think only 15% of their consumables and their supplies are obtained from outside of the region. So they actively work to keep business and economic activation local. Could be. Sorry, well, one can I explain that. Um, what does the, the criteria and methodology mean again? Our methodology is around their approach to bookings, guest management, um, operations on the ground. We added in COVID safety aspect, communications, things like capturing calls and emails and booking patterns. Did you say it was their systems? Or? Yeah, it's very yeah. system based yeah. around methodology. And what was the, the reference to quality? What's that criteria? Involved? Quality is around an ISO accreditation. Yeah. Um, and also looking at their quality systems and system. um, liability. So it's um, not necessarily uh, customer service? No, that's yeah. more captured within the methodology. Within the methodology, okay, thank you. So the other, the other point I'd add to this as well, it's extremely unusual for both coming in at the same, at the same price. Mm. So what, what this has done here is we've had to split hairs on the qualitative aspects because mm. you don't have the price element as well. Yeah to help mm. Mm. Uh, split. So we're talking about two very good operators here mm. who have a lot of experience and who would no doubt, in my mind, are capable of running the park. So without the price element there, it's come. It's very close. Mm. So normally that would help mm. to, to separate. We don't have the luxury of, of the price element in this uh, evaluation. It's interesting you say that, Clint, because that, that concerns me, seeing quality and health and safety uh, scores are relatively low for you know, entities that are good operators in an industry that... Uh, oh, well, that, that it really comes so. back to the procurement approach where they that evaluation criteria is, is really loaded to whether they answer yes or no to having the ISO accreditation. And the other, the other thing I'd say to that too, and through the chair, is that, uh, you know, it, it comes down to weightings too, doesn't it? I mean, the issues that we're talking about here the important, the real important issues are around, I mean, they're all important, but in terms of the weighting, your methodology, your contract experience and capacity, and also your capability, they are quite essential aspects to, to running an operation of that, of that size. And if you don't have that in place, and you can't, you can't document that those systems are in place, and you can't back that up with you know, your track record and your, your evidence, then uh, you're not gonna score as well. But, but for an entity just dealing with, with the public on a daily basis and vehicles coming and going and all the rest of it, health and safety for me would be, would be paramount. So the, the submissions provided information around vehicle movements, um, maintaining safety of guests and staff and contractors. The lower level of overall scoring follows the procurement guidelines where anything higher would really need to be given only if they had the ISO accreditation. Okay. So it all generally bumps down mm -hmm. so a they, level. They make so the highest standards, they just haven't got the accreditation. That's right, so the lower level. scores aren't so reflected. It seems, seems a very priority. low score to be at just over 50% for, for, for that area, yes. if, that's, if that's the only, the only criteria that's missing. Yeah. It's not indicative that they have a low um, level approach or um, place a low level of importance on health and safety. It's just reflecting that the scores can't be higher because of the ISO. So we, we would, uh, can I clarify that our criteria in this regard would have to be robust enough if we were issuing a $2 million works contract where you would want mm. ISO accreditation compared to a lower risk activity like this where it probably isn't something that a lot of caravan park owners do is go to that level of accreditation. That's, 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 that's right. where I wouldn't expect yeah. that that takes out 2% of the 5% criteria 
I, you know, I expect that to be a much smaller component of the overall criteria. But anyway. Council, we have a I, I motion I, before us. Sorry, can I ask a couple of questions? We can I ask during. Oh, okay. We can ask during. During. No worries. Um, someone care to move the motion, please? Oh, move that. Move, Joe. Seconded, Tom. Um, Joe, do you wish to speak? Uh, I think it's an important asset. It's. Uh, uh, good to see it being managed, you know, that needs to be managed and managed well. It's in a, uh, you know, just had a lot of money spent on it and uh, uh, with upgrades and the like. So to see this uh, facility uh, moving forward with uh, new uh, owners, hopefully excited to, uh, to take on the role of uh, this wilderness area is, uh, is good for the, uh, the, the region, but also uh, a necessary function for, uh, for council, uh, council's facility to uh, operate in the future. Thank you. Amelia, uh, just a um, general question. The criteria in the procurement um, stage or the tender stage, does that get um, translated or transferred as a KPI in the service agreement? Um, how do we as a council um, manage that standard of management so they've come in with all, the, all these great credentials? How do we ensure that that's actually maintained over so, the period of, of the agreement? Yeah. Uh, so we have within the management services contract, there's a very detailed schedule that lists out all the activities that they're required to undertake. Yeah. Uh, and then once we move past the stage of contract signing, we have an online program called IMS. All those tasks are entered into IMS and they need to basically with the date and a description of what needs to be done. And then the campground managers tick as they go along and, and provide any necessary reports, upload and attach them so that we have a online tool for contract management. And Robin's a contract manager, so there's a contract management meeting mm. that will take place. Yeah. So it's like any other contract, you yeah. come together, issues, have an agenda, and it's managed that way. So that's reviewed regularly, clear? Yep. Yeah, correct. Yes, and there's a requirement within the contract to have a, a minimum number of meetings correct. per annum, and we have a set agenda, and yeah, it's clear that it all flows through IMS. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Welcome. Yeah. Um, I agree. Quite happy that we've actually got two good tenders. Mm. Um, you never know if we didn't have to go through a tender process, we might have got thirty-three percent. Now, um, the key thing for this, and I think we discussed it before, when this maybe when we agreed to go out to tender, is this land asset is probably council's most vulnerable, most sensitive, mm. and very valuable um, land asset. Mm -hmm. And so, it, as part of that commitment to environment and sustainability. I think it'd be really good to have the induction process, have the both the the management and the on-site manager with a full understanding of where we've come from, what we're doing, you know, perhaps even to the extent of getting Lanka out to show them what where they're working on. Because you know, historically the the um, we've had to pull back from uh, camping practices that were not sustainable and we've spent a lot of money to try and improve environmental performance and it'd be great to see that whole ethos carried through into the management of the site? Um, through the chair, I note that when we put the interim management agreement in place in October last year, that there was a similar requirement that came through from that. Um, I actioned that and undertook meetings on site with the managers who are now the preferred tenderer um, and issued some detailed information. And I regularly go out on site and check that the fencing is, is all being maintained and we look for pathways, you know, make sure that there aren't alternate pathways through the dunes um, also, Landcare is out there this week undertaking some replanting, so I'm in constant communication with Landcare on their on their vegetation program. Um, and the current managers have made a commitment and do a, undertake a visual inspection to make sure that the intent of those works to fence off the dunes and direct people only through certain pathways is um, is what's happening on the ground. Oh, just to, I thought we'd mentioned it before. Just to yeah, no, yeah, it was there. I, I remember because I did a pretty detailed email and also educated myself on the background. Just to mix things up a bit, are dogs allowed on the beach there? Not that I'm aware of, no, I don't believe so. No. Thank you. Um, anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Close, Joe. Um, I think it's all we said. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, I think Brian um, added the bits that I hadn't, uh, hadn't put in. So. Yeah. All right, put the motion. Those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, Robin. Thank, Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, since everyone's been going since breakfast, um, I like to call a, a ten-minute adjournment where you can get some 
Yeah. Quick, quick bite for lunch oh, before we come back. A couple of cheese. Two. Oh, by the way. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, please. Except for Brian. That's lunch. And uh, mm. we'll, we'll come back. Um, Kathy, could you put it back on, please? Let you know when it's when it's on. Yeah. Great. You're on. Okay. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. We're now up to item nine, which is uh, MCU application for seniors living community New Karoi Golf Club House and facilities and boundary realignment and access easement at 30 hundred board in 122 144 Mile Street, Karoi. And we have um, staff with us, Connor, Patrick, and Mark. Welcome. Welcome. Questions for staff? I'll start. Um, my first question is, has the developer genuinely worked with council to understand the needs of the community and the NUSA plan? Um, have they worked with council to genuinely understand the needs of the community and the NUSA plan? Yep. Um, it's a tough question. So it's probably an opinion question that you're asking me there. So um, I've probably been a little bit frustrated with the processing of the application. Um, there was no pre-lodgement meeting held in relation to this application to engage with council. Um, and then throughout the process, um, they've certainly made material available um, that you would normally expect for an application to be assessed. Um, was certainly uh, upfront with the applicant in terms of the information request with where we stood on the application. Um, the, uh, they've been through notification. Since the notification has concluded, there's been a fair bit of conversations with the applicant, a fair bit of material that has been provided. Um, so. um, was the developer ever made to believe that an approval would be given, Patrick? No, I've uh, not had a conversation with the applicant in that regard. In fact, the information request advises that the application would be unlikely to be supported at an officer level due to its conflict with the planning scheme was the first paragraph in the information okay. request. Just an explanation with the information request. When I was going through it all, I noticed there it, it took quite some time for them to respond to the information request. Is that normal? Um, it can take some time when there's yep. technical reports that are required and they need to go back to their consultants. Um, there was a period of time where they were negotiating with SARA in relation to the access. I believe that took, there was some stopping of the clock that occurred there, so uh, <coughs> that would have elongated that period. And the information that were, um, had been omitted from the report was that significant or critical information and did it change your position? Sorry, can you just... So the um, applicant put a decision, a, a stop to the decision. Yes. And he, um, he believed that there were some reports that had been omitted from okay. the um, report that was given to council. Um, just want to know what information had been omitted and um, was it available on Council's PD online and okay. was the information... There was no, um, nothing that was left out as part of the consideration. Um, what had happened is after the notification period was completed, there was some material that was forwarded to Council and it didn't come through the normal channel of the mailbox and ultimately some material did not get uploaded to PD online, but again, that was after the, um, the notification material. So the community saw all the information that was available at, at that time. Um, so, um, yeah, does that so, so in a nutshell, everything that had been provided by the applicant was considered as part of your report? That's correct. But some of the material that's sent in after the okay. notification period hadn't been uploaded, but has subsequently been uploaded to that's the correct. PD online. Okay. Yeah, and can I just say, they made, uh, there were some comments I know around the report not recognising that certain material had been received. At the start of the report, there's a, a list of documentation that was submitted by the application, and it says including, and it had a list of material there. There was a there was a couple of items that were not included on that, and that would be normal, that you would not necessarily list every single document that had been received by the applicant, but I can assure you that myself and the associated 
uh, officers who reviewed the application and our external consultants reviewed all the material. Thank you. So just, just following on from that, Patrick, just <clears throat> so some of the information we received, water quality, this from the principal hydraulic and water resources engineer, because one of the, the concerns is the water quality. Um, was that, so that all was considered because this says, um, based on the above, it would appear that the treatment of stormwater quality and quantity as proposed is not a significant issue for refusal. So all of that information, when you were drafting this report. What, can I ask, what's the date of that letter? Uh, the 5th of March, 2021, so a week ago. So I wouldn't have been, that wasn't forwarded to me. Okay. Um, I am aware of some material that has been sent yep. to other people other than myself. Um, is that a letter from Neil Collins? BMT, In New Neil Collins, Collins correct. Yeah, yep. so I have now seen that, and Mark's also had the opportunity to review that this morning. Um, so it's quite irregular for material that's from experts, yep. from the applicants, uh, for the applicant to be submitting that so late in the piece because we're not going to have an opportunity to re obviously review it in depth but as a priority mark has looked at that this morning and, and there was other um information and again you know all of this this came to all of us um about ecological reporting uh that ecological considering the you know the substantial impact the environment in the report and what it talks about that it says that um on page two of one of these letters, IPS later dated the 12th of March, it says at point C, hence the development is considered to result in increased diversity of flora and as a result, fauna species improving ecological functionality of the waterway as an environmental corridor. So <coughs> things like that. Have, have they been, have you had an opportunity to see that? No? I, the 12th, I mean, 12th of March, that was only a couple of days ago. I've reviewed the um, information that came through just yeah. recently, yeah. and they um, haven't provided anything um, substantial that would um, change our opinion. Okay, so these letters are, wouldn't... In, no, no, no. They're in, yeah. They've um, provided an ecological report at the um, onset of yeah. the application. In response to um, the information request, they provided further ecological report yeah. that hasn't changed. And um, did that form part of this report, the ecological? Yes. You took that into account, yes. even though it's yes. not in yes. here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Joe? Um, can you put bigger turn up? Which is on page 28 of the report? In the general committee agenda? The general committee, yeah. yeah. I've got a silly question first. So what page is Joe? 10. Uh, page 28 of the 28, sorry. Yep. Figure 10. I was curious, I meant to ask you earlier, but um, on, the, on the image, what's the red hash and yellow cross sections? What do they represent in the uh, locality plan? There would be easement is red and the yellow would be a covenant, covenant area. Oh, I'm guessing the red, big red one would be the northern pipeline. Yeah, uh, I, I, I was going to say, I couldn't see anything on the surface. I'm thinking, what, what's the I thought it was an easement, but I thought, what's an easement for? Yeah. Didn't think about the pipeline there again. Um, questions uh, relating to this specifically. Um, there is a development uh, to the other side of Koroi. Uh, I'm just wondering how this compares with that for uh, density. You mentioned one, one thing specifically uh, with regard to uh, road widths, internal driveways. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously concerned with the uh, excess of garbage trucks and, uh, and vehicles that uh, make delivery of services and the like. So uh, what are the standard widths and what are the widths here with the internal driveways that are proposed? What are, what are we typically expect of uh, internal roadway? You expect a two-way traffic, which six metres would be uh, your minimum width. Maybe on the more major routes, you might even expand that to seven or eight um, in the major leagues within the internal. Mm -hmm. um, if it was a dead end, for sake of argument, might only service three or four parcels, you might again reduce the width necessary to, to cater for those lots. What's but been proposed here? Just a single one way, one one way, way road? road? Yes. One uh, way. I might need to go to, you probably need to go to the, um, the appendix of the plans. Um, the roads are generally six metres in, in width, um, but there's a couple of roads internally that are 
are not they're they're less than that and there's concern with their capacity for well, certainly concern for a man eating path and over the garbage truck oh, i'm assuming garbage trucks go in and do normal deliveries in in these type of estates there's no no bulk garbage facilitation there's um, sorry right. Right. that's right no, I'm just a amendment in the okay. last term is that correct I'm, I'm aware that it is community services and that it's in the urban growth boundary in terms of when it was approved. It predates my time at it council. It was originally site. approved by Sunshine Coast Regional Council prior to 2014 mm. demobilisation. Mm. Yeah. It approved the last element of it or something. So, so yeah. a couple of technical questions. Um, one of the, I suppose, proposals put forward as part of the development is a proposal which was a benefit to the Croy Golf Club. Um, am I right in assuming the Croy, Croy Golf Club is freehold land owned by the association? It is. Oh, I'm just going blank. It is Crown. It's an MCH. It's a Crown land for which I think they have a a lease. I'm sorry, I can't give you that definitive response. Okay. Mm. They are detailed as being the landowner on our system. Mm. Sorry, Brian. MCH tends to be the county of March, which means it's an old parcel, not that it's a reserved. Yeah. Okay, my, my understanding is it isn't public land. Um, and that draws me to clarify because we, the, the developers put forward an infrastructure agreement under the Act. And when I look at the definition for development infrastructure under the Planning Act, it talks about development infrastructure including public parks infrastructure including playground equipment playing fields courts and picnic facilities land and work, land and works that ensures a land is suitable for development for local community facilities like community halls or centers public recreation set public libraries so if it was privately owned it's not development infrastructure have you received legal advice that we, we could, if we wish to, enter into an infrastructure agreement? Uh, we have received legal advice. And just to clarify your point, I might have been a bit confused by your question. It's certainly not public land. Um, and the the legal advice we've received does uh, address the issue of um, development infrastructure and um, public, you know, whether this can be uh, an infrastructure agreement. It sees it as being um, something that it wouldn't be a normal infrastructure agreement per se. It would be a um, it would be a in, a, a partner infrastructure partnership. My apology under section one fifty eight. They would say would be more appropriate. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, we have received an agreement that they do have concerns with some of the wording in it and some of how some of those deliverables <coughs> can be provided, particularly the provision of the memberships, the financial contribution in that regard. They have made recommendations on how that can be resolved. Okay, I'll, I'll talk to that rather than try and pose a question. The next one is the development proposes a fairly significant cut and fill arrangement, which in the report you note would add quite significant fill into the riparian uh, area or the riparian buffer. Um, sediment erosion control measures, as stipulated under the Act, or under the, would be under the EP Act, I guess. Um, my recollection is that they only have to be signed for a one in ten year or ten percent AEP. Is that correct? If if the construction works were um, the bulk earthworks was taking less than um, twelve months, so then it'd be a one yeah yeah ten percent AEP EP yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, can you can you say that again? It's, yeah, so if the um, construction works were to um, occur for under um, 12 months, so that the whole site's um, no longer exposed after 12 months, mm -hmm. then it'd have to meet that um, yeah, annual exceedance pr probability of 10%. What's the proposed time frame of this development? I assume it'd be more than that. Just they have given a, a, an overall time frame? No, no but based on um, previous experience with other developments of a similar size, it, they do take more than 12 months. Um, Crown Lake's a big case in point, it's still going at this stage, isn't it? Yeah. Amelia? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to just make reference to the Briggs and Water report that Council. Um, referenced in ascertaining whether or not there's an overriding need for um, diversification and housing supply. Um, the 
Mortar and Briggs report is old, um, four years, nearly five years old, and the data um, is from 2011. The applicant submitted a need report, which is one year old and uses ABC data from a ABS data from 2016 that relates specifically to retirement village living. Um, was that report considered and given um, given that it's more recent and relevant? It was certainly considered in the, in the assessment of the application. Um, interestingly enough, the report itself makes reference to a number of um, documents and, and studies that around 2012 and 2013 yes. themselves. Um, the reference to the 2016 data is related to the census data, um, obviously having become available since the uh, Mortar and Briggs report was done. Um, and I've had a look at that census data and that, that they, they talk about the population projection out to 2041. And just to sort of talk apples to apples, uh, the Briggs and Mortar report talks about 2036. Um, so I, I had a look at the projections in the Briggs and Mortar report against the ABS data for 2016. There was a slight uplift in aged persons that um, would be in the Noosa Shire over the age of, sorry, people over the age of 65 um, in the Noosa Shire in 2016. But it wasn't of such a significant amount that it raised concern in terms of the ability to provide the to, to accommodate the housing need within the urban footprint as detailed in the original Briggs and Mortar report. Could you say that last bit again, please, Patrick? So th 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 there was a slight uplift. Yep. So that difference in people that are over the age of 65, it was not so significant as to raise concerns with the original projections within the Briggs and Mortar report. Mm. And, um, and also in terms of some of the changes that have been made to the planning scheme to facilitate more secondary dwellings and to facilitate small dwelling units, which I can say that we're seeing those starting to come through our planning department seeking approval mm. or having already been approved over the last few years, particularly with regards to secondary dwellings. And again, the Briggs and Mortar report certainly talks about the, um, those secondary dwellings and the uplift in ability to provide small dwelling units as being significant in terms of catering to the needs of independent living. Yeah. Um, under this SEQ regional plan, the Noosa Council was required to meet certain population growth targets through the increased numbers of dwellings. Um, that, it was about 9,000 more people to be accommodated here before 2041, is that correct? Um, I'm not sure of the exact... Um, oh. No, I'm, I'm asking a question I'm not answer to. <laughs> well, and, I mean, of six thousand four hundred more dwellings, where are they mostly uh, meant to be accommodated under the Noosa planning scheme? Within the urban footprint, yeah. and to yeah. increase densities around urban centres. That's correct. Yeah. So the state included um, this land of the subject site. It, it included it within its urban footprint. So it's a it's a block that's been identified for urban growth. Um, my question is, under the state plan, this development's not prohibited, um, so why is this not supported by council? Do we have our own urban growth boundary or does our NUSA plan sit alongside the state plan? Um, how does it work? We have our own urban growth boundary, which, is, which in this case is different to the state boundary. Um, the urban growth boundary uh, terminates to the north of this site at the golf course. Um, council over time has, my understanding is, made uh, provided advice to the state to say that this land does not need to be included uh, for future urban development and not to be included within council's urban footprint. Okay, but that submission was rejected, wasn't it? Um, but how, how did that work? We we made a submission that we didn't want this land included. It's the state who determines what the the. Um in, in the South East Queensland Regional Plan, it's the state that determines those uh, boundaries. Okay. Um, but within our planning scheme, we can set, what's the right terminology? The urban, uh, sorry, the growth. Population growth? Urban growth uh, boundary. Urban, urban growth boundary in our planning yeah. scheme. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Just, just on that, um, is councils can set an urban growth boundary that mm. sits within the South East Queensland yeah. state's yeah. growth boundary, but it can't exceed it. Is yes. that the relationship? That's correct. And the state okay. does acknowledge that 
the urban footprint is not an urban zone and does not imply that all land can be developed for urban purposes. Yeah. And, it all, and, it, and it seeks that we assess the, um, the scenic values of the land, the agricultural values of the land. Um, and, and in the assessment process, which, which has primacy, the SEQ, regional plan, or the, MERSIC, the local government's planning scheme? Well, they all, I mean, we have to assess it against all of them, yeah. but the, the regional plans would sit above the planning scheme. And within that urban footprint, the state will include um, uh, yeah, non developable parcels of land like forests and uh, parks and, uh, and other, 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 type of, uh, other type of land uses. That's so correct. Councillor, if it's all right with you, I'd like to move the motion, the mm -hmm. one before us. Yep. Get things going. Yep. Have a second for that, please. I'll second. Second. Um, <coughs> What we have here is an application to build a 246 house high density residential development on rural and open space recreational land outside the urban boundary on Miles Street, Karoi in the Noosa hinterland, contrary to the Noosa planning scheme. What's proposed are not small dwellings, they're all two to three bedroom, two bathrooms with a double lock up garage, they're pretty standard houses, condensed together on small lots, it's not a residential aged care facility. Noosa Council has a record of approving 96 to 98% of all development applications. This is one of the two to four percent speculating that Noosa Councils <coughs> will rule against the Noosa planning scheme and approve it. Noosa Council has never approved a high density residential development outside the identified urban growth boundary to the best of my knowledge. You can only imagine how the hinterland would look at this and previous Noosa Councils were in the habit of doing so. The danger is in thinking that one development outside the urban boundary won't matter. If this non-compliant application were to be approved, in my <coughs> opinion it would signal to others around the country that Noosa hinterland is up for grabs. Approve this contrary to the plan and correct process and it's likely others will come before us in greater numbers. Some have argued that strong demand for housing is a reason for approval. Yes, demand is always going to be there. Demand is going to be especially strong in a desirable place to live like Noosa where resident amenity and lifestyle has been protected. How has this enviable amenity been achieved over time? Through good planning decisions because successive Noosa councils have upheld the community's values, aspirations and trust as expressed through the planning scheme. And what is the planning scheme if not an agreement of sorts between a local government and the community about development where, will, where development will and won't occur and what form it will take? Growth and demand have been accommodated for. The Noosa planning scheme has already made provision for up to 9,000 more people and 6,400 new dwellings in the coming two decades in accordance with the State Government South East Queensland Regional Plan. They are to be accommodated through higher densities in and around business centres where residents have access to services and transport by, not, and by not, not by allowing urban sprawl into rural areas. But such is the demand for Noosa property that the rolling hills of the hinterland could be cleared and carpeted with side-by-side -side high density housing divisions, subdivisions, in my opinion, and still there'd be calls for more. This particular development could replace the scenic view along the major entry into Kuroi from the south with a sea of roofs and acoustic fencing. This is not, in my opinion, what most people want. If this council wants to see rural and open space recreation land in the hinterland become a development corridor, then the correct process is to change the planning scheme by amendment, as we're intending to do for social and community housing, not approve it in an ad hoc way against the scheme. There seems to be also some confusion that what's being proposed is a residential aged care facility. This is not a residential aged care facility. The applicant is proposing two to three bedroom, two bathroom homes with lock up garages. There's no nursing facilities on site, this is not a nursing home or high care facility, but the applicant offers to link occupants within home support services for elderly people. The good news is those services are already available to elderly residents living anywhere in the Shire through the Commonwealth Home Assistance Packages and Home Based Care Packages. According to the Royal Commission into Aged Care's Aged Care Reform, projecting future impacts report, while the need for residential aged care facilities, which this is not, will continue to grow, it states that Commonwealth Home Support Packages will remain the largest program measured by recipients. Not only that, it states that home care packages are expected to grow the fastest and, as mentioned before, they're accessible no matter where you live. In this sense, the argument about need for residential aged care is irrelevant here, especially considering there is appropriately zoned land for resident where residential aged care would be a consistent use just a few hundred metres away um, off Ferrells Road inside the planning scheme's urban boundary. And there are others that already have been approved but have yet to be built in Noosa Shire. 
This application is one of a non-compliant 4% Noosa Council receives that conflict with the Noosa Plan, and the applicant has a right to appeal any refusal in the Planning and Environment Court. The one court action I believe is worth avoiding at all costs is the one where a community takes its own council to court for approving a, a, an inappropriate development against the planning scheme, and where a community uses the council's planning scheme as evidence against its own council. Noosa Council will not have been able to defend its planning scheme in court as successfully as it had if it had a history of approving developments which conflicted wildly with its planning scheme. In summary, there's no overriding need for this development. There's opportunity for over 6,000 new dwellings in the Noosa Plan and approved by the State Government in the Planning Scheme. New residential aged care facilities can be built nearby and Commonwealth Home Care Assistance Packages and Home Care Packages are available to residents who need them wherever they live in Noosa. Open space, recreation and rural land is valued highly as a key part of the character of the hinterland and preserving them on behalf of the community as promised in the Noosa Plan is one of Noosa's key points of difference. If we want to approve developments like this, then the correct process is to amend the planning scheme. I won't be supporting, oh, sorry, I'll be supporting the staff recommendation on this matter. Can I ask a couple more questions, please, Patrick? Um, in regards to the subject site, um, have there been previous DA proposals? Have they been supported? And what were any of these proposals of this density and scale? Um, there is a table within the report, uh, you may be aware, which yeah. details previous uh, applications on the site. Um, yeah. The most recent application, I think, was a 78 lot um, reconfiguration. Um, that was once council issued its information request on that site, um, on that application, the application was withdrawn. Um, so I'm just looking for the table of. Yeah, page it's. 31. 31. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, March 2009. So that, that was a 78 lot subdivision, uh, function room, restaurants, hotel. Um, there was a number of applications obviously seeking to assess it against the scheme at the time and also against the super suited planning scheme. Um, that was uh, not successful. The applicant uh, has withdrawn, as I said, after the information request was issued. Um, I, going by my report, back in 1985, there was a caravan park that was um, for 80 sites that was approved at 114 Mile Street, which is part of the golf club um, yep. site. Um, other applications that have been refused relating to the golf course and rezoning, and then there was an approval about then the extension to the golf course okay. as well in 2000. So what can be developed on the site? What would council approve? Um, well, at the time the application was made, um, when it was zoned uh, rural, it was quite limited. Um, it would be needed to be associated with an agricultural type use. One and a half hectares. I did some calculations and, yeah. and worked out. So that's the new scheme. Yeah. It's changed it to a rural residential zone. So it does make it available for reconfiguration of lots with a okay. minimum lot size of one and a half hectares. Yeah. So there is some development potential under the new scheme, but any application is going to need to be assessed against obviously the constraints of the site yep. and um, some of those environmental considerations would certainly limit, I would say, the, the capacity of, of the land just to be divided into one and a half hectare lots. Okay. Patrick, Patrick, just looking at um, your whole host of things were um, thought about and um, included in the report. It's very thorough. Thank you. The um, injection of $130 million of what this project will cost, and there's, there's a statement here saying anticipated over four years, so that clears up that. Um, 741 jobs um, in, you know, indirectly and directly during construction. Was that a consideration? Uh, uh, you know, because this is such a big project about our economy and injecting money for our local workers and our employees, was that at all factored I mean, in we was, I mean, from a social point of view? Well, the financial uh, uh, impacts on the applicant is not is not relevant. I mean, sorry, oh, oh no, for our community, the impacts, the potential injection of money and jobs into our community was that was that taken into account? We were certainly mindful that this was a big project that would in, inject um, jobs, but the planning scheme doesn't direct us to consider that as yep. part of our assessment. Um, what we, you know, we certainly also understand that that will be a bit of a bubble, I suppose, that, you know, it's the money that will be injected into the community, then over the longer term, the jobs that would be um, generated by this development would probably be, you know, relatively minor. 
But again, it's not a planning consideration to consider how many jobs are generated. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, and if, if there were down the track, if we were that's something that we'd have to address separately, obviously, with our, within our planning scheme and our local economic plan. So, so thank you. Um, with the people who, um, and I've had a lot of emails over the, over the weekend supporting this application, um, but I understand that there were, and it, it was hugely supported by the community, but then out of that 300 and something, how many were locals... Do you know? Because I, I believe that a lot of those people were, say, golf club members. Or... That's that's correct. Yeah. There was a, a pre-formatted um, letter of support that was yeah. the basis of most of the um, submissions in support of the application. Um, I've got the numbers here. Um, 346 in support, 48 yeah. objections at 2 yeah. Yeah. And, so, I, and I think of those that were made in support of the application, the vast majority were from people that did not live in Koroi or Koroi Mountain. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it might have been in the forties or so that yeah. were from that. Thank area. you. That was my understanding too. That the majority weren't in the area. That's Thank good. you. Do the councillors wish to speak to the motion? I'll speak to the motion. Mm. Um, similar to yours, Frank. Um, the planning scheme. The planning scheme allows us to look at developments and publicly and transparently assess it against our community needs and our processes. The reason we have no high rises, the reason we have no developments on our Noosa National Park is because our planning scheme works. It is quite democratic, it is a democratically accountable process, a set of rules for everyone. A set of rules that stops developers and landowners from doing whatever they want on their land. As a council, we've accepted that there are times when the Noosa plan should be given some flexibility. But this is, in my opinion, not the case today. The economic and social benefits of this proposal do not override the significant conflicts with our town, our town plan. The site forms part of a rural buffer to the beautiful township of Koroi. It's located within the rural zone, an open space recreation zone and it's outside the town boundary. The land's intended to be used for agricultural or rural activities. It's not intended to be used for high density residential development. 246 dwellings built close to one another with little opportunity for meaningful landscaping is not consistent with the rural character that the planning scheme seeks to protect at this location. The design of the proposed dwellings are not reflective of the built form characteristic of the township of Koroi. This is not the intent of the Noosa plan and this is not what the Noosa plan seeks to protect and what, most importantly, this community values. Our planning scheme seeks that rural zoned land is protected and managed such that agricultural and habitat protection are the dominant land uses and the scenic values and distinct rural amenity are preserved. I therefore support the staff recommendation to refuse this application for the reasons I've ra raised and the reasons outlined in the detailed thorough 80 page report. Thank you, Councillor Morrison. Councillor oh. Stockwell. Do you, okay, you go first. Councillor Stewart. Yours will be a lot longer than mine. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, look, I too support the staff recommendation on this. The economic advantages to the community simply don't outweigh all the impacts that it will have on the township of Kuroi. Uh, it's a very thorough report. There are pages and pages of why um, we have, as a council, council staff have recommended a refusal and we have to take um, that into account and acknowledge all your hard work and your thorough research in regard to that. We need to, you know, at Noosa different by nature, we need to respect that and we need to protect that and we need to follow our town plan. And this development is clearly against the town plan. And so I support the staff recommendation. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Stewart. Councillor Stockland. Oh, yeah, so thank you. Um, this is actually Groundhog Day for me. <laughs> um, we mentioned some previous applications. So in 1990, this site was subject to an application. Um, it, like this one, created a lot of community controversy. So, uh, volume 20, number 15, Wednesday the 14th of no particular month, 1990, the Croy Rag, or the Rag it was called back then. Uh, anger growing over council's attitude to Croy development. You know, recently Croy based council Brian Sockwell presented this entire council with a petition signed by 355 uh, su supporting plans for the new resort. It was refused. And it's interesting, 
what flowed from that refusal. So firstly, I even kept a copy of the letter to Ed where I explained why I voted to refuse it. And one that, comment that stuck out to me, it said, the applicant has shown contempt for the community by sticking to a plan which has a density some 150% higher than normal urban developments. Some things don't change. So, what did that 1990 refusal do? It triggered the identified need to do a development control plan for the town of Croy. It was that development that triggered the development control plan that was adopted in 1992, which had as its one of its aims to protect and enhance existing town character of Croy and thereby encourage a sense of community amongst the residents of the town and surrounding areas. It had an objective to reinforce those elements of town design, architecture and streetscape which contribute to the country town character of Croy and ensure that all new developments enhances the characters of the township. Now the DCP no longer has any force or weight, but every single step of the planning history of the Shire since then has reinforced those key points. Every single planning document you can find reinforces that's what we want for the town of Croy. So when we did the planning study for the 2006 scheme which we're dealing with, we had uh, the, some design, design guide for places, a planning study, and it said Number one recommendation, ensure Croy scale and character are not lost when amalgamation of sites is permitted. And more importantly, interestingly, maintain the arrival to Croy via natural settings. Retain and build upon existing significant road reserve vegetation on approaches, and get this, especially at the Bruce Highway interchange. Then we get to the 2006 scheme, as I said. Character statement for, for Croy says, Croy has potential for growth while maintaining country, town, character. And section 6.7, the relaxed country, town atmosphere of Croy is protected for enjoyment of future generations. And 631, the traditional built form of Croy is retained and new developments complement traditional streetscape and building forms. So, councillors, there is a history that goes through and go, kept on going in Noosa Plan 2020 of a type of development that enriched the community. And part of that process in the Noosa planning history was to set urban growth boundaries. A key part of everything Noosa did was we manage our population by defining and keeping to the urban growth boundaries. And as it's been pointed out, the state planning policy tells council what it has to do. It says the urban footprint also includes some areas designated or already developed for rural and rural residential purposes that are located near urban services and facilities. Local governments must investigate these areas for urban development opportunities as part of their planning scheme. And we did. In Noosa Plan 2020, we investigated the urban growth boundaries for Croy and we extended them. We extended them across the road and we identified there was a need for aged care facilities. And it identified that, looking at the whole shire, we could meet the state planning policy and SEQ regional growth plan, SEQ plan growth targets by 2041 within the urban growth boundaries. So I think if you can bring up those images, please, Cathy. It's really important to understand when we got the submission, when we got the submission for this land and an adjacent block, we considered it. We considered it in light of the fact that we had done a detailed investigation across the road, we had looked at the sewage and the water and what it meant, and we hadn't done it on this side. And it was overtly suggested by the Director of Environment and Sustainability that we couldn't proceed to include this site in the urban growth plan because we haven't done enough investigation of future options. Remembering that the state said we must do that before we do convert. So when you look up there you can see an image on the right of this site and you see the, the site on the left and we said well upside that site including the urban grass boundary and we put an area of community facilities for um, aged care facilities. But importantly we identified the riparian corridor and that main interest in the town into the environmental management and conservation zone. So that's about 100 metres across at the wide point and about 25 metres along the road, which we, when we did that detailed investigation, said that's what's appropriate. 
some of the land might go to update for urban development, but we want to keep that important riparian corridor. So if we had done, next one please, if we had done that investigation and applied the same sort of approach, we would see that probably this site would have a significant area of it zoned for environment management and conservation. I'm sure that would be my starting point. I'm sure an investigation would say it's of equal magnitude for the opposite side of the road for the same objectives to attain that entrance into Karoi and to protect the environmental corridor, the, the riparian corridor mm -hmm. on the waterway. And you see what that might mean to the current design. I sort of just said, at least all those little parcels that I put an X on are probably within an environmental management zone. So that's why you have to do the detailed planning first. You don't run your planning scheme one development application at a time. You do it by strategic planning that investigates all the options. So that's one level. That's probably the highest level. Probably all the other considerations on this application fall under the fact is it's outside the urban growth boundary and we haven't done the investigations. But the next one is you look at what did the plan say? So the highest level of the Noosa Plan 2006, we set desired environmental outcomes. And what do they say about the residential uses? It says, I think the first one says, urban and rural settlement for rural uses use for residential use is contained within the defined urban growth boundaries. Development being, being within the planned capacity for roads, community service, <coughs> infrastructure for a particular locality. It fails on the number one criteria in the desired environment outcome. Second one, providing Noosa Shire population access to a range of safe, secure and affordable housing that especially caters for the current and projected demographic. I think there's been a bit of debate in the community how this is helping answer the affordable housing. This is for resort style over 55 living. It's not for affordable housing. Number three says development being consistent with the character and amenity of the particular locality. Once again, in my opinion, that does not meet that desired environmental outcome. And number four, development considering the landform, natural environment and climatic conditions. And as we've seen uh, or discussed, this proposal has a huge cut and fill to try and really you know, treat the landscape like it's a blank sheet of paper. And that has implications for the fill that I was talking about before in the riparian corridor. And the reason I asked that technical question about stormwater management plans is I've seen in other big developments that they've done everything that's required to meet the state guidelines, but as soon as we had a, a reasonable event that's over one in 10 year event, we have weeks, if not months, of turbid water going down the creek. Now I've seen that. Okay, so, that's the other really big point. Every other condition for refusal subsequent under this is it doesn't meet the desired environmental outcomes of the planning scheme at the highest level. It's, to me, what the planning scheme wants for the entrance to Croy is over here and what this development proposal is over here. It's not just a little bit off, it's the antithesis of what the planning scheme wants. <coughs> it's, you know, we want to retain the country town character. Finally, you know, there is a range of conversations about the uh, ecological impact, the water quality, mm -hmm. the fact it's in the, uh, the Lake McDonald Dam catchment area. It doesn't meet the requirements, in my view, in terms of water sensitive urban design. But what's more important is that since we did have the Palm Lakes development, which I thought had, you know, approved by Sunshine Coast Council, I thought it didn't meet those requirements myself. Personally, I was in the minority back then. Um, the new Noosa Plan 2020 actually increased the rigour and clarified and set the aims out of what we wanted to achieve for our waterways, our wetlands and our floodplains. And it's really important that that shows you that we actually expect a higher level of environmental performance by the developments, not a lower level going forward. And we can place weight on it considering the time it's now in force. And some of the things that I believe this development doesn't do in that regard is it doesn't uh, comply with the overall outcomes of by the biodiversity waterways and wetlands okay overlay. It's not designed sorted nor could it be constructed in a way that avoids adverse impacts on ecological important areas, ecological systems and processes. <coughs> For example the cut and fill I've talked about. It doesn't propose to adequately conserve, manage or enhance nor rehabilitate to protect improve biodiversity, ecosystem health, landscape stability the resilience of ecological differences and riparian corridors, and is not designed, nor does it propose a layout that provides for the protection and establishment of appropriate buffers to waterways, wetlands, 
native vegetation is and significant poor fauna habitat. For all those reasons, and most importantly, for the sake that this council has always stood up and protected the Noosa Plan and not been guided by one-off developments when they're in very stark conflict with that plan, uh, I support the motion. Thank you, Brian. Any yeah, other councillors wish to speak, Joe? Well, who's it? Shorter. Put the vote, but much shorter. Uh, look, one of the things, one of the things about planning scheme is um, we don't uh, we don't look at parts of land for on, on economic advantage. We actually create the planning scheme to find the parts of land where economic advantage can go, and that's where we expect development to go, not the other way around. Um, the Briggs and Water uh, uh, report. Uh, said the need to provide housing for an aging population in the Shire is well documented, in particular the housing needs assessment prepared. Uh, the report identified a need for additional requirement dwellings, particularly smaller and more affordable dwellings. I don't believe that, uh, that that's been addressed uh, uh, sufficiently here. And, uh, again, we've uh, alluded to the fact that there is a parcel of land within the urban footprint, uh, within, uh, within the Shire's urban footprint, that uh, has connectivity to existing residential areas as well that uh, is, is more suited for uh, a development of this size. With that, with that, that came out through the planning scheme, as, uh, as Brian alluded to, well and sure. The economic benefit here, uh, you know, part, part of the, uh, the, the proposal here is for uh, to, to upgrade the golf course to uh, one, to save the golf course from potential financial ruin and the like, but there's no guarantee that uh, an upgraded clubhouse and uh, and recreational facilities will uh, will have any impact. I mean, Frisian Springs, was developed with a golf course around a golf course, and no matter how many houses there, the Bridge and Springs Golf Course still fails to make, to make the vote. So there's no guarantee that uh, increasing the density around the golf course will save will, will be the saving grace mm -hmm. of the golf course. So whilst uh, uh, upgraded amenities and upgraded facilities, uh, I'm sure, will be welcomed by golf course members, uh, I don't see that as a sufficient grounds uh, uh, for this application to. Uh, to, to proceed and, uh, and override the planning scheme as it stands. Um, and, and I would say a significant number of those uh, those people that uh, supported and, and wrote in in support of the, uh, uh, the proposal were the ones that thought they would benefit through uh, uh, access and proximity to the, uh, to the golf course facility. Mm. It's, a lovely, it's a lovely thing to have, but uh, it doesn't guarantee uh, economic viability. The last uh, one for me is a small one, but it's um, for me it's the elephant in Karoi, uh, and it's not necessarily a planning scheme uh, uh, issue, but it's the fact that um, there's an ageing railway bridge, there's two intersections that are already already choked, um, we can't get development there, and there's a giant roundabout right in front of this development that comes off the highway that to me looks like all the world it could provide the access, uh, access for a bypass around this until uh, all of those elements are finalised with regard to what the upgrade to the uh, the road network in and around uh, uh, Karoi is. I'm not prepared to see uh, see that opportunity lost. So um, I won't be. Uh, I'll be supporting the staff recommendation for review. Thank you, Joe. Council Wigan, you wish to speak to the motion? Enough said. <laughs> so no, I can be the, the best speech of the day. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> Brevity is the soul of wit. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'll put the motion all in favour. That's unanimous. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Connor. Thank you. Councillor, just on this one, because it's a refusal, we'll get the uh, terms of the refusal. Uh, reasons just double check by our lawyers in case it ever goes to appeal and yep. if we need to update those on Thursday we'll give you advice but we'll just run that as a matter of caution to yep. our lawyers in case there is an appeal against the position which is the applicant's mm -hmm. right. Thanks for your work. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item is uh, final on the agenda which is the financial performance report on page 66 Welcome, Michael. Welcome, Trent. It's beautiful looking numbers. Seven numbers there. Yeah, it's good for me. Yeah. <laughs> Except for one number, which will be the start, <laughs> sorry, which will be the, the probably the you know the same question I ask all the time. But this one concerned me just a little bit more than normal. 
the unbudgeted 247,000 for governance legal fees. Um, just an explanation, I'm imagining that's got a lot to do with Kim Kim and um, unexpected legal challenges or legal advice. Correct. Correct, yep. Yeah. So is that just for Kim Kim? Is that where we're up to with Kim Kim advice or is does it absorb other um, other legal advice? It's a combination. Combination. Would that include and, Pelican? And yeah. So should we be worried that it's so that I think we're up to on page seventy six, we're up to oh, um so it's not page seventy six, on page seventy nine, legal expenses we've already hit ninety three percent of our budget. Should we be concerned? This isn't too dissimilar to the last five years where we um, we budget for a uh, estimate of our legal appeal costs and um, generally they've, they've gone above budget. However, given the fact that in previous years we've had plenty of capacity, the way in our conservative budgeting approach, we, we generally absorb that through a budget review with revenues or savings in other costs. So. Um, this year is slightly different given the fact we've got a bit of a COVID hangover happening financially. However, um, in terms of our cash position, I'm not concerned that it's going to compromise our sustainability. Michael, I'm going to ask what Fred asks all the time. What's worrying you? If anything. At the moment, I think we, not too much. Obviously, we're, um, we're planning starting our 21-22 our budget process. Okay. Um, look, we've still got solid fundamentals in our balance sheet and cash flows. So um, we've got good management oversight of budgets. We're managing our individual risk areas. So I think I'm pretty comfortable. Yeah, well, it's been actually ahead of budget. So I've been seeing that for a while. Uh, that, to me, is a good sign uh, that we're actually getting the work done and the invoicing coming in. Is that uh, the reason for uh, uh, being ahead a, a uh, in actual budget. I think with the key there is, Councillor, with um, as we're getting better resourced across both finance and um, infrastructure services in terms of planning and scheduling the work out, we're getting that fine tuning happening in terms of accurate scheduling and timing. So you'll, so you'll see, obviously, um, year to date capital expenditure is um, is relatively um, stable. It's, it's not high compared to our total budget of $35 million. So it's not like we're getting it, we're ahead of schedule. We're just on, we're on, we're on time, if you like. Given, given the size of our capital budget, um, are we still looking on track for the end of financial year? We're given that you know, we're probably only about halfway through the spend at, uh, at the end of February. We're in the uh, process of the at three at the moment. So we're doing a lot of work with the project team to reschedule some of those major works like Rufus Street, mm -hmm. Hidland Playground, as well as some of the, the major landfill cell works at Money Road Landfill. So there'll be some relatively large movements back and forth as we just juggle those major projects between years. So we'll, we'll definitely see some shift between financial years coming up. So it'll be month. more around cash flow timing rather than project completion. Yep. So it's, as you know, some of those big projects are going to span. Multi, multi and year and they'll be carryovers into the, into the next financial year. Timing of procurement and then delivery. So That's what I'm speaking to see based on those figures. So. I, think, um, I think take comfort that a lot of the grant funded projects, particularly works for Queensland Unite and Recover, will deliver majority of that. There'll be a couple of minor projects we'll probably be talking to the state about just that it will potentially cross over over that 30 June deadline, which we'll need to negotiate. However, um, you know, the team have done a great job in delivering a lot of that on the ground. Thank you, you for my next question. <laughs> Joe, the two big ones, obviously, in terms of timing, will be the Hinterland Playground yeah, and the River Street, Street one. Yeah, I'm, well, well, I'm, I'm, I'm fully expecting those, yeah. and they, they are big budget, program, uh, uh, big budget projects. Get the tongue around that. a related question. Um, have you been able to gauge how many people have been um, taking up the offer to consult on the budget? Mm. Got any numbers on that so far? Um, a bit early? Early days. Um, I haven't been keeping a track of um, the stats. However, there has been uh, movement at the station. Um, I'll be 
I've got to catch up with our community engagement manager in the next week or so just to see how things are going. But we, we're continuing the um, promotion mm. through the papers and through social media and mm. through our website. So we're encouraging to get as much mm. as possible. And we get the councillors to push that out through your networks yeah. as well. Mm. So. Mm. Yep. I'll move the motion. Moved, um, Mayor Stewart. Seconded, Councillor Lawrence. No, no, I'll, 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 um, we're at the end of a very long day. Thank you, Michael and Trent, for all your hard work. Uh, everything's looking on track. Um, it's good, you know, we've got a solid cash at bank. Um, Michael, you said when we asked you the question, what keeps you awake at night? You're pretty comfortable. That gives us a level of comfort. I uh, look forward to going into the budget um, consultation. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Solid recoveries online from uh, you know, the, uh, the, the year of COVID. Uh, and the uh, conservative budgeting we did in, in relation to that, it's good to see the bounce of the recovery uh, well ahead of schedule and uh, well ahead of what was forecast and we'll just hope to continue with that, with that going into uh, the budget period for the next financial year. Thank you, Joe. Councillors, does anyone else wish to comment? Thank you for the excellent reporting. It is very Thank reassuring. You. The numbers we're seeing. Uh, we might have an early, not a Christmas present, but um, rate payers may be pleasantly surprised by the end of this financial year. Um, do you wish to close? No. Um, no put the you. motion those in favour. It's unanimous. Thank you, Trent. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you. Uh, you councillors, for your patience today.